Detective Jeremy Ogden from the Hobart, Indiana Police Department gazed upon a manuscript that had kept him busy for months. It revealed an emotionally wrenching tale involving 53-year-old Christopher Reagan's tragic story. Born in Detroit, Michigan, and receiving his education there, Christopher decided at the age of 20 to join those willing to protect their country by enlisting as an active duty soldier. Upon being accepted into service with honor and devotion by standing guard over citizens' peace, he forever changed his destiny with his choice to join. Christopher was sent to a military base near Marquette. While there, fate brought Christopher together with Terry from Iron River. Their friendship developed over time after meeting as young people often do on city streets. Shy people may hesitate to say hello, but they eventually began walking together and became closer friends over time. They remained close for years since Christopher's service prevented any chance for more meaningful relationships to form between them. At one point, Chris decided to leave military service and move to Traverse City, located nearby but far from where his beloved lived. But this did not become an obstacle to their feelings. On the contrary, communication became even stronger between them. Christopher proposed to Terry that they start an extended romantic relationship, knowing each other for years but never violating any boundaries or ethical rules. She readily agreed, and their long-distance romance began shortly afterward. Soon enough, Christopher and Terry realized they shared many interests, from appreciating nature, to preferring an organized lifestyle, to yearning for peace. Iron River became their ideal location, and they decided to move together. Christopher moved in with Terry, while finding employment at a factory producing parts for military ships. Soon enough, he even had subordinates who reported directly to him. Life was finally looking bright, but after two years, complications arose in their relationship. With passion slowly diminishing, as Christopher and Terry failed to address its difficulties, it eventually became evident that this could not continue, and they took the difficult decision to part ways peacefully and remain friendly toward each other. Christopher realized he could no longer continue living at Terry's house, so he decided to rent his own place instead. As time progressed, Chris realized he wanted a change of scenery as well. Iron River seemed too small, so Chris began looking for more dynamic cities like Asheville in North Carolina. Fate presented Christopher with the chance to start over and embark on an entirely new chapter of life. Not only would Asheville provide him with job opportunities, but it would also offer picturesque, natural attractions, perfect conditions to launch himself into life anew. Christopher told Terry on October 14th that he had taken off work due to a doctor's appointment suggesting they meet and go for a walk as they often did while living together. Christopher then proposed they meet later that afternoon and join her. Terry became worried when Christopher failed to contact her after October 15th and didn't return any calls or text messages from her girlfriend, Terry. Concerned for Christopher, Terry reached out to mutual friends, but they knew nothing. Ten days later, she filed a police report regarding Christopher's disappearance. Terry filed a report, but police quickly comforted her assuring her that people often disappear for periods of time, only to return at some later point, sometimes even ending up somewhere new. Additionally, Terry revealed to police officers that Christopher had recently received a job offer in North Carolina. For them, this was another indicator that Christopher may have reached his new residence and begun living a completely different life after having cut all ties with the past. Investigators quickly launched an extensive investigation to disprove speculations. To do this, they identified Christopher's newly hired company and spoke to one of its employees to discover any information regarding Christopher. However, none could be obtained as Christopher hadn't shown up at work for over 10 days. Police speculated he might have been injured due to frequent trips outdoors alone. Search forces heated into nearby woods looking along routes Christopher had used. Specially trained dogs were deployed, yet no sign of Christopher was ever discovered. Terry suggested visiting Christopher's former apartment to ensure no accident had taken place, or perhaps find any traces that may give an idea as to his current whereabouts. Agreeing with her suggestion, investigators went directly to his former place of residence. They were shocked at what they found. Items scattered across the floor and closet doors open. Their initial thought was likely Christopher was just being disorganized. However, Terry quickly dismissed this theory, asserting he wasn't as messy. 
Detectives began to suspect that all these circumstances might be linked to Rand's disappearance. So, after inspecting her home, it was decided to expand their search efforts and locate him on an even wider scale. Police searched carefully through the neighborhood before eventually discovering Reagan's car outside the city limits, about eight miles from Iron River. Since it appeared unlikely, he left it there intentionally. One door needed to be broken open for entry into it. At first, there was nothing suspicious in the vehicle's interior. On its seats were ordinary clothes typically found among locals, a hat, coat, and gloves. But one of the policemen noticed something peculiar on the front passenger seat, a small piece of yellow paper bearing an illustrated map describing an itinerary for travel. No specific addresses were indicated, only an itinerary, so they decided to follow it closely. Terry explained to Christopher that despite living in Iron River for years, he still hadn't learned the names of streets and roads, so he wrote down directions like turning at a bus stop or passing gas stations as guides for navigation. Terry noted that Christopher had indicated in his notes that this was his first trip to this location. Terry and her colleagues followed the route indicated on a piece of paper and stopped in front of a house listed in Christopher's notes before heading toward their final destination in a neighboring town. Investigators knocked on the door. They needed to establish who lived there and why Christopher had traveled this way. Jason Cochran was surprised when uniformed men appeared outside his home. Shortly afterward, his wife Kelly appeared and they were informed by officers of Christopher Reagan's disappearance that his abandoned car contained a piece of paper that pointed toward this address as part of their investigation. Kelly candidly revealed that she and Christopher worked at the same plant and were close. Although they hadn't spoken since mid-April, Kelly did manage to reconnect with Christopher in mid-June. Kelly Cran attempted to reach Chris via text messages between September and October, but received no reply. She assumed he had moved to North Carolina in search of employment, or possibly due to health concerns. Kelly also mentioned Christopher was having health problems and may have decided to start over somewhere new. When investigators found an address written down on a piece of paper found in Christopher's car, they became confused. Nonetheless, the couple remained willing to cooperate in any investigations that came their way. After brief questioning at Christopher's home without finding what they needed, detectives decided to head out. Their next phase involved speaking with Christopher's co-workers at work before proceeding to interview workers and supervisors at his factory. One supervisor made mention of an affair between Christopher and Kelly Cochran, a rumor circulating among workers. After hearing this claim, investigators decided to re-interview both parties involved so as to gain clarity as to their true natures and establish exactly what had transpired between them. Kelly ultimately acknowledged her affair with Christopher but could not tell him due to Jason being present. According to Kelly, their open relationship was fine with Jason being aware of any such affairs on the side. However, discussing such sensitive topics might hurt his feelings and be painful for both parties involved. Christopher's co-workers refuted Kelly's statements claiming Jason approved of their affair or there being any loose connections among their family as she claimed. Jason followed Kelly into the police office and their conversation revealed his opposition to Kelly's infidelity vehemently, thus making him an obvious suspect. However, due to a lack of evidence linking Jason with Christopher's disappearance, it became impossible for officers to conclude anything conclusively against Jason or Kelly. They had no choice but to release both from detention. The investigation continued for five months without yielding any clear resolution of its mystery. On March 5, 2015, Hobart Police Department Detective Jeremy Ogden took on the case immediately and began actively working it. Ogden began by conducting a comprehensive analysis of Kelly Cochran and Jason Cochran's history, meeting in high school before moving in together post-graduation. Their personalities couldn't have been any more different. Kelly was open and loved talking, while Jason preferred listening more than starting conversations first. Despite these differences, Jason and Kelly decided to marry. Following their wedding, the two started their own company providing swimming pool maintenance services. It was modest, but provided them with a decent income. Most of Jason's pool maintenance duties fell upon his shoulders until overwork and strain took its toll. Jason began experiencing back problems and felt heavier every day. Eventually, Kelly took over running the business, 
when it became clear he couldn't continue running it himself. Though this period proved challenging, she remained hopeful that Jason would soon recover and resume his duties once more. Kelly searched for ways to help Jason recover since medical drugs weren't providing enough relief. One day, she learned of a plant that offered hope for Jason's recovery. Unfortunately, its use in medical practice hadn't started yet and wasn't available everywhere they lived. It had even been banned in their state. To get this drug, they moved from Florida to Michigan's Iron River Township. Jason could visit his doctor and receive his prescription for this miracle plant. Suddenly, his agony would finally end. Early in 2014, a plant that specializes in manufacturing parts for U.S. warships hired 34-year-old Kelly Cochran, who had moved with her husband, Jason. Kelly made every effort to secure financial well-being for herself and Jason. Therefore, they accepted employment at Christopher Reagan's plant, where Kelly also worked. Over time, Christopher and Kelly discovered commonalities of conversation that helped foster their friendship. This proved particularly vital, as Christopher had recently experienced difficulty with Terry in his relationship. After reviewing all available evidence, the prosecutor made a strong argument to a judge in Michigan in support of obtaining a search warrant for Cochran's residence. After successfully receiving a ruling from the judge on March 5th, she sent investigators straight away on March 6th to locate Cochran's address. Searches were carried out of the Cochran home with extreme care, looking for any signs that Kelly and Jason may have played any part in Christopher's disappearance. Unfortunately, all efforts proved futile. The only significant discovery was a book written by Jason under a pseudonym from video gaming culture. Although its title may cause amusement, its content was truly disturbing. Jason detailed horrific murder scenes of everyone who had wronged him. One character matched up perfectly with Christopher as they read through this dark and violent work. Suspicion increased surrounding Jason. Perhaps his crimes weren't made up, but instead stemmed from actual incidents he had committed himself. With these concerns in mind, investigators decided three weeks later to conduct another search of the Cochran House, hoping to unearth the evidence missed during their previous search. When police officers drove up to their home, they noticed no vehicles present and that both the yard and driveway were empty as no answer came when knocking at their door. No one answered the door when knocked. As soon as Kelly and Jason had left town after the initial search, they moved quickly into Indiana prompting investigators to become concerned they might never find evidence they needed for months, especially DNA samples of suspects like Jason Cochran. Michigan police officers reached out to their Indiana counterparts, asking them to collect samples instead, prompting Indiana officers to head toward Cochran's new address to take DNA samples instead. Ready to assist their Michigan colleagues, Indiana officers then traveled directly to Cochran's new address where DNA samples would be taken before heading directly toward Jason, Cochran's new address. The couple didn't object, seeing no legitimate basis to charge them with murder, nor evidence of Christopher Reagan. Meanwhile, investigation gradually disbanded, leaving little hope of solving his disappearance. Time passed until, on February 22, 2016, an alarming phone call arrived at Hobart Police Station from Kelly Cochran, who was clearly distressed over what had transpired. She attempted to explain that Jason wasn't breathing, but her emotions rendered it impossible for her to provide concrete details. Rescuers arrived quickly on the scene where Kelly attempted to prevent doctors from treating Jason due to her extreme terror and panic. Soon enough, however, it became evident that Jason no longer required assistance. Sitting in a chair, with his face lit up like it had been from extreme overheating, Doctors were forced to confirm his death and send his body for forensic examination, while Kelly was handed over to a police patrol who took her back home with relatives living nearby on her street. Investigators were determined to ascertain what had transpired, so they conducted a search of Cochran's new home and discovered evidence in the form of a syringe needle at the foot of the marital bed. After inspecting Jason's body, an investigator concluded that his death was due to illegal drug abuse However, this report came as a shock for detectives. Jason had an excessive amount of illegal substances in his system. However, the results from forensic tests indicated something more disturbing. His death had been caused by strangulation as evidenced by bruises on his neck and face. So Jason, who had been suspected of kidnapping Christopher Rian himself, 
became himself the victim of crime. This revelation raised new questions and necessitated a thorough re-examination of evidence. Immediately thereafter, forensic specialists turned their focus onto Kelly Cochran, whom many suspected as being linked to both incidents. She became suspect not only for Christopher's disappearance, but also in her husband's murder. The investigation became even more complex. On February 23, 2016, Kelly Cochran was summoned to testify in Jason's murder case at the police station. Investigators directly interrogated her about her possible involvement in his death and whether she administered excessive doses of illegal drugs to him. Regardless of the lack of concrete evidence and pressure from investigators, this young woman did not confess to either the murder of Jason or the kidnapping of Christopher. Investigators were unable to find sufficient proof of Kelly's guilt and were unable to arrest him, leading Detective Jeremy Ogden on a trail that eventually brought him face to face with Walter Hammerman, one of Jason's closest allies. During this investigation process, Detective Ogden met up with Walter Hammerman. Walter immediately ran to the police upon hearing of Kelly's shocking story of Jason's tragic death from illegal drugs, emphasizing how close they were. Walter assured his partner that any changes would certainly have been communicated. Jason had been taking medicinal herbs with the sole aim of relieving his back pain for quite some time now, yet Walter noticed his friend had fallen into an unstable situation recently. In March last year, Jason revealed his concerns with him regarding travel arrangements to Indiana due to Iron River police involvement in a disappearance case. All this had had a lasting impactful impression upon Jason. Walter witnessed Kelly become severely depressed and attempted suicide, necessitating medical intervention and therapy. Walter noticed a distinct change in Kelly's behavior as he took more control over his life. Jason seemed on edge, while in the past, the boys could spend hours playing video games together. Now he would avoid parties whenever his wife returned from work. This information became crucial in understanding what was transpiring within the Cochran family. After learning that Jason had died by strangulation, Detective Ogden devised an intricate plan to force Kelly Cochran to reveal the truth regarding Christopher Rian's fate. Walter, Jason's close companion and close ally, was chosen as bait, intended to lure Kelly into an incriminating trap and cause her to make mistakes that could potentially compromise Christopher Rian. Walter accepted a difficult role within this investigation while playing out this performance before Kelly Cochran. On March 12, 2016, Walter called Kelly while under surveillance by police officers with listening devices, intending to present her with a letter purporting to come from Jason that contained something important and urgent. Walter explained to Kelly that Jason gave this letter shortly before his death with instructions not to open it and send it immediately to police should anything occur. This came as quite a shock, both to Walter and to those watching over their situation. Yet even with this development, detectives had no direct evidence against her husband's killing. Investigators conducted numerous interrogation sessions with Kelly in an attempt to extract the truth. She denied her guilt throughout. On April 26, 2016, however, it became evident that Kelly Cochran had managed to slip away from their scrutiny. It seemed a mockery of justice and detectives immediately joined forces with police officers from Iron River and Hobart in launching a federal manhunt against Kelly Cochran. Walter Hammerman was both shocked and alarmed that Kelly hadn't yet been apprehended. He worried she may get away with this crime once more and later attack him in return. Her phone had also been disconnected as though she were playing a cat and mouse game with the police. Detective Jeremy Ogden managed to piece together after two long and hectic days of trying, that Kelly Cochran had managed to avoid detection by fleeing to Kentucky's Wingo Town, more than six hours away from Hobart. On April 28th, Kelly was located at her cousin's house by police officers who issued the same warning. As soon as they received this information, an arrest team quickly proceeded to the house, knowing Kelly could be dangerous and likely attempt to flee. They moved swiftly without warning, and Kelly was apprehended and taken into custody that afternoon. Later that same evening, Detective Ogden arrived in Wingo, where he resumed interviews with suspect, alongside investigators from Indiana and Michigan. Once I spoke with Kelly Cochran, everything became crystal clear.
Christopher Rian and Kelly's relationship went deeper and further than anyone imagined. Kelly truly loved him and dreamed of leaving this cursed city together and starting a new life together. But everything changed on October 13, 2015 when Jason learned about her cheating. They began fighting, and Jason remembered their wedding night pact whereby anyone found out cheating would be required to kill their partner as punishment. Kelly asserted that she never intended to take their agreement seriously. It had always seemed more like a joke to her. Jason warned Kelly if she didn't keep her vow, threatening that he would carry it out himself if necessary. Although Kelly didn't wish for this responsibility, she nevertheless helped Jason commit a horrifying crime. On October 14, 2015, Christopher Rian traveled to Kelly Cochran's house, hoping to take full advantage of their first meeting. Rian wanted every moment to count, their encounter, and every memory he would create together with Cochran. Kelly took full advantage of his absence from home to offer him dinner and an intimate time together. All plans went according to plan, their evening promised to be memorable. After dining together on the first floor of Kelly's house, according to Kelly, they moved up onto the second. But their solitude was abruptly interrupted when Jason burst in with a rifle in hand, panicked and terrified. Christopher quickly recognized he was trapped, while Jason took aim and fired one shot directly at Christopher's head without delay. Chris was mortally wounded by Jason's bullet and died instantly. Following this event, Jason instructed his accomplices to bring Christopher's body down into the basement where they dismembered it with a hacksaw. Eventually, all his limbs and head had been severed from its torso. The perpetrators then placed Christopher's remains into several trash bags before disposing of them by dumping them in the woods near Crystal Falls Village. Christopher's car was moved away to avoid suspicion while they thoroughly cleaned Christopher's house to erase evidence of crime. They had become accomplices in an awful crime. Kelly Cochran was open about her involvement in Jason Cochran's tragic death, saying the plan to commit the act came about after learning of Kelly having had an affair and Jason becoming jealous that Kelly had chosen someone else as his partner. According to Cochran, this idea of revenge came when Jason learned of Kelly having another lover and decided on taking drastic measures against Kelly in revenge for what had transpired between them. Kelly wanted revenge against Christopher for taking away their happiness together and feeling betrayed by Kelly's spouse. Kelly revealed how deeply in love with Christopher she was and felt that his absence had prevented them from living life fully. Kelly struggled to cope with both her loss and its accompanying pain on a daily basis. Kelly loathed Jason for forcing her into doing what he forced her into, realizing she couldn't continue living peacefully with it. An opportunity presented itself when Jason complained of backache on February 22, 2016. Kelly decided it would be time for action against Jason. Kelly convinced Jason to give her an overdose of medication. Unfortunately, however, its effects weren't instantaneous and Kelly covered his mouth and nose with her hands to ensure suffocation occurred before squeezing his neck to make sure Jason was dead, thus leading to bruised body parts on him. Kelly Cochran provided testimony that assisted law enforcement authorities to identify where Christopher's remains were buried. On May 18, 2016, Detective Jeremy Ogden, along with investigators and canine team, went to a site near Crystal Falls Village. This rarely visited neighborhood had become the site of an astonishing mystery. A team of investigators set off a thorough search around Lake Erie's surrounding woods, penetrating between trees to ensure no spots had been missed. One of their canine dogs suddenly sensed an odor and led the officers toward it. Officers were following the dog closely, expecting to discover something soon. Instead, it led them to an unassuming hill covered with fallen leaves and branches. Upon clearing this area, Investigators found objects, including what looked to be human remains, unmistakably identifiable skulls. On closer examination, it was evident that Christopher Reagan had been murdered. A bullet hole attested to this. Investigators knew they had found Christopher's severed head. Additionally, there was evidence such as a 22 caliber bullet and broken gun found at the scene, as well as glasses belonging to Reagan that may have belonged to her. Dental records helped identify his remains, solving an investigation that had perplexed investigators for two years. 
Kelly Cochran was officially charged with murdering Christopher Rian and Jason Cochran in April 2016. On February 13, 2017, Michigan State Court officially arraigned this 34-year-old individual in Michigan State Court. The prosecutor noted Kelly was significantly reduced her role by being behind both crimes. Christopher only saw Kelly as a casual companion. Kelly, however, genuinely loved Christopher and planned for their future together. Christopher's refusal of her romantic advances resulted in fury and Kelly decided to kill him by fabricating a story of an alliance between herself and Christopher's brother-in-law. Kelly confessed in court, yet presented another version. As per her allegations, she had been subject to abuse at the hands of her jealous husband, who orchestrated this act of violence. On November 9th, he hid in their basement and caught their lovers off guard before seizing an opportunity and using it as an excuse to grab a weapon in a fit of anger and shoot Christopher. Jason suggested dismembering Christopher Rian's body, and Kelly agreed by being threatened to kill Jason Cochran. When presented with this new version of events, however, the jury began questioning Kelly's guilt. After three hours of deliberation, they reached their verdict of premeditated murder of Christopher Rian, resulting in life imprisonment without parole for Kelly and 65 years for Cochran. Kelly Cochran was taken directly from the courtroom and sent directly to Crown Point Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where she is serving her sentence with only regrets regarding her personal life. Kelly stated in one phone interview, I tried my best at doing what was expected, from school through college and marriage, but ultimately all my efforts went in vain. All I ever did was work while my husband entertained himself with computer games. At prison, Kelly Cochran continues to reveal details of her crimes and claims she and Jason committed additional offenses. Christopher was just one of their many victims. Unfortunately, due to Kelly not disclosing additional crimes committed or victims she claims existed, at this point in time. It's difficult for anyone to corroborate Kelly's statements. Her brother heard from Kelly that there may have been others, yet there is no concrete proof to back that up yet. Detective Jeremy Ogden from Hobart, Indiana Police Department is carefully scrutinizing every aspect in hope of uncovering clues or uncovering evidence pointing towards any additional crimes committed by either of Kelly or Jason Cochran. Hopefully, it can close another chapter in this twisted tale. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. 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 On August 22, 2016, Residents of Podu Caramal, Spain rushed to work and discovered flyers pasted all around town by volunteers. These flyers depicted 18-year-old Diana Maria Ker Lopez Pinel. This young girl stood about six feet tall, had black hair, brown eyes, and was described as being irresistibly attractive by all who saw her picture. As Diana disappeared, she was wearing pink shorts, a t-shirt, white sweatshirt, and black sneakers clothing she left home wearing before suddenly disappearing from sight. Since that night, Diana's family, along with volunteers and special services, had tirelessly searched for any sign of Diana, searching every street corner, hoping they may discover some clues which could bring Diana home. Juan Carlos, Diana's father in Madrid, took no time in notifying police and local newspapers of any information or leads about her whereabouts. If anyone has any piece of information, no matter how small, please reach out. The police need your help, reported Diana's father. Diana's mother, on the verge of depression, beseeched the public to help search for Diana. We have tried everything possible to locate Diana but still have no answers. Please reach out if any information can help. Even minor details could become crucial in helping find our daughter. Di Maria Kier Lopez Pinel was born August 12, 1998, in Madrid, to Diana Cristina Lopez Pinel Pinjo and Juan Carlo Caire, and had one sister, Valeria. Although their family had been quite prosperous prior to 2013, when their parents' separation caused great distress for both Diana and Valeria, 
As depression set in, and there were often disagreements regarding who should provide care, their mother or their father usually took precedence in providing it. Although Diana lived away from her father during vacations, they would visit Podu Caramol with its population of approximately 10,000 regularly during summer vacations. Diana spent her vacations as usual here during 2016, enjoying both its tranquility and beauty each summer. Sunday, August 21st was set up to be just like any other day. Around 10 Rao, Diana informed her mother that she intended to visit Val Inkland Park, not far from their cottage where they were staying and meet up with her friends for fun on account of Feast of Virgin Carmen. Diana often made this trek there herself, so there was nothing unusual or unreasonable about it for Diana's mother, so she gave Diana permission. Again, Diana spent that evening joyfully among her friends. Four hours later, Diana bid farewell and headed home, unaware that this would be their final encounter. On her journey home, she met Paso de Ariel nearby a pizzeria, where Diana frequently spent her time. They exchanged goodbyes at around 2.30 a.m. Paso de Ariel would become Diana's last person, seen that dark night. Maria Care Lopez Pinel discovered something was amiss with Diana early in the morning of August 22, 2016. At 8.30 she realized something wasn't right with her daughter. She hadn't returned from a party, and her cell phone was off or unreachable, raising suspicion among Maria Care. So quickly after realizing what had occurred, she called police to report Diana missing immediately. According to information provided by her mother, it could be concluded that Diana Maria Care Lopez Pinel did not suffer from any serious emotional or mental health issues. Although she experienced difficulties due to her parents' divorce, Diana's absence was unusually long-lasting, and this sparked serious concerns among police investigators who began unraveling what had transpired leading up to her disappearance and must uncover why Diana vanished without trace. According to reports, Diana sent her last messages via WhatsApp to a friend from Madrid and described a specific individual who was stalking and shouting strange phrases that scared the girl. These were Diana's last contact with the outside world as she no longer responded but her messages were still read by someone. The following day, police began retracing Diana's route back home. There, along the roadside, they discovered a black hairband similar to what Diana was wearing that evening. Unfortunately, it was all they found there, and no further proof existed for investigators to consider. Diana was unable to provide any useful information, and there were no CCTV cameras covering the final leg of her journey. The street in which Diana made her last stop was poorly lit and sparsely populated, featuring only garages and an outmoded boomerang nightclub. Along this road were some witnesses claiming they saw Diana get out of a car containing three guys before moving on to another one that took her away from the port. These testimonies, however, could not be verified. Investigators considered two main versions of what had happened. The first suggested Diana may have been taken by someone she may know, while a second theory linked Diana's disappearance with possible attacks by maniacs. Diana's mother suggested an additional theory suggesting her daughter could have been taken away on a boat. Diana's friend and ex-partner reported meeting someone from Morocco who helped them buy hashish together. But this information only complicated their investigation further. One key point was the news report in the media about the discovery of Diana's clothing from that evening. However, her mother denied this information, stating no clothes had been found and her credit card and identification had been left in the house, thus demonstrating that Diana could not simply disappear on her own free will. All these circumstances further pointed toward this being not just random events or accidents, but something more sinister taking place behind these circumstances. However, the case still remained mysterious and could not be solved. Shortly after Diana disappeared, Press reports detailed a recent dispute between Diana and her mother, at which point the media speculated that Diana may have experienced a nervous breakdown necessitating medical attention, as had occurred with Valeria, her younger sister. On September 1st, to avoid more litigation and conflict, custody rights of Diana's younger sister were transferred from mother to father as an attempt to avert further strife within the local community. With Diana gone, 
tension began mounting as her father left town with their daughter, and whispered whispers began that their family were hiding something important from public scrutiny. According to Diana's friends, running away was not unusual in Diana and Valeria's household. Indeed, quarrels between mother and daughters were commonplace. With this information available to the public, one question immediately arises. Why was Diana so worried when she did not return when running away was so common among the sisters? On August 31st, Diana's parents failed to appear for an expected press interview regarding the investigation into Diana's disappearance and reported more details of it to El Mundo newspaper on September 11th. Instead, their lawyer explained they were emotionally distraught at the possibility that their daughter may never come home again. On this same date, El Mundo published an article providing insights into other aspects of family life within Diana's household. Information concerning Diana's April disappearance reportedly contradicted her mother's statements that she did not suffer from mental problems, as evidenced by information regarding her three-day absence and failure by her mother to contact authorities about it. It further reported that when Diana left home for three days without telling anyone or turning off her phone when upset or disgruntled by something her mother did or said, the girl turned off her phone to avoid further conflict with her and said that she no longer wanted to live with her. Letters written between Diana and Valeria also surfaced in the press, showing their severity of emotional issues. Valeria had even been hospitalized multiple times over the course of a year due to an overdose of prescription medications. At this point, given no progress with Diana Kerr's disappearance investigation, prosecutors launched another probe focusing on Valeria Lopez Panel family's youngest daughter Valeria's abuse by the Lopez Panel family. Meanwhile, Diana Kerr's disappearance investigation continued apace, with forensic experts seizing several items associated with Diana such as toothbrushes, combs, personal computers, diary entries and prescription drugs belonging to Diana from her roommates and housemates. Investigators conducted a detailed examination of Diana's belongings. Investigators then began questioning her acquaintances, including a young Moroccan man whom Diana had had an encounter. Unfortunately, none of these measures brought any results and further police searches remained fruitless. Although police conducted extensive searches near where Diana disappeared in mountains, forests, rivers, lakes near Tarragona, area 13 miles from where family was staying. 72 days after Diana Kay's disappearance, her case remained an enigma. Investigators' leads had yet to be confirmed and they only discovered an item matching Diana's description as being part of their investigation. Her hairband and an identical cell pony that her father confirmed belonged to his daughter. Two months after Diana had vanished, her Facebook profile suddenly reappeared online and friends and relatives immediately informed the police and provided screenshots. Friends noted that reset password function had been utilized to avoid entering login details for her profile. Either Diana had forgotten her password or someone was trying to gain entry to it through hacking attempts. Diana's phone was an integral piece in the case yet it failed to shed light on her mysterious disappearance. On November 10, 2016, however, the driver of the very car where Diana had last been seen was finally identified. This individual had previously been detained on charges of human trafficking. Details about his involvement in Diana's disappearance had previously been kept hidden so as not to disrupt investigations. His wife claimed he was with her on that night, eliminating him as a potential suspect, However, on December 25, 2017, an incident took place that became pivotal to the investigation. One of the girls was attacked by a man demanding her phone and threatening her with weapon. Screams for help came from nearby and two passers-by immediately intervened to save the girl from an attempt by an individual to pull her into their car. The shocked victim immediately reported their experience to the police, providing details about both his attacker and license plate number. Within 24 hours, Police arrested 41-year-old Jose Enrique Abene, known by many as Elo. As soon as police learned more, they soon recognized him as one of three drivers detained for suspected kidnapping back in 2016, but later released because they believed their wife's alibi. Police interrogated Jose Enrique and his wife again. 
Following this interview, his wife confessed to having previously lied, and, on the night Diana vanished, Jose wasn't back home until 4 a.m. He eventually admitted he accidentally hit Diana on the road, was afraid to report it, so decided to dispose of the body himself, instead of going through with his plans of reporting her murder. However, later changed his version and confessed he kidnapped and killed Diana instead. This devastating revelation shed light on new details to the case and confirmed Diana K. Lopez Pinnell's disappearance as being due to violent crime. Her disappearance caused incredible heartache for both her loved ones and all of those following it. With nearly 500 days of investigation and media speculation only compounding their suffering, Assaulting Diana's parents only served to hinder and confuse the investigation. But, with persistent investigation and testimony from another victim, investigators were eventually able to collect all necessary evidence and track down Diana's perpetrator. Her loved ones will remember Diana as an outgoing young woman who unfortunately fell prey to an extreme criminal. Her story serves as a reminder that it's essential we stick together during times of turmoil when fighting crime to end impunity and ensure safety for all citizens. Unfortunately, Diana's perpetrator did not confess right away as to where they had hidden her body. Eventually, her family and friends managed to say their final farewells and give her a proper burial in January 2018. Jose was eventually sentenced to life with parole available after serving 35 years. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In April 2016, in Fort Worth, Texas, a shocking and brutal murder startled even experienced investigators. Elizabeth Paula Arellano worked as a paramedic before falling victim to this vicious and senseless act. Prepare to be shocked as you discover who carried out Elizabeth's execution. Her death was so peculiar that the police initially suggested it might have been voluntary. However, this explanation didn't align with the testimony provided by accidental witnesses to this tragic scene. Investigation teams had to go the extra mile in their efforts to understand everything and bring justice against the individual who committed this extremely brutal crime. Unfortunately, given his conduct, his sentence appeared too lenient and unfair compared to many others. Elizabeth Paula Arellano was born on August 16, 1987 in Fort Worth, Texas, where she would live her short life. Elizabeth spent much of her childhood alongside Alessandra and Giovanna, whom she found to be her companions. Elizabeth's birth father left when she was still young, showing no interest in or contact with his daughter. Soon thereafter, her mother, Juanita, remarried Fidel, who eventually treated their children as his own. Elizabeth developed an extremely close bond with Fidel, who supported and assisted in every way possible in all family matters. The girls studied diligently at school and dreamed of one day becoming a doctor. While in high school, she met Rudolf Arellano, whom she soon fell in love with. Elizabeth chose a man almost eight years older than herself, causing some embarrassment among her parents. Nonetheless, they did not interfere with the romance as their son-in-law appeared serious and reliable enough for them not to intervene. At 16 years old, just out of school, Elizabeth legally married her lover. Elizabeth and James eventually had four children together, three sons and a daughter. However, Elizabeth did not intend to become a housewife, as she remembered her childhood dream of becoming a doctor, and she graduated from medical school to work as a paramedic while planning to pursue further education. The young woman was kind and devoutly raised in Christian traditions. She took her children regularly to church and instilled in them love and compassion for their neighbors. Family and friends recognized her as an attentive listener who was always willing to lend a helping hand. At first, their marriage seemed strong and blissful, but after 13 years, it began to unravel as Rudolph tried his hardest to control every aspect of her life, becoming increasingly inconsiderate over time. Eventually, their union disintegrated entirely, as his jealousy of his young wife became uncontrollable. After yet another jealousy-fueled argument initiated by Rudolph, Elizabeth took her children and moved them back to her parents' house. Although Rudolph attempted reconciliation with Elizabeth, she had grown tired of his fits of anger, 
and didn't want the children exposed daily to their scandalous arguments. She mustered enough courage to officially file for a divorce, and shortly thereafter, she mysteriously vanished without a trace. According to friends and family, she appeared in good spirits and decided, in order to distract herself from family problems and the impending divorce, to visit a nearby club after work with colleagues. On Friday evening, April 15, 2016, the 28-year-old mother went to a fun place with some friends. There, she danced and had fun but did not consume alcohol due to her plans to return in her own car, which she had used to arrive at the club. Elizabeth arrived home well past midnight on April 16. Once she parked the car, she called her friend, with whom she had spent the evening at the club, to inform them that she had already reached home and that everything was okay. However, after hanging up the phone, she never entered the house. The next morning, Juanita became very distressed to find that Elizabeth had not returned home as planned. Although Juanita knew Elizabeth had planned on spending the evening with friends, she expected Elizabeth would have returned long ago, as her car had been parked outside their house, indicating her return from the club. Juanita approached Elizabeth's car, only to find it unlocked with its key still in the ignition. Inside were Elizabeth's purse and cell phone belongings, indicating that something horrible must have occurred. As soon as she noticed Elizabeth was missing, Juanita immediately notified the police and filed a missing person report. At first, the police believed they could quickly solve the case with hot leads, hoping Elizabeth might still be alive, as there was no blood or signs of struggle visible inside the car. However, that proved not to be the case, and their first priority became reconstructing every aspect of that evening and night for all possible witnesses who might help identify and interrogate. Friends and colleagues of the young woman who spent the evening before she disappeared were interviewed, providing details about when she left and returned home. Additionally, several calls and messages from Rudolf Arellano, who was trying to contact Elizabeth throughout that evening, were found on her cell phone, all without success, as Elizabeth never answered his calls or texts. Police officers visited Rudolph's home the evening and night prior to ascertain his whereabouts and activities. According to Rudolph, he had spoken with his ex-spouse that night, who assured him she would bring their children over for the weekend visitation. But after she stopped answering his calls, he believed she had changed her mind and abandoned him. Arellano offered up an unlikely alibi According to him, he spent the evening sitting at a local bar before returning home at midnight and going straight to sleep. On Friday afternoon, Rudolph was confirmed by his friends and others to have been relaxing in the same establishment. However, no one knew where he went after that, and there was no one to verify his claim. So, the police were unwilling to exclude Mr. Arellano as a suspect due to his lack of an alibi, and his behavior raised further suspicions. At his ex-wife's funeral, Rudolph put on a show, weeping at her coffin and telling Elizabeth that he wanted her death as much as his own. Elizabeth believed in the sincerity of these statements. Furthermore, he actively assisted in creating a charitable foundation to raise money for her farewell ceremony. However, after the conclusion of this act, when police investigators called him in for questioning again, he looked and behaved completely differently as though nothing bad had taken place compared to what Elizabeth had witnessed before at that point in time. After reviewing all the CCTV footage from the last several weeks, a thorough assessment was completed. Under Elizabeth's route, it was determined that a car of similar make and color to Rudolph's had driven away from her parents' house at 3 a.m., according to witness accounts. A neighbor also remembers seeing this same vehicle parked not far from where Elizabeth had been killed on a nearby bridge. Furthermore, investigators raised more questions when they obtained Rudolph's cell phone data for the night of the crime. On that night, Rudolph made multiple calls near Elizabeth's place of employment and then near his mother-in-law and father-in-law's homes, as well as sending his ex-wife several messages trying to find out when she would return, but none were returned by her. He followed her to Elizabeth's parents' home, where he decided to wait. Once the police had enough evidence against Rudolph, they arrested and brought him into the station for further questioning. One of the key witnesses in Elizabeth and Rudolph's case was their eldest son. When shown the rope that had been cut from Elizabeth's neck, he reported having seen it earlier at his father's house, 
recalling playing with it himself. Furthermore, the boy recognized pieces of concrete left lying around their garden after their fence had been replaced. Fragments from this concrete could even be found inside Rudolph's car trunk. The investigation revealed that the man waited for his ex-wife at her parents' home before abducting her and forcing her into his car, where he had prepared rope and concrete in the trunk for use during the massacre at a nearby bridge. He planned on going unnoticed while carrying out this act of violence. Rudolf Arellano was arrested 10 days after his ex-wife's body was recovered from a lake, but denied all involvement in her murder, claiming he had been at home on that particular night. Given the severity of Rudolf's actions, death could have been imminent until, after consulting with his lawyer, he decided to confess and cooperate with the investigation to lessen his sentence. Arellano did not plead guilty until January 2019 when he presented evidence in court detailing how he abducted and murdered Juanita, the mother of their four children. Juanita fainted during his testimony, while Alessandra and Giovanna called Arellano a monster. Rudolph himself did not express any regret for his crime or apologize to those affected by it. Rather, he spoke nonchalantly and coldly about it without offering an explanation for his motivations or actions. For this crime, he was sentenced to life without parole. Elizabeth's family members considered this sentence rather mild, noting that they forgave Rudolf because they did not want their hearts to be consumed by hatred towards him. Elizabeth is now responsible for raising her children, as her parents and sisters are responsible for providing care. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Guatemala has an extremely high crime rate. According to statistics, at least 100 crimes are reported every week here, half being so-called domestic offenses and nearly 70% of serious offenses still unsolved according to the New Yorker. Furthermore, more civilians were killed during Iraq war zone attacks than Guatemala during 2009. Tragic events that we will discuss today occurred in this beautiful but dangerous country. El Maria Lopez began life romantically but ended in tragedy as she fell victim to her abusive domestic partner, whom she spent years forgiving, giving him another chance. There has been considerable confusion surrounding this case, and its perpetrator could have avoided taking responsibility, so let us review everything in sequence. Who is El Maria Lopez? Her full birth name, which was given at birth, was El Maria del Rio Morales Lopez. She was born March 17, 1995, in a small town called San Cristobal Verapaz, to A. Morales and Brian Lopez, who raised two children. Omar was raised separately, but El Maria became close with both. As an infant, she nearly died due to an intestinal obstruction. Doctors offered no guarantees, but her mother still believed she would recover soon, which ultimately was true. Despite the complex operation being performed so soon, after her mother began praying and believing her daughter would recover soon enough. Thankfully, the surgery itself did not hinder or impact her development at all. Despite this early stage occurrence, El Maria was actively engaged in sports during her school years, particularly gymnastics and athletic sections of both. Additionally, she enjoyed classical choreography, something which allowed her to easily connect with different people and quickly make friends. Furthermore, El Maria excelled academically while showing great promise in humanities studies. After graduating school, El Maria decided to further her education at an elite state university. She chose law, then later specializing in criminalistics, something which had always captured her imagination. At age 24, El Maria visited Coban, the capital of Alta Vera Paz, to commemorate her older brother's 25th birthday and give him what had long been on his wish list, a motorcycle. Her parents and sister visited a car dealership there and met the polite, attentive sales consultant named Jorge, who provided them with the entire assortment before offering advice about which models might suit best. El Maria decided on one model, but decided it best after consulting her family head first, before leaving with business cards from both dealerships, as well as leaving her phone number so future contacts could follow up. Soon she received a phone call from Jorge her consultant from the salon, but this conversation was more personal in nature. 
Jorge then dialed El Maria's number several more times before finally taking the bold step to ask her out to a coffee shop. It was clear he greatly desired meeting this beautiful brunette, but was uncertain where he should start his pursuit of knowing her better. Attracted by Jorge as much as she was by him, El Maria accepted his proposal of meeting. A year was no barrier between them. Almost instantly they began an intimate romantic relationship that quickly blossomed. Both felt it was love at first sight, and both believed a long and happy future lay ahead for them. After only several months, they decided to live together despite disapproval from both parents. By six months later, they were married in an intimate ceremony with only those closest to them attending as guests. Unsurprisingly, issues began on the wedding day when the institution where the banquet would take place encountered difficulties, almost derailing their holiday celebration. They had to overpay in order to have their ceremony still take place on time. Who is Jorge? Mez. Unfortunately, there is only limited information about El Maria's intended partner Jorge available to the public. We know he was born in 1996 in Santa Catalina, Latina town in central Guatemala. Jorge was one of two sons raised together. Due to financial pressures at home and family life balancing on the edge of poverty, Jorge wasn't spoiled with extravagant clothes or toys like many children would receive. Rather, only enough was available for basic needs such as housing. Jorge was not driven to seek out better opportunities. Therefore, he did not pursue education and job searching. Instead, he just drifted along his course without bothering to seek better situations for himself. People who knew Jorge described him as being uncommunicative and sometimes aggressive. His emotions often overpowered his rational decisions, leading to him not having many friends or creating successful relationships between sexes. He made every effort to woo her love, then in a rush got married out of fear that she might change her mind. Meanwhile, El Maria's parents initially treated her prospective son-in-law suspiciously. There was something they did not approve of in this young man, yet were powerless to stop their daughter from marrying him. An Unhappily Marriage Soon after their wedding, a young wife became pregnant. But as she had not completed university yet, it proved difficult for her to secure employment. No one wanted to hire an inexperienced girl in such an undesirable position, so she settled for casual labor instead. Meanwhile, her husband had lost his job but was in no rush to find another occupation of his own. After they gave birth to Alice, Jorge convinced his wife that their family's only solution would be temporary living arrangements with his parents' house. Jorge successfully convinced his wife of his plan. El Maria initially refused, but as there was no other choice and they could no longer stay on the streets with a baby in tow, she eventually agreed. Ah knew of El Maria's family problems and repeatedly persuaded her to return home. But El Maria refused and persisted, saying everything would soon improve with her husband. There was no cause for worry. One day, when visiting her daughter and granddaughter at Jorge's parents' home, the mother found an alarming picture. El Maria was in such poor health that she only consumed food once per day. Jorge's family did nothing for her well-being. El Maria was living at her mother-in-law's home and receiving only limited food. Malnourishment could potentially compromise both her own and the child's health. Unfortunately, El Maria encountered more challenges and troubles at her in-law's home than just lack of sustenance. At first, El Maria was frequently bullied and even assaulted by Jorge's younger brother, as he became angry over Alice's crying and presence of children's items in their house, throwing items like toys at El Maria repeatedly. Once even firing off a baby bottle at El Maria, that hit Alice while still being held by El Maria herself. Jorge saw all this unfold, but did not stand up for either his wife or daughter, and instead treated them like strangers. Ah convinced her daughter to take her granddaughter back with them and return to Ah's parents' house, but soon Jorge appeared and insisted his wife return, promising that he could get work and taking steps toward that end. Eventually she agreed, but only if Jorge could rent an apartment so they could live independently from his parents. El Maria finally fulfilled a long-standing dream when she won a job as an investigator with the city prosecutor's office. An intelligent, talented, and very responsible young woman, 
El Maria quickly gained respect amongst her colleagues before gradually climbing her career ladder. Over time, financial circumstances improved significantly enough that their family could afford a car of their own thanks solely to El Maria's hard work. Her efforts were highly appreciated by superiors who respected her efforts. Jorge was still trying to discover who he was, choosing instead to live at his wife's expense. Jealous, lazy, and domestically oppressive were just a few characteristics Jorge displayed. These behaviors escalated over team, with explosive temper tantrums from both him and his wife. Georgia was not happy working, preferring to sit home watching TV with his friends while drinking beer and spending what his wife earned. Additionally, Jorge was pathologically jealous and attempted to control every move made by his beloved partner. He did not permit her to form friendships, have lunch with colleagues in cafes, or be anywhere without him present. He constantly checked her phone, looking at its call history and messages as well as prohibiting her from opening accounts on social networks. At home, when left to his own devices, the husband behaved similarly, creating scandals seemingly out of nowhere and continually clarifying relations before placing all blame for problems and family tension on his wife. Jorge was not protective of his wife while living at his parents' house and would allow her to be humiliated, insulted, and even physically attacked by relatives, sometimes succumbing to their force with physical threats, other times allowing his fists to fly even though this action seemed inappropriate at times. He treated El Maria like his property, believing she would endure all his abuse. Neighbors frequently heard screams coming from inside their house, as well as witnessed signs of beatings on her body and face. El Maria repeatedly attempted to leave her marriage and file for a divorce. She tried several times to move with their daughter from their rented apartment into El, Mariah's parents' house, but each time her abusive husband came there and begged for forgiveness. Instead of listening to what her parents advised El, Maria always forgave him, giving him another chance. After another argument over manhandling, El Maria took three-year-old Alice into her car and came crying back home to her mother's house. A day later, Jorge showed up, seemingly seeking either El Maria back or their car back. Instead, he professed that his life would change now that he had found employment, promising never again to raise his hand against her. Surprising El Maria believed him and went with Jorge back to their rented apartment together. Midway through January 2021, El Maria called her mother, Ah, in distress, about how her husband had both failed to secure employment and stolen all the earnings that El Maria had earned while at work, leaving the family penniless. Feeling sorry for El Maria, Ah offered some money so El Maria and her granddaughter would have enough to cover all needs until Ah received her salary payment. A meeting was scheduled on January 19th, but El Maria never showed up and failed to respond to phone calls or messages, something which was very unusual from her. Concerned, Ah decided to visit her daughter's workplace the next day, where she learned that El Maria hadn't shown up and no one had been able to reach her. Jorge arrived at the prosecutor's office shortly afterwards in search of El Maria. According to him, they had once more quarreled and that El Maria had gone back home and wasn't answering calls due to being offended by him. Ah quickly sensed something was amiss and assumed Jorge was telling lies. Therefore, she took swiftly with her daughter-in-law before heading straight for police, so the search for El Maria could begin as quickly as possible. That same day, an alert system called Alerta Isabel Claudina was announced nationwide as an emergency search was initiated for a young woman reported as missing. At the outset of the massive search, her husband was immediately identified as a suspect Indeed, one might argue he was the sole individual to be suspected in her disappearance. El Maria had no adversaries or reason to suspect she had been taken captive, with Jorge being her last known contact before she had disappeared. Naturally, this individual denied any involvement in the case by alleging he himself had been knocked down while searching for his wife and was now furious that he became the primary suspect. At the same time, he himself was often confused in his testimony and could not clearly explain why he did not alert police about his wife's disappearance on the day she had vanished, or why, if he thought she may have been at her mother-in-law's home, why he did not call or visit there immediately. 
While police were combing through witnesses and combing the area for clues to find El Maria's whereabouts, her remains were inadvertently found by municipal workers on January 22nd. Workers responded to a report about clogged storm drain near a road when they noticed something odd in one of the large plastic bags containing human charred remains inside it. They immediately reported this horrifying discovery to authorities. Police officers, upon their arrival, suggested that the body could be that of El Maria Lopez, who was wanted across the country. Forensic experts confirmed the remains belonged to a young woman. Her parents and brother confirmed with certainty that it was El Maria Lopez even though her body had been severely disfigured by fire. Furthermore, it's noteworthy that the package was found near where El Maria worked at an attorney office without surveillance cameras or lighting available in that location. Pathologists were able to establish that despite the body being badly burned, she had been severely beaten before succumbing to asphyxia due to internal hemorrhages, fractures sustained while she was alive, caked blood in the nose and mouth, and deep marks on her neck indicating strangulation. An odd message as no new suspects had emerged, and both of her parents believed it to have been their son-in-law who had so cruelly killed their daughter. Jorge was quickly taken into custody, with psychologists and criminalists conducting extensive analyses into his motive for killing Jorge. Additionally, they must assess in detail this marriage and its relationships within its family unit. At one point in this investigation, Lopez provided a harrowing audio recording sent anonymously by someone living nearby. Apparently, this person had witnessed several scandals within her daughter and son-in-law's family, but never imagined that these would end in such a violent death of one or both parties involved. Jorge was shaken to hear Luz Maria screaming for help, while sobs could be heard in the background. Jorge expressed shock over what she heard and stated that had that witness called 911 immediately, her daughter may still be alive today. Unfortunately, however, neither he nor anyone he recorded from visited Luz Maria's home, from which the screams originated, and thus could not be involved as a witness in Jorge's investigation as witness. Lopez used the audio recording as part of her criminal case materials and gave a public interview where she asked all citizens to be aware and report any instances of domestic abuse that arise, not simply film them with cameras or record them with dictaphonies. According to Lopez, these simple actions could save lives. This high-profile crime caused widespread public outrage, prompting thousands of people to stage rallies throughout the country demanding justice be served against Jorge. Though Jorge was quickly taken into custody upon discovery of this offense, he continued denying any guilt by maintaining that he personally drove his wife to work the day she disappeared. Yet another avenue of defense against accusations made against him by witnesses who are calling for his punishment. Street CCTV footage did show Luz Maria driving toward his workplace that morning. However, due to tinted windows, it could not be established how many were in their car or whether or not she ever exited it. None of the recordings depicted their car stopping or Luz Maria getting out. At their rented home, numerous washed-out traces of blood and drag marks were discovered that hinted that violent acts had taken place here. Suspicion was confirmed when microscopic fragments of burnt flesh were found in their family car's trunk. At the same time, during their search, Investigators were interested in an orthopedic mattress purchased recently by Jorge and Luz Maria. More precisely, not even the mattress, but its dense polyethylene wrapper which they had recently purchased together. When it was compared with similar examples in similar households, Jorge packed Luz Maria's burnt remains in it and numerous witnesses heard him threaten her with death before making this purchase. Just days before Luz Maria suddenly vanished, Jorge had made public threats that if she decided to leave him, he would kill and hide her body so no one would find it again, as evidenced by repeated insults by Jorge, as well as threats threatening to kill her or hide it so no one would find her remains. Based on data compiled by expert criminologists and testimony provided by several witnesses, the investigation pieced together the grisly details of this crime. On January 19, 2021, Jorge went into a fit of anger during a heated marital fight, striking his wife several times before snapping back at her several times, prompting her to cry out in pain, which neighbors heard but did not contact the police immediately. The killing occurred the night of January 19, 2021. 
Jorge had had difficulty controlling outbursts of anger before, so when his temper had flared again on January 18th, when his fists reached his fists on January 18th, 2021, just after midnight when his fists hit home again, when his anger control failed him completely and hit her several times, prompting her cries for help from her that neighbors heard but did not call for help immediately, or call in police for help when his fists struck during their marriage vows on January 18th, 2021, after Jorge gave in to his fists again when, during an argument between spouses on January 18th, 2021, after an argument between spouses got physical, which resulted in his use of anger control issues before so, quickly losing control again when outbursts of anger had to control before, but this time just went wild, resulting in hitting her several times, making her to cry out several times before finally sending it. Neighbors heard but did nothing when the phone call for assistance. Jorge beat his wife severely, breaking her nose and inflicting head trauma. Subsequently, he strangled her using only his bare hands before trying to dispose of her body by taking it outside into his backyard, dousing it in campfire liquid and setting it afire. But Jorge wasn't expecting such an intense fire starter that his neighbors might notice and report his conduct. Fearing that they may call the fire department or police upon seeing it burning, Jorge quickly put out the flames, wrapped the burnt remains in plastic, before quickly moving it somewhere he thought no one else would find its remains, before setting it ablaze again, somewhere safe, where nobody would discover it again. Jorge committed these atrocities in full view of their young daughter, who, though still understanding some aspects of what was going on, still witnessed beating and crimes committed, evidenced by cries and screams caught on tape from her child. Jorge had gained some knowledge of forensics, thanks to Luis Maria's textbooks, that were abundant in their home, so he attempted to cover up and establish an alibi by finding an area without lights or video cameras where he dumped Luz Maria's body in a drainage sewer, unsuspiciously. On his daily commute to work, he drove along her usual route as if Luz Maria were present, only for him not be found there at her place of work the following morning, then began an active search with colleagues, acquaintances, and relatives until it finally found her. Criminals' lawyers attempted to delay and dilute Jorge's trial as much as possible, while also trying to derail the investigation. They claimed all evidence and witness statements were circumstantial and couldn't unambiguously prove Jorge's guilt. Defense attorneys sought house arrest instead of detention. As well as claimed, Jorge himself was deeply devastated at being charged with killing the mother of his child he deeply loved and cared about. However, the key piece of evidence was obtained from Luz Maria's phone. Jorge held on to it all along, and immediately after her murder, sent messages out using it in an attempt to make her seem alive. Additionally, tracking smartphone movements showed it often coincided with Jorge's phone, although Jorge's lawyers attempted to spin this evidence in favor of their client by saying Jorge found his wife's phone and drove around searching for her. No explanation could be offered for why Jorge was also sending messages through it while calling it from his own cell phone. Expert witnesses recorded photos showing bruises and scratches found on his body the day of his arrest as further proof that the defendant had committed his crimes, with most vivid ones occurring near the area where the victim had attempted resistance. Jorge's neck had suffered from an accidental scratch, yet only tiny particles of his epithelium under the fingernails of those responsible for his murder could not be located due to fire destruction. Due to a number of contentious points, the prosecutor asked for maximum punishment against those responsible. Court hearings and proceedings had to be repeatedly postponed due to coronavirus pandemic. But in October 2022, after numerous delays due to coronavirus pandemic, Defendant was finally found guilty for murdering his wife, sentenced to 50 years. He did not admit his guilt himself, but custody was given over to Alice's maternal grandparents who admitted that their lives now center around their granddaughter. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In the mid-2000s, this high-profile case sent shockwaves through America. For years after its investigation began, no suspect was brought to justice due to an absence of motive and disconnected evidence, as no one believed this man was capable. 
Six long years were taken for detectives to piece the puzzle together at trial. An investigator even stated he'd never encountered anything like it during all his years of practice. We found ourselves immersed in an epic love triangle, double betrayal, and an ominous pretend no one noticed initially. Jason Young of Brevard, North Carolina was born in 1974 to an ordinary family. After high school graduation, he studied at Raleigh's renowned State University before landing a sales job in a large retail chain where his services proved indispensable. Friends described him as fickle when it came to romantic relationships between people of opposite gender, even boasting about it themselves. Jason himself proudly admitted being known as a womanizer. Michelle Marie Young, nay Fisher, was born in New York on February 1977. Growing up alongside Meredith, they quickly forged close ties from childhood onward. Linda dedicated much of her time and attention to supporting and helping to develop Michelle's abilities and talents, especially as an avid student of law and economics from an early age. From Michelle's school years, she dreamed of a future career in this area. Michelle graduated school, applied to several universities, and soon received a positive response from one in North Carolina's capital city. There she studied diligently at the Faculty of Economics and Law before going on to earn a master's degree. Soon thereafter, Michelle found work with one of North Carolina's premier accounting firms, where she earned well, supported herself fully, and made plans for future ventures. She decided to celebrate her 24th birthday at one of the city's premier entertainment venues with friends and colleagues, until an unfamiliar stranger turned abruptly and accidentally knocked a glass with cocktail out of her hand. As soon as he realized what had happened, Jason Young apologized and bought Michelle another cocktail to make amends for their interaction. Michelle quickly caught Jason Young's attention. He sat at Michelle's table and struck up a casual conversation, joked a lot, attempted to be funny and interesting, and at the end of the evening asked her out on a date. Michelle liked this casual acquaintance, so readily accepted his invite, thinking fate had given her something special on her birthday. As soon as they started communicating, it quickly became apparent that they shared many similarities. Both studied at the same university, although Jason finished three years earlier, supported the same hockey team, and shared an appreciation of a musical group. Their romance blossomed quickly. However, living together or even getting married were simply out of reach at that time. As soon as Michelle told Jason she was pregnant during one of their meetings, it came as quite a shock. Neither one was prepared for having children just yet. Both Jason and Michelle had been focused on their careers rather than starting families just yet. He made his feelings known quite emphatically but, after some hesitation on Michelle's part, decided that keeping the child was best option. Jason took one month to consider his situation before moving back to Raleigh to be with Michelle while she was pregnant, which ultimately lead them to legalize their relationship. Not love or pregnancy had anything to do with it. Michelle didn't have health insurance at the time, and marriage allowed them to avoid significant costs associated with childbirth. Their daughter, Cassidy Elizabeth, was born shortly thereafter, and Cassidy Elizabeth began life together, with both of their mothers helping out domestic life tasks as soon as she could manage on her own. Michelle's family carefully accepted Jason as her partner. While wary, they attempted to avoid conflicts. Soon thereafter, Michelle and Jason moved into their own large house located in a quiet and landscaped part of the city, where their mother Linda would come and help manage household duties and visit her daughter and granddaughter regularly. Linda noticed there was an unusually tense atmosphere within this family, due to Jason being over-emotional and easily provoked causing many arguments with Michelle but publicly appearing happy. But only speaking candidly with Linda could Michelle truly express how things were really happening within. An unexpected but significant sign occurred just two years into Cassidy's life when Michelle found herself pregnant again and cautiously told Jason. To their delight, Jason responded positively and seemed even pleased about it. To share this happy news with Jason's parents who were in Brevard for the weekend visit, Michelle decided to travel by car with the family as well, first celebrating their news with relatives before heading off together 
to a restaurant for another celebration together. While driving home, Jason overcorrected and the car careened off into a ravine. Although Michelle experienced shock and fear after the incident, their lives were unthreatened and no serious injury occurred despite its nerve-wracking effects on pregnancy. Jason took it all in stride, yet Michelle experienced miscarriage due to its stress. With all this happening simultaneously, an accident, child miscarriage, and strange indifference towards it from Jason, suspicions arose that something else might be going on behind closed doors. Later, Linda Fisher would describe that accident as an omen that no one paid adequate heed to. Jason and Michelle Manny had known one another since university days. Although they hadn't seen each other in some time, shortly before Jason was involved in an accident, he accidentally met Michelle Manny during a work trip in 2006. After telling his wife about it and inviting Michelle Manny over, they decided to invite her over as well, despite her complaining of family life issues and relationship difficulties with her spouse during her visit, while also constantly complimenting Jason and telling his wife how lucky they were to be with him. Michelle and Manny accepted their invitation yet began complaining of her unhappy family life issues while constantly complimenting Jason, while telling his wife how lucky she was in life, and telling his wife how lucky she was in life. By contrast praised Jason while constantly telling his wife how special she was. Pregnant Michelle wasn't alarmed by Jason Young's behavior. She intended only to comfort and support her during her pregnancy. Yet Jason saw an opportunity in it. What began as friendly support quickly escalated into flirtation and affair-initiating behavior. Jason Young and Michelle Manny began calling each other almost daily and sneaking out together, always justifying his absences as business trips for Jason while keeping their spouse unaware. Michelle informed Jason she was pregnant again in June 2006, yet this time he did not react positively. Michelle thought his distance might have something to do with their miscarriage experience several months prior. Little did she know, Jason had already begun planning how he wanted to end their marriage as quickly and painlessly as possible. Early November, when Michelle was five months pregnant and Jason had another business trip of 300 miles in his own car, but with hotel accommodations booked along the way. That evening, Michelle spoke on the phone with her best friend about family problems, as well as recalling an argument between herself and Jason the night before he left. After this conversation ended, she returned upstairs, put their daughter to bed, and fell asleep next to her. At about 10 p.m. in the evening, Jason checked into a hotel claiming he was tired from traveling, but quickly went directly to bed. In truth, however, he was carefully inspecting entrances, exits, and security camera locations as he carefully plotted how he could exit and enter unnoticed, planning what he believed to be an ideal crime plan. He prepared an ironclad alibi in anticipation. Jason had made contact with Meredith early that morning in order to seek assistance for their wedding anniversary surprise, giving Michelle something beautiful from an online store, but inadvertently sending the page to their home fax machine instead of Michelle seeing it first and ruining the surprise. Meredith agreed to assist Jason, though she disliked her son-in-law a great deal. Meredith had entered Michelle's house through a secret door in the garage that was known to only family members, leaving it always open and unlocked. Michelle's papers, keys, and wallet were still sitting on her table in the hallway as evidence that she hadn't left. It seemed eerily quiet there, too, despite having seen Michelle leave with no one around to claim them, if anything. Meredith noticed when she returned upstairs that Michelle's bedroom door was wide open, but no one answered when she called out for them. When she entered, however, she witnessed an unsettling scene where Michelle lay unconscious with a fractured skull in a pool of her own blood by the bedside floor. Blood was everywhere, on the walls, furniture, and even baby footprints near her body. Unfortunately, no one could help the pregnant woman. She had been dead for hours. Her sister quickly called emergency services when she heard something moving underneath the bed. Cassidy stared back, confused but terrified. Cassidy had seen her mother die, spending hours by her body as evidenced by marks on the floor and toys brought for comforting purposes by Cassidy herself. Later, forensic experts identified numerous bruises, abrasions, and fractures on Michelle's body, 
indicating a long and violent attack by unknown means. Michelle had her teeth knocked out while her skull fractured with something heavy. Unfortunately, this murder weapon never materialized. Bloodied pillows were found next to the body, with evidence pointing toward it being used to smother her. No other items had been stolen from the house, suggesting that murder had been their sole goal. Locks were undamaged, and no signs of forced entry could be seen. This suggests that the perpetrator may have known about and had access to a secret door known only to family members. Young was the suspected culprit, yet had an alibi that seemed compelling. He claimed he checked into his hotel room that night and left in the morning for a scheduled business meeting. Checkbacks confirmed this use of Young's room key card, both times, at nighttime for entering and in the morning for exiting. However, upon closer investigation, a host of oddities and inconsistencies soon surfaced. A hotel employee noticed early one morning that an emergency exit was both open and propped, open with cobblestones to prevent it from closing too suddenly. When the investigation decided to check out the surveillance camera, aimed at that door to find out who committed the crime, they found out that this camera had been deliberately disabled on the night of Young's arrival at his room and stopped recording about 30 minutes after Young had arrived at his lodgings. Uneven Stranger still was discovered during the night, during which someone who looked like Jason Young was seen purchasing gas at a station between his hotel room and the crime scene. However, when asked for identification as per rule, he refused and quickly left after paying in cash. An attendant later identified Jason Young, but this man maintained that they had slept in their hotel room during that night. Young was also calling Michelle Mani more than two dozen times on the day before the tragedy, and near morning time, five more times with short conversations lasting only 15 seconds each time, suggesting Jason may have been panicked as these calls came from outside of the hotel where he claimed to have spent all night. Additionally, he appeared late for scheduled business meetings and appeared disoriented and confused. Young's evidence, taken individually or collectively, could not prove his guilt in Michelle's murder, thus leading to years of investigation and an agonizingly long verdict process. Meanwhile, Jason lived his normal life, even gaining custody of their young daughter despite their relatives having known Michelle since childhood, further heightening suspicions he may be guilty. Jason Young was arrested at the end of 2009 but, despite an abundance of evidence pointing towards his guilt, was not found guilty due to an impasse among members of the jury. Eventually, in 2012, however, more evidence came forward, including testimony from witnesses who saw Jason Young outside different parts of the hotel that night, as well as testimony from those who saw his distinctive white car parked not far from where his own house stood in an unlit lot. Child psychologist Dr. Lisa Weitz testified of Cassidy's bizarre doll play during which she would depict how Jason spanked and then would not pick up his wife from the floor after spanking her, leading her to stay on her knees until her daddy spanked again and they both dropped to their knees on the floor together. Monty testified as an eyewitness against Jason. She admitted his affair but justified it by explaining he was deeply unhappy in his family life, as stated to everyone by him. Another former mistress admitted she feared his outbursts of anger would hit hard and could hit them both during such episodes, further complicating matters further for both of them in court proceedings. Jason Young was found guilty after an extended trial for brutally assaulting his pregnant wife. For this crime, he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Jason filed his initial appeal, but it was rejected. Subsequent attempts for review of his case by state court of appeals panels also proved futile. Cassidy became virtually orphaned as her mother was murdered while Jason went behind bars, now being raised by an aunt and maternal grandparents in foster care. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Today we will examine a horrifying case involving envy and insatiable greed, two powerful yet dark emotions which often drive individuals down criminal paths. When combined with unbridled sexual desire or an obsessive need to control others, these feelings can quickly transform into lethal plans that threaten innocent lives, an idea made even more chilling when these emotions simmer within a family unit.
This story takes place in a Sydney suburb and centers around the Lynn family, who were seemingly living a peaceful and large household before embarking on what has since been one of Australia's most notorious crimes. Complex and prolonged, this investigation stands out for its difficulty and duration. As the perpetrator group had every intention of evading justice with their carefully crafted and brutally implemented plan, however, one minor detail eventually led the police to their breakthrough. Let's explore its origins, such as greed, envy for others' success, corrupt passion driving someone into madness transforming into monstrous figures who wouldn't spare children in their spree. The Lin family story is one of love, ambition, and tragedy. Min Lin and Yoon Lin began their romantic entanglement during their college years at an Australian university during the late 1980s. Both natives of China but separately immigrating for higher education, Lily via an exchange program and Min after completion of his bachelor's degree, respectively. When their paths crossed on campus corridors later, it was love at first sight. Both felt out of place but united by shared hopes for starting new lives after graduation. Min and Yoon married and moved into North Epping in Sydney's tranquil suburb. Over time, their love blossomed into a tight-knit family deeply connected and committed to each other. In August 1994, they welcomed their first child, June Brenda Lynn, commonly known by her middle name Brenda, followed by Henry in 1997 and Terry two years later. Entering 2000, Min and Yoon embarked upon an ambitious business venture. Opening a small newsstand, their commitment soon saw it transformed into a flourishing news agency complete with its publishing arm on Rose Street. The Lin family business thrived, affording them an increasingly comfortable lifestyle with a spacious home, luxury car, and access to elite private schooling for their children. Min focused on business matters, while Yoon took care in nurturing her children at home and homeschooling them herself. Within their community, the Lins were widely respected for their hard work, kindness, philanthropy, and being caring parents, without ever engaging in disputes or dramas with anyone. Brenda was their eldest, an outstanding student with a compassionate nature who demonstrated this through her studies. Henry and Terry, her brothers, shared her zest for sports, especially soccer as they developed close bonds that almost inseparably bound them together. As Lynn family settled into Australia and experienced growing financial stability, they welcomed relatives from China to visit or stay. Over time, they even invited relatives from China to visit or stay permanently. Early in 2000, Min and Yun moved their parents from California to North Epping for help raising their three children, while Min's father continued working his newsstand on weekends. A few years later, Yoon's parents also came over, with Min and Yoon purchasing them a small home there, as they bought themselves one too. Later still, Yoon's sister Irene came and lived with the Lins, helping with housework as well as raising Irene and the Lin children. At this point, the Lin family business was producing significant income, reported at nearing one million annually. Their venture wasn't just a shop or publishing house. Instead, it had become a central gathering spot where local residents would meet to read news over coffee. At the end of 2007, Kathy Lin, Nai, along with her husband Liang Bin Robert Z, also made a move to Australia seeking better opportunities in Sydney. While visiting relatives previously and briefly living in Melbourne before returning home again, this time they intended to make Australia their permanent home. Robert had tried his luck as an ENT doctor in China before attempting entrepreneurship. They opened a restaurant using all their savings, but it eventually closed, and subsequent attempts at opening cafes or snack bars also proved futile. Robert, lacking business acumen or financial management skills, struggled in his new endeavors despite best intentions of opening new ventures. Robert and Kathy relocated to North Epping in order to be closer to family. While Kathy found employment, Robert continued his quest for self-discovery and was uncertain of his next steps. Both Lynn and Z families were bound together, not just by blood but also strong friendship, seeing each other almost daily and staying in constant touch through regular family meals. This final gathering took place Friday, July 17, 2009, at Kathy and Min's parents' home, unbeknownst to any of them that this would be their final reunion. 
On the morning of July 18th, the Lin family home became the scene of an unspeakable massacre. Their shop, which had previously operated seven days a week for years, closed suddenly without notice or warning on its doors. This caused alarm among both regular customers and neighboring store owners who tried unsuccessfully to contact Min directly and instead decided to call his sister Kathy instead to inquire into his condition. Kathy was both surprised and alarmed, knowing her brother Min had never closed his shop without prior arrangement, often having one of his father's or father-in-law's cover for him. Kathy attempted calling Min, and then his wife Yoon without success. Neither their home phone nor Kathy's calls went through either. Concerned for his well-being, Kathy decided with Robert to visit Min's residence to check that everything was all right. Arriving around 9 a.m., they noticed their family car parked in the driveway and found an unlocked front door, but no sign of its residents. Inside was eerily quiet with calls for family members going unanswered. No evidence was visible indicating forced entry, as she continued calling out for him on her way up the stairs to call out. Kathy eventually decided to ascend to the second floor balcony for support from there. As soon as she entered Min and Yun Lin's bedroom door, she was shocked and horrified at what she found inside. An entire room soaked with blood, covering its floor, walls, ceiling, furniture, and curtains. Yun Lin was found lying lifeless near her bed, her face disfigured beyond recognition. In an adjacent room where his sister Irene, aged 39 years, slept, the scene was equally horrifying. Irene lay dead on her mattress with blood-stained face. Henry, 12 years old, and Terry, 9 years old, had both been brutally beaten to death in their bedrooms. Their bodies lay scattered about. Brenda, their 15-year-old daughter, had thankfully been away on a school trip at that time, and so wasn't at home during this horrific night of violence. Min Lin had gone missing, raising hopes that he might still be alive, or injured, or taken hostage, or have managed to flee. Kathy immediately called emergency services, but she was too in shock to properly explain what had happened, screaming and sobbing into the phone, beseeching them to come quickly in an effort to save as many lives as possible from what had transpired at their household. Unfortunately, first responders could only confirm all deaths at the site of massacre. Robert left right away to collect Robert Lynn and Kathy Lynn's parents, who lived 10 kilometers from the crime scene, after hearing of its shocking discovery following their calls to emergency services, police and paramedics arrived within minutes and witnessed one of the most horrifying crime scenes they'd ever witnessed. Unfortunately for all members of Lin family who had already been killed with multiple blows to the head from an object resembling a hammer-shaped weapon which investigators believed had been taken away by its perpetrator. Unfortunately for all members of Lin family, each had already died by multiple strikes, by multiple blows from this lethal weapon, which had taken with its perpetrator. Min Lin's body was discovered in his own bedroom, covered by a blood-stained blanket, and had been brutally beaten to death like his family members. An initial inspection of the scene produced no significant leads or clues. No lethal weapon had been seen, and all valuables and money had remained undisturbed suggesting that their primary target may have been killing off the Lin family as opposed to theft. At first, multiple assailants were suspected, since it appeared unlikely that one person could overcome so many. However, evidence revealed that children were awake during the attack and desperately tried to flee, evidenced by bloodstains and splatters around the house. All adult victims displayed signs of strangulation, possibly intended to limit resistance during assault. In addition to head injuries, bloody shoe prints were discovered in each room, each featuring its own tread pattern, but without being identifiable to a brand or size. No foreign fingerprints were discovered suggesting the killers wore gloves. Initially, there were no leads or theories, as family friends and neighbors of Lynn's had no known enemies who might have committed such a brutal murder spree of five people nor a motive behind such an atrocious crime occurring sometime between midnight and 3 OEOM on July 18th. The time and date of attack remains unknown, but its time and date remain unclear, most likely occurring sometime between midnight and 3 OEOM on July 18th.
Brenda Lynn was on a school trip in New Caledonia when the tragic incident unfolded, learning of it via social media and initially refusing to believe that it involved her family. Her aunt Kathy soon called with confirmation, breaking down sobbing during their conversation. Brenda was quickly flown back home where her new guardians met her at Sydney Airport before moving in together, with them due to the home being sealed as a crime scene. Next day, grieving Brenda was brought in for questioning at the police station, but could provide no new information, insisting her family had no enemies or ill-wishers and had witnessed nothing unusual before traveling on this trip. Following their deaths, Brenda became heir to an extensive fortune containing both property and her family business. But as a minor still attending school, her legal guardians, Aunt Kathy and Robert, would manage it on her behalf, although Brenda's grandparents offered support as well. Kathy and Robert insisted upon being her primary caretakers. Robert threatened legal action if elderly relatives attempted to seek custody, arguing they were too old for caring for a teenager. Eventually, however, the matter was resolved amicably, and Brenda stayed with her aunt and uncle. Lynn's shop and publishing business soon reopened under their management as Brenda was yet to take over business operations. Robert began actively reviewing all family accounts, including bank accounts, savings, real estate assets, and any other potential holdings that might become assets over time. Investigation and theories experts carefully examined every detail of the crime scene. Unfortunately, no concrete leads were developed from their efforts. Instead, they concluded that the killer likely operated alone and entered quietly through either an unlocked door or key, wearing size 9.5 shoes with an ornate tread pattern and never carrying his lethal weapon, a hammer, never found anywhere in or around the house, wearing gloves meant no fingerprints were left behind, and only trace DNA evidence from five victims could be detected at this location. Bloodstains were observed on all bedroom doorknobs where crimes had taken place, suggesting the killer touched them with his bloody gloves. Brenda's room, however, lacked this marker indicating they knew she wasn't present and didn't bother leaving his mark there either. As one of Australia's high-profile cases, this tragic event received widespread media coverage. Without solid evidence or suspects to point the finger at, various unlikely theories began surfacing including speculation regarding Lynn's supposed vast fortune, leading up to their demise. There were speculations of robberies gone awry or involvement of local Chinese mafia clans. Such speculation wasn't entirely discounted considering their area's history with burglaries. Lynn's shop had been attacked months prior, while men had witnessed an armored car robbery, which a week before, fatal incidents. As criminals wore masks, so he wasn't easily identifiable as witnesses, so it was speculated he might have been removed as potential witnesses, as potential witnesses, as men could not identify them, so might have been eliminated as potential witnesses before these tragic incidents unfolded. Long months passed with no lead being established on any theory, nor any suspects appearing. Money and valuables were left untouched during the killing, suggesting the killer had only one goal, eliminating household members. Furthermore, power was cut off on the night of fatal incidents, suggesting they knew where the electrical panel was located. Additionally, their familiarity with the house in total darkness suggested they may have even secured an access key beforehand. An investigator reviewed every detail of the perplexing case until one key overlooked clue emerged while listening to Kathy's emergency call recording, searching for any missed clues. Surprisingly, an important hint was found within that recording. It recorded her attempts at explaining the situation, their words often confused and interrupted by cries and sobs, until at the end when the operator confirmed emergency services had arrived, she suddenly mentioned her husband by name while speaking, Cantonese directly addressing him as part of the phone call itself. Investigators were intrigued when Kathy began to plead with Robert not to leave her alone at home an important detail given his decision to fetch Lynn parents on his own before calling police, leaving Kathy alone at a grisly crime scene where five had just been brutally taken away and possibly still be hiding inside. Yet he left, seemingly knowing nothing bad would come of it for his wife Kathy. After several fruitless months, police finally managed to secure new information regarding their main suspect, 
and new evidence against him, her. Robert Z was ultimately identified as the main and sole suspect. It was found that Min had given Robert a key to Min's home, just in case anything came up during interrogation sessions. Yet Robert never mentioned this during interrogation sessions or informed Kathy of this key being given him by Min. Brenda accidentally revealed this critical piece of information to investigators. Further investigations revealed that Robert's claims of being an accomplished ENT doctor were no more than an illusion. While he held a medical degree, he never held down a stable job within his field of medicine. According to reports circulating about China bribery allegations, after fleeing there to Australia, he failed to establish himself professionally, spending away all of his savings in unprofitable business ventures before finally moving back home where he depended on his wife Kathy's income, as well as occasionally receiving financial help from relatives. Once his guardianship papers for Brenda were finalized, Robert began acting as though he were inheritor of Lin family assets. His first move was forcing Yun's parents out of a home Min had purchased for them, albeit it legally belonged to Min. Min and Kathy's parents continued living in it. Investigators suspected Robert was driven by intense jealousy of more successful and wealthy relatives of Brenda, and harboring long-standing plans to seize their property, funds, and lucrative businesses. Brenda and Kathy lived under the same roof with Robert, the perpetrator of their family's crime, yet neither were immediately in danger due to Robert's lack of insight or clues from Kathy about his true nature. Furthermore, Robert needed her for control of family assets, but due to lack of concrete evidence against Robert, police could not arrest him yet. Interrogation, surveillance, and arrest. The investigation team obtained permission to install hidden cameras in the household with hopes of gathering evidence against Robert Zeh, its breakthrough came unexpectedly quickly. During an interrogation with Kathy Z, Robert's preference for one brand of shoes became known. Over several years prior, he purchased two pairs from a limited edition series that particularly appealed to him. One had already worn out, leaving another stored away carefully at their home. Both pairs shared the same size 9.5 foot size that his killer wore. Robert was captured on one of the hidden cameras carefully destroying a box of shoes from which they had purchased, leading police to issue a search warrant and search his home, where they discovered new pair of size 9.5 sneakers, matching prints found at the crime scene, and also in smeared trace that appeared similar to blood in Robert's garage, which forensic analysis revealed contained all five Lynn family victim DNA, thus connecting him directly with this crime. Arrest, Trial and Shocker Revealer Two years after the tragic incidents occurred, evidence led to Robert Z's arrest in May 2011. He denied any involvement by saying blood found in his garage had appeared after returning from visiting Lynn's house. Further, any significance attached to sneakers with matching tread patterns found on them were disregarded as they were new and that they had already disposed of any old pair he may have owned immediately before their discovery. Robert had unknowingly shared prison cells with multiple informants for three years prior to being sent for trial, unaware that any had known about it. While speaking with one informant, he revealed how meticulously planned and covert. He planned the crime and carefully covered up its tracks, such as purchasing lethal weapon at store without surveillance cameras, drugging his wife with sedative-laced tea so she would sleep through him leaving without waking, disposing of hammer, sneakers, gloves, and clothing so they would never be found again. Dispersal from store without surveillance cameras as well. At his trial, Robert denied everything. All evidence against him consisted of statements from his cellmates and indirect evidence mentioned earlier. Therefore, the jury could not reach an unanimous verdict and Robert was released on bail in December 2015. In June 2016, however, Robert was brought back into court following testimony from an informant that claimed Robert confessed his love of Brenda since she was 13. This testimony caused Brenda to tearfully admit to coercion into sexual relationships shortly after moving in with them, but she remained quiet for fear of reprisals so long ago. As a result of these revelations and other evidence, Robert Z was found guilty on all counts and given five life sentences without parole for each of the fatal crimes he had committed. All his subsequent appeals were also unsuccessful. 
share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Agnesi Clavina made headlines in fall 2014 when her story made waves of controversy. A young and attractive woman, having fun in a club with friends, seemed to suddenly vanish without trace, leaving everyone involved apparently without responsibility. Yet nine years after Agnesi Clavina disappeared into thin air, the case took an unexpected twist. But let's get down to its root causes first. Born July 8, 1984 in Riga, Latvia's capital city, Agnese Klavina grew up as one of two daughters of her parents. With Greta only being two years older than Agnese themselves, these two remained very close and close-knit from day one. Agnese's parents did their best to give both daughters an education they deserved and enable them to pursue their ambitions. Agnese was an outgoing, cheerful, and very active girl from early on in her life. She excelled academically at school, participated in sports activities, made many friends, and dreamt of making tourism or entertainment her profession, as she loved travel and knew how to organize, perfectly sure time, plus had beautiful features. Men always paid her compliments. From an early age on, she attracted plenty of admirers who sought ways to attract her attention. Agnes began her post-secondary life in Latvia before attending language courses and studying tourism management. At 20, Agnes decided to move from her native Latvia to London, where she believed there would be greater prospects and opportunities to develop all her potential and talents. Her family did not oppose this decision, but offered their full support in it. Soon after her move, Agnese met Michael Mills, an attractive young man eight years older who owned his own successful movie theater and entertainment complex business, and considered himself highly successful. Michael and Agnes quickly connected, quickly began dating, and made plans for a future together. Michael showed his affection by giving expensive gifts. Together they traveled and made plans for their future. It seemed they were truly in love and headed toward a prosperous life together. Those close to Agnes remember her glowing at his side while dreaming of becoming his lawful wife in due time. Kavina received an offer to work on a three-month labor contract as administrator in one of Marbella's most renowned nightclubs, the Club Marbella. Naturally, this job would require her to temporarily move countries. She took this opportunity with great stride. Michael could not follow his lover to Spain due to his job obligations, but wasn't opposed to her signing the contract either. Agnes saw this opportunity as an incredible chance to expand her experience and move further along in her professional development in this direction. Marbella is one of the Mediterranean coast's most renowned and attractive resorts. Visitors come from around the world, typically wealthy people seeking relaxation and spending fun money here. Here you can often meet show business stars, as well as notable athletes and business people like Kavina, who was always highly social and enjoyed working there. Agnese visited her family in Latvia before departing England, informing them of her positive employment contract and an upcoming wedding with Michael. Parents, mother and sister, all expressed genuine happiness for Agnese and offered best wishes for a smooth transition into her new life in England. Agnese packed only what she needed for one season at the end of May 2014 and took off for sunny Spain to work. While her lover remained behind in London, they called each other daily and communicated via video link, telling each other everything that had been going on in their lives. Kavina actively maintained pages in various popular social networks where she posted daily photos, small videos, and stories. Her followers closely tracked all her activities. It was clear Agnese enjoyed an engaging lifestyle full of surprises every day. Agnese decided to stay in Spain for another two months when her employment contract came to an end. Velvet season in her resort meant an opportunity to earn good money during this time. After consulting her boyfriend and receiving his support and promising to visit for several days as they hadn't seen each other for a long while, Agnes almost instantly secured employment as a hostess at a high-end restaurant and renewed her lease agreement. Michael visited Agnese as promised and they enjoyed planning the upcoming wedding and choosing their honeymoon location. Less than one week later, however, 
Michael flew back to London, leaving Agnesa behind in Spain for another month of work, before she would visit Latvia to meet Michael again before flying over. But tragically, these plans would never come true. On September 6th, Agnese went with her friends to one of the popular nightclubs in her region, Costa del Sol. A few hours before, she informed her fiancé of their plans and didn't object to Agnese having fun with them. Pictures were taken, which Agnese then uploaded onto her online profile. Recollections from those who witnessed Agnese that night suggest she wore an eye-catching short dress with a tiny white clutch handbag on that fateful evening. At sunrise, as Agnese was about to leave with her friends, she announced her intention of staying an additional hour and then taking a cab ride home. Being known for being responsible and not having had much alcohol herself, no cause was apparent for concern from Agnese's companions. When everyone said goodbye and left for home, Kavina began conversing with an unknown individual who had bought her a cocktail as they attempted to gain Agnese's favor. Once Kavina disappeared into a nightclub on that fateful night, no one remembered if she was alive or dead. No one remembered when or with whom she left or where she went afterwards. Agnese failed to show up for work the following day either, and her phone had been switched off when attempts to contact her failed. Colleagues and friends raised the alarm immediately, while police responded slowly to reports about missing people. Michael became alarmed upon realizing he hadn't heard from Agnese all day something which never had happened before, and called Agnese's mother to report it. They attempted to contact Spanish police to report her disappearance, but were told their relatives needed to file such reports themselves, or it wouldn't be taken into consideration. Michael and Kavanaugh's family boarded their flight for Marbella, where Michael filed his report himself on an outbound flight the following morning. At last, Agnese's family filed her missing person report only five days after Agnesi vanished without trace. First on their agenda was Agnese's apartment. However, it appeared as though Kavina had left soon and would return soon. Documents, money, and jewelry had all been put away neatly. Prepared food had been placed in the refrigerator. Several outfits for Agnes to choose from when attending her last club night were on her bed. Her phone had been switched off since leaving with friends. No further posts had been left on social media, and no messages received in return. No indication as to her whereabouts existed either. At last, police began their investigation of Agnese's disappearance. Too late, though. Friends and family began posting flyers all around town with her picture and pleas for help in her search, while media coverage featured Agnese on TV news programs as well as local newspaper front pages. Police found their first leads and clues by studying footage from CCTV cameras inside and outside of the entertainment venue. But this proved problematic, since all files had already been erased at that time, requiring specialists to restore them. But their efforts paid off when one recording made by a camera at the exit to the parking lot showed Agnes leaving with someone that clearly wasn't her free will at six in the morning. Closer examination revealed Kavanaugh alive. This footage would later become frightening. Agnese was being led by a large man, and it was clear she was following under coercion. Her waist was being held tight by his grip. Agnese appeared frightened, struggled to break free several times, and expressed herself emotionally. Yet her companion persisted with leading her towards the parking lot, where he forcibly led her into his Mercedes A63 with tinted windows and forced her inside it. At the moment when he pushed her into the cabin, it became evident that another individual was already inside while he headed towards the driver's seat. Agnese managed to open her car door, then attempted to escape. But at that moment, the doorman who was standing close by came up, gestured toward Agnes and told the driver something. The doorman pushed Agnes back into her seat, after which Agnes's driver gave something as payment, likely an inducement to help. About six minutes after Agnese had boarded her car, her phone was switched off and never turned back on again. Furthermore, there were no CCTV cameras to track its further movement, thus rendering its further path unknown to everyone except those inside its cabin, who subsequently managed to make contact with Agnese again. Surprisingly, this case was handled with extreme secrecy from its inception. 
all participants signed non-disclosure documents, keeping information out of the press while also withholding it from Agnes's loved ones, not even her parents and fiancé. For months on end, parents and fiancé were only informed that an investigation had started, but too early to draw any conclusions, with no trace of Agnese ever being given. During this period it seemed unlikely she was still alive. Michael periodically gave interviews in which he sought assistance, but nothing ever came in response. No one ever responded to his pleas for help in finding Agnese. Six months later, Agnese's relatives were shown footage from club cameras, as well as names of all three men who had last interacted with her. Wesley Capper was identified as one of them. Wesley is the son of an influential British millionaire named Wesley Capper, while longtime companion Craig Porter often served as his passenger during rides. Also present was Keon Usman from Dorman Security Services, who served as his dark skinned doorman counterpart. Porter and Usman both claimed they were innocent during interrogations, asserting that Agnese had entered their car voluntarily. Capper reported seeing her at a club before approaching her to get acquainted. Agnes had already become quite inebriated, contradicting her friend's testimony, yet did not refuse the drink that Wesley offered her. Once Wesley suggested continuing the party at his luxurious country estate house, Agnes readily agreed. Agnes decided she no longer wanted to attend Wesley's party and requested being dropped off in the middle of the road instead, stating she would take a cab back home. The man claimed he dropped off his passenger at her desired destination, an unlit stretch of road with no CCTV cameras whatsoever. Craig Porter could neither confirm nor deny Wesley Capper's statements because, according to his confession, he himself was heavily intoxicated and did not understand when and why Agnes had come into their car. Furthermore, he stated that as soon as they left the parking lot, he fell asleep, and when he awoke, she was no longer there. Sean Usman, another doorman suspect, also claimed Agnese Clavina was drunk, but could not answer the question of her voluntary entry into the car. When the vehicle touched down, however, when Agnese opened her door to almost jump out, while driving she opened it again almost as fast and almost fell up before Sean Usman was asked whether this appeared suspicious. His answer, not at all, and may simply have been an attempt by Agnes to escape while walking while drunk. Additionally, she did not scream out for help at that moment either. On camera, Wesley Capper could be seen forcefully leading Agnese toward her car while holding onto her waist and wrist with both hands. Wesley provided no explanation as to why he did this, other than Agnese was dizzy, so Wesley needed to hold down so she wouldn't fall. Not long afterward, the investigation discovered a video made in Soto Grande in southern Spain at Puerto de la Duquesa port. Here, John Capper, father of one of the suspects, had docked his luxury yacht moored there. On September 10th, four days after Agnes disappeared, footage captured of Wesley, Craig, and two other men boarding the yacht was seen carrying an apparently heavy suitcase as well as a roll of carpet. But upon their return to Puerto de la Duquesa, a few days later without their luggage on board, was unexpectedly shown to have vanished altogether. After viewing the footage, Kerr stated that he and his friends had come to Ibiza for fun. According to him, their suitcase contained their belongings, while what investigators mistook as carpet was actually bedding. Where it all ended up was unknown to him. A search of Wesley's yacht and automobile yielded no results, as both had been cleaned thoroughly with detergent to erase all traces of DNA, despite finding long blonde hairs in Wesley's trunk, though they mysteriously dissipated during investigation. At trial, the prosecution revealed another intriguing detail. Soon after Agnese was in Capper's car, Capper called emergency services several times before dropping them without waiting for an answer, or as though afraid or doubting his actions. When confronted, Capper explained he had been drinking and made random calls at random times. A lawyer for Claven family believed Agnese had long since died, and her body may even still be resting somewhere beneath the seabed likely resting somewhere inside one of the suitcases brought aboard yacht by suspects. Further, case was deliberately prolonged, so criminals had plenty of time to hide evidence against themselves from prosecution and erase any proof. Capper, Porter, and Usman found themselves facing charges only 18 months after Agnese went missing. 
they were accused of holding her against her will and forcing her into their car. Due to a lack of evidence, there were no further charges brought against them and so the millionaire and his friend were released on bail and quietly left courtroom. Naturally, Agnes's relatives were outraged. Nevertheless, the judge stood firm. All three men were brought back on to trial five years after Agnes had disappeared, claiming Kavina entered their vehicle of her own accord. The prosecutor asked that Usman be considered an accomplice in this crime for helping drive away victim. Had Usman been found responsible, his actions could have earned him five years behind bars. He made an impassioned defense, alleging that he had been wrongfully charged due to the color of his skin and lack of funds available for legal representation due to sending all his earnings back home to an impoverished African family in need. Capper and Porter's attorneys insisted that their clients had only persuaded Agnes to get into the car, not forcibly forcing her. They believed the young woman was dropped off on the road as she requested, yet during her wait for a cab, she could have been kidnapped and killed by third parties due to being drunk and having no way of protecting herself against being taken advantage of by them. The court verdict surprised and angered Agnese's relatives, as none of the defendants was punished at all for taking advantage of Agnese's drunken state to lure her into Capper's car, while Porter received six months for complicity. All these men received suspended sentences, as they never served any time behind bars, but rather paid her family 101,000 sterling as compensation. Kavina's family were dismayed at this decision and filed an appeal. While waiting for a court's verdict, both defendants in this case managed to violate the law once again. Capper was under the influence of alcohol and drugs when he caused the death of a woman and fled from the scene, while Porter and his friends, also under the influence, stole her car after beating its owner mercilessly. Capper was found guilty of this serious offense, but, thanks to the strong legal defense presented by his lawyers, was only sentenced to probation. He paid compensation to the family of the woman killed under his car while remaining free. Porter, on the other hand, went into jail, but it is unknown what sentence was handed out publicly. At nearly seven years after Agnes had vanished, her main suspect, Wesley Capper, lived an irresponsible lifestyle of alcoholism and substance abuse that severely compromised his health. At the height of COVID pandemic, he found himself hospitalized. Just when he thought he had overcome it all, suddenly had a stroke and died on July 26, 2021 in his 44th year. At that point, Agnes's parents filed another appeal with the Supreme Court, though now without their suspect alive any longer they could no longer prosecute him either. Unexpectedly, nine years later, this unexpected development occurred. Though Agnese Clavina had never been found dead or alive, her body was presumed deceased and later agreed with the lawyer's account of how criminals had concealed Agnese in a suitcase that was then loaded onto a yacht and dumped somewhere on the high seas, making its discovery near impossible. However, in 2023, Nine years after Agnese disappeared without trace, an unexpected turn occurred. In mid-June of that year, while cleaning one of Lita Golf Clubs located along Costa del Sol region's Lita Golf Club, found something odd near shore. Closer inspection revealed it as being a badly damaged suitcase. Therefore, he did not dare open it himself, but called police instead for assistance instead. Law enforcement officials were shocked to find human remains inside of a suitcase found floating on the water near Florida, with examination revealing they belonged to a young woman between 25-35 years of age, who died at about 25-30 years old, at time of her death. Furthermore, examination indicated the suitcase spent over 10 years floating before it was brought ashore for transporting and examination by law enforcement personnel. Based on these facts alone, they suspected it may belong to Agnese Clavina, who went missing nine years ago. To make their hypothesis more certain, examinations must compare DNA between Agnese's DNA with remains found alongside human remains found. Experts are working hard on this investigation, but details have yet to be made public. If suspicions are confirmed, this will provide grounds to reopen the case and bring all remaining suspects before a judge for trial.
The summer of 1985 in London turned out to be sunny and warm, breathing nature and tranquility. However, at 3.30 on the morning of August 7th, a sudden phone call rang at the home of Jeremy Bamber, heir to White House Farm. The young man, barely awake, picked up the phone wondering who could be calling him so early. On the other end of the line was his foster father, his voice sounding unusual. He was clearly panicking, and Jeremy couldn't make out his father's words. He tried to concentrate and realize what had happened, but his efforts were futile and soon there was an eerie silence on the other end of the line. The last thing Jeremy heard from his father was, Your sister's gone crazy, she's got a gun. Without hesitation, Jeremy immediately called the police and reported his sister's alarming dialogue, emphasizing its potential danger to himself and his sister. A half hour after receiving this call from Jeremy himself, officers arrived on site, followed by officers assigned to investigate further. As was typical with English police forces, upon hearing what the son of the farm owners had reported over the phone to the police force, since it was suspected that weapons may be involved, English law enforcement decided not to rush in as their professional strategy required. Effectiveness can be debated endlessly. Ultimately, the English authorities must determine their success. When they arrive at a scene of a call, they usually arrive unarmed and observe events without intervening directly, waiting either for the situation to resolve itself naturally or for special units to step in as needed. Police officers remained at a distance from the house while remaining close to Jeremy and asked him about what had occurred in their family home the previous night. According to Jeremy, they had all been eating dinner together as a family. There had been some slight disagreement towards the end of dinner, but nothing serious that could have caused such an unforeseen tragedy. Furthermore, Jeremy revealed that both his pistol and .22 caliber carbine had been left with his parents, both fully functional and loaded. Special team that arrived on the scene determined that all doors and windows in the house were locked, except one on the first floor master bedroom window. Utilizing loudspeakers for two hours, they tried communicating with someone inside but only heard barking of a dog inside. Nearly three hours had passed since the first police officers had arrived on the scene. By eight in the morning, SWAT team officers entered a house marked by an eerie silence. Carefully, they moved through each room until reaching the kitchen where chaos reigned. An overturned chair lay scattered on the floor beside Neville Bamber, Jeremy's father. Their bodies showed evidence of struggle as evidenced by bruises and abrasions on arms, face, broken nose and jaw, although unfortunately due to eight bullet wounds, including six to the head, chances for survival were no longer viable. On a kitchen surface lay a telephone with its receiver removed and several rounds of Dowdern 22 caliber ammunition, an image which left police shocked. Nonetheless, they proceeded with their investigation in detail of the entire house beginning by inspecting its first floor, first if there were no family members present, and later on, its second. Every step had to be carefully taken so as to minimize unnecessary noise. But due to creaky floors in an older home, this proved challenging. There were no further bodies found on the first floor. However, in two bedrooms on the second floor, four more bodies were discovered. June, Sheila, Daniel, and Nicholas. Four children killed by gunshots. Sheila lying near her parents' room, with two bullet wounds under her chin, along with 25 bullets used to take out five family members. That many bullets provoked questions. Was someone taking aim at the Bamber family on purpose? What had been their motivation? Or perhaps an attempt by the real perpetrator to mislead police officers? Authorities began conducting extensive investigations to gain answers for all these queries about each member of their deceased family. History of the Bamber family. Essex is an idyllic retreat just a short drive from London and attracts an endless flow of tourists, yet retains its value to locals by providing an escape from city life. You can enjoy fresh air while strolling endless green meadows or tasting crystal clear lake water. Visit medieval castles. Immerse yourself in amazing stories. This was probably why Essex became such an appealing location for the Bamber family when they decided to settle here. June and Neville found joy in owning White House Farm and making their dreams of marriage reality come true. At age 25, June married Neville, 
and together the couple set off on the journey that would see them create a strong and prosperous family life together. Neville served in the Royal Air Force before taking up magistrate duties for local courts after fulfilling his service obligation. Fate brought them some unexpected twists when June's efforts at becoming pregnant failed, prompting them to look into adopting children from an orphanage as a means of expanding their family. Two children, Sheila at just three months old and later Jeremy at six months old, became part of their lives. June and Neville proved to be caring parents, filling their children's days with love and care. Growing up, their children received an excellent education at prestigious private schools. The Bamber family's financial situation was extremely prosperous, allowing them to prove it to their children with every opportunity. Jeremy, despite his brilliant education, was characterized by a withdrawn character and preferred solitude. From childhood, his tendency toward rebelliousness was evident in elementary school, where he did poorly, leading to his parents' decision to send him to boarding school in 1970 when he was nine years old. The English boarding schools of the time were rigid, and Jeremy quickly realized that there would be strict discipline. The years at boarding school were difficult, but may have played a role in changing Jeremy's character for the better. Having excelled at university, he became more calm, and his parents were proud of their son. After successfully completing university, Jeremy's father, Neville, offered him a job on a farm in England. The young man immediately accepted the offer and in 1982, he returned from the journey he had been on since completing his studies. His parents provided him with comfortable accommodations, including a cottage, a car, and a good salary. They also counted on him to help them in their old age. However, despite outward success within the family, Jeremy faced tensions related to religious differences. June, a deeply religious woman, experienced turbulent emotions because her children did not share her religious beliefs. Her attempts to guide them toward faith were futile. Difficulties in family relationships and frustration led her to depression. She underwent treatment that included the use of electroshock therapy, which at the time was considered a method of dealing with mental illness. Sheila, June and Neville's daughter, also had a significant impact on her mother's development of depression. Unlike her calmer brother, Jeremy, she was fascinated by the fashion world and dreamed of becoming a model. But June adamantly denied the idea, not wanting to hear about her daughter being involved in the world of show business. These were just a few of the many surprises Sheila gave her parents. At the age of 17, she announced she was pregnant, and June was faced with a difficult choice. Forbid her daughter to have a child out of wedlock, as it was religiously unacceptable or force her to have an abortion which is also forbidden in the Christian world. In the end, June relieved herself of all responsibility and asked Sheila to make the decision herself, but in such a way that no one in their family would ever know that she had gotten rid of the pregnancy. The result was a deterioration in the relationship between mother and adopted daughter. In 1977, Sheila did marry Colin Caffel, the father of her first unborn child, despite her parents' protests. The young couple became a family and soon had twins, Nicholas and Daniel. However, after some time, Sheila began to suspect her husband of infidelity and filed for divorce. This had a serious impact on her mental health. Sheila spent several months in a psychiatric hospital, where she was also treated with electroshock therapy, just like her mother. Meanwhile, Sheila's sons were sent to an orphanage where they stayed for almost two years. Sheila's health only worsened. She became anxious, often expressing a desire to take her and her children's lives, claiming that they were under the influence of the devil. She suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, while Jeremy, who used to cause a lot of problems for his parents, calmed down and was happy with his life. In 1985, Sheila met up with her ex-husband, Colin, again, and they reunited taking their sons from the orphanage. In August, Sheila and her children were invited to the Bamber home to meet her parents. They were going to stay there for a week, after which Colin and the boys were to take a trip to Norway. He brought Sheila and the children to the farm, and on Tuesday, August 6, 1985, everyone gathered at the beautiful White House farmhouse. It turned out to be the last dinner of the Bamber family. A few days after the tragedy, the Bamber funeral was held, and naturally, Jeremy attended it. 
It was a difficult and bitter moment for him. He cried a lot and was shocked by what had happened. But it was on this day that the investigation took a new turn. Strange behavior was noticed in Jeremy's behavior, which relatives of the Bamber family reported to the authorities. During breaks between bouts of grief and tears, he would utter ridiculous phrases, referring to himself as the boss. Those around him saw a smile on his face, an unusual smile, but a smile characteristic of a contented winner. All these observations and remarks were passed on to the authorities, and they decided to investigate more thoroughly. On this ill-fated evening, everything seemed perfect. A family dinner, a joyous mood, a delicious meal. However, one comment made by Neville in June changed things. The parents suggested that Sheila send the children back to the orphanage, emphasizing that she was unable to provide them with a proper upbringing. This provocative suggestion displeased Sheila, and she reacted sharply, saying that she was already thinking about it and would make a decision on her own. The warm atmosphere of the evening was broken at 9.30 p.m. Jeremy headed to his house at the same time Barbara Wilson, the secretary of the Bamber Farm, called with a work-related matter. Neville picked up the phone, and Barbara noticed that he was irritable. There were loud voices in the background. People seemed to be arguing excitedly. This atmosphere amazed Barbara, for such a thing was a rare occurrence for the Bambers. She was unable to find out the cause of the conflict. However, as Neville quickly ended the conversation and hung up the phone. The next morning, all the family members in the house were found shot dead. Jeremy was the only one of the family left alive. He was unable to hide his tears. Years investigators were respectful of his emotions and gave Jeremy time to recover before beginning interviews. Jeremy shared all the information available, not forgetting to mention the difficulties his sister had faced in life and the conflict over dinner on the evening of August 6th before he left the house. At first glance, the crime committed by Sheila appears to be a desperate, and certainly unconscious act given her mental state. Under the influence of a parental remark, she could not stand the new invasion of her privacy, lost her mind, and resorted to gun violence, shooting the Bambers, her children, and herself. Investigators were certain that's exactly what happened. During an examination of the house, it became clear that the crime, which destroyed almost the entire family, was committed by the Bambers' mentally unstable adopted daughter, Sheila. This was evidenced by the weapon found lying on her body, pointing upwards towards her chin. The actions of the detective subsequently seem rather absurd. The police decided to put the house in order and to organize a strange process of burning the bloody bedding and carpets on which the bodies were lying. The police reasoned that they wished to rid Jeremy of the horrible memories of what had happened. The weapon found at the scene, which was potential evidence, was picked up by the officer with his bare hands, Reopening the investigation required a thorough examination of the scene to avoid jumping to conclusions. The first step was for detectives to examine the weapon. Several people's fingerprints were found on the barrel, including the investigator who apparently picked up an important piece of evidence without using gloves. The presence of Sheila's and Jeremy's prints didn't raise any questions. Jeremy confirmed that it was his gun, designed for hunting. He had purchased it legally. Sheila's prints, being a suspect in this crime, were quite expected. However, it is worth noting that the alleged perpetrator was shot twice in different parts of her body. How did she manage to subsequently take her own life? And that's where things started to become clearer. Suddenly, Julie, Jeremy's girlfriend, began to express doubts about his innocence. She contacted investigators and provided them with some curious details. On the night of August 7th, Jeremy called her, reporting problems at the farm. However, when Julie tried to find out more, Jeremy abruptly hung up. In addition, she recalled that several times before the tragedy, Jeremy had complained to her about his family, expressing fatigue with his in-laws. But the most shocking aspect of her testimony concerned the Bamber will. It turns out that the Bambers had made a will stating that all of their property was to go to their children upon their death half to each, and also, their mother was going to rewrite their share in favor of the twins. Sheila 
The events surrounding Sheila were an unexpected shock for Jeremy, and he openly expressed his displeasure with it with friends. Furthermore, Neville stipulated in his will that Jeremy be present on the farm in order to collect his portion from its estate. Julie saw him speak about planning to kill his family before placing the blame upon mentally unstable Sheila before police officers. According to Julie, he presented himself as the victim, telling them about this not only due to an interest in investigating, but also with revenge in mind. Julie informed police about this incident not just out of wanting to help investigate, but also out of wanting revenge against Sheila. According to Julie told them about this incident not solely out of wanting help, but out of wanting payback against Sheila as well. Once Jeremy discovered who his lover was, in order to cover up his tracks and deflect policeman attention away from himself, he gave them the name of a potential suspect, a plumber whom he had hired as part of their property renovation plan. Yet, this clever plan failed. A plumber was recognized and interrogated, yet his story rang true. Although confused by why he was being interrogated regarding crime-related inquiries, he managed to provide convincing proof that he wasn't present during incidents in question. So, the list of suspects was narrowed to one suspect, Jeremy Bamber himself. Although arrested briefly, due to no tangible evidence, Jeremy was released without further hassle from the authorities, though they attempted to prevent him from traveling abroad. Though with an inheritance now on hand, Jeremy's financial position had improved significantly. Soon thereafter, Jeremy decided to depart England for Saint-Tropez, France, for a relaxing vacation. Prior to leaving, he sold off his father's vehicle. Meanwhile, his Bamber cousins demanded that Sheila's alleged killing spree by her family members be reviewed. These demands were relayed to both police and media sources who informed them that their deputy, chief of CID, had already directed out all Bamber relatives after hearing allegations that James Bamber could have orchestrated such events. One of the brothers decided to examine the scene separately from his brothers. Doubting Sheila's involvement, he began searching for additional evidence. Meanwhile, his cousin sneaked through every door and cabinet, hoping to find new evidence. It worked. In one cupboard was hidden an object which shocked him, an empty silencer of an .22 caliber carbine covered with bloodstains, which inspired new possibilities. An examination of the length and width of the gun, along with its silencer installed, revealed evidence that Sheila could not turn it on herself and shoot herself, therefore ruling out Sheila as being responsible for murder. After being wounded twice and bleeding profusely from both wounds, she may have been unable to disassemble the silencer before concealing it away in her closet closet if she had fired without it. Had this extra device been present, it may have left bloodstain marks that proved it had been connected with carbine at moment of incident. On September 29th, Jeremy returned home and was immediately arrested by authorities for murdering members of his own family. This 18-day trial started on March 3, 1986 at Chelmsford Crown Court, where Jeremy Bamber looked arrogant in the dock during his trial. The prosecution alleged Bamber of lying, and telephone technicians from the station verified this by verifying his telephone line being busy that evening. As well, medical examiner testimony proved crucial during trial proceedings. Experts found a series of bruises, suggesting that Neville could withstand blows from his assailants. 2. Caliber Carbine According to the medical examiner, this weapon had also caused similar injuries on other victims. Given Sheila's fragile and small frame, it seems unlikely that she could have caused such severe injuries to Neville prior to his death. More likely is Jeremy was responsible for attacking him. Neville was covered with bruises upon his body. Sheila, too, likely received several blows during their fight, but no marks or bruises could be found anywhere on her body. Lawyers of Jeremy argued that Sheila, despite being mentally ill and physically fit, was capable of committing crimes. Their previous experience with guns and superior shooting ability gave evidence for this claim, along with fresher blood evidence which they believed pointed toward Sheila having killed first her family, then herself. Either realizing she'd committed a crime, or fear of coming police involvement as reasons. After hearing these theories, the prosecution was able to disprove them with solid evidence. 
A silencer with blood from Sheila's rifle was found hidden away in a closet, with blood traces belonging to Sheila. This evidence could not be refuted, leaving defense lawyers no other arguments to counter it. According to prosecution claims, Jeremy was motivated by frustration over learning of his mother's will splitting and by money issues in planning his bloodbath. On the day of the accident, Sheila was seen by both Sheila's housekeeper and two employees without any unusual behaviors being displayed by Sheila or her children. Two employees also saw this and reported she appeared content. Barbara Wilson, who worked as farm clerk, reported contacting Neville around 9.15 p.m. and assumed she was breaking up an argument between Sheila and Neville. Instead, Barbara saw Neville become angry and start hanging out his fury as though this were something he has never done before. And she says, Neville usually remains calm person, whereas half an hour later, it is when Jeremy left his parents and went home alone. At nightfall, after a particularly long night, he returned to the bicycle he'd received from his mother just days earlier in order to remain hidden from view and avoid crossing any major roadway. Through an open doorway in a first-floor bedroom, Jeremy gained entry and found an unloaded and ready gun before entering his parents' bedroom where he fired two rounds, killing Jane before firing it again at Neville, who awakened to protect himself. Jeremy attempted to commit suicide with this weapon before his father intervened with an attempt at protection himself and ended his own life instead. Fighting ensued between father and son. Jeremy managed to kill his father while in the kitchen before retreating back upstairs where he killed Sheila, along with her daughters, making it appear that his sister was responsible. Once killed, Jeremy left his carbine behind before climbing back onto his bike before making his way home. At first, Jeremy telephoned his girlfriend Julie and nearly fainted with excitement before calling the police to report his alleged father's phone call. This incident further raised doubts regarding the investigation, as should Nevola have been threatened he would have called them himself rather than his son Jeremy. Additionally, blood splatter was not evident around their home phony, despite a testimony by Jeremy suggesting his injury during said call, suggesting the receiver may have been removed for staging purposes. Suspicion about Jeremy's father began when his call came through. Instead of responding immediately, did not rush towards the area immediately? In reality, however, it was his own father. His family was involved, so the jury retired to discuss its verdict based on facts and speculations they knew to be accurate. Prior to that, Judge outlined three main concerns to jurors for them to determine who was more reliable, Julie Mugford or Jeremy Bamber. An important issue was whether they could establish that Sheila wasn't responsible for the murder. According to Judge, it came down to whether the second fatal shot fired at Sheila was fired, with silencers attached or not. If this was indeed the case, then this effectively eliminated any possibility that she was responsible. Was Neville Bamber in contact with his son Jason towards nightfall or not? Without such communication from Neville to Jason at that time would have disproved Jason's account of events and made them indecipherable to most outsiders. On October 28th, after over nine hours of deliberation by a jury of 11 jurors and two alternates, Jason Bamber was found guilty by a majority vote of 10 to 2, which met the minimum required to convict. Bamber received five lifetime prison terms without parole. Home Secretary Douglas Hurd determined in 1988 that Bamber did not qualify for release. This ruling remains contentious, as there has been no direct evidence suggesting his guilt. Bamber remains imprisoned to serve out his sentence. There may have been an error in the justice system, and that his sister Shayla could be responsible. Bamber claims he is innocent by filing appeals, and his attorney alleges the verdict was biased due to Jeremy's aggressive conduct during courtroom proceedings. Jeremy Bamber claims there is no proof of his guilt, and there remain numerous unanswered questions regarding the trial, such as testing Sheila's hands without conducting tests on them, and there being a police mishap at the site. Additionally, there may be reprisal against his ex-partner if found out. Trial for Bamber began in 1991. Unfortunately, in 1996, an officer of the police destroyed much of his evidence, something his legal defense team considered an act of disgraceful misconduct. In 1997, 
A DNA test revealed the presence of Shayla's Blood and June's silencer. However, its results were complex and unclear. Gun experts from both the US and UK suggested in 2012 that marks to bodies weren't consistent with using silencers. Since 2015, Jeremy Bamber filed an appeal asking that all evidence be given over to his defense disguised as attorney, for which he was sentenced to an additional 14-year prison time for fraud. To prove his innocence, Bamber established websites dedicated to his case while offering a substantial reward for any evidence which might reverse it. The Bamber family's case continues to attract public attention and raise doubts about the correctness of the verdict. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The Rachel O'Reilly case is one of Ireland's most violent crimes. When a person disappears without a trace or dies in mysterious circumstances, usually the other half becomes one of the main suspects. Unfortunately, in about 80% of cases, suspicions are justified. In such crimes, there is usually not even a clear motive and the crime itself has been defined as domestic, as if it were something ordinary. In the early 2000s, the high-profile case of Rachel O'Reilly literally shocked the whole of Ireland with its unprecedented cruelty and cold-bloodedness. A young woman and mother of two young children were brutally murdered in her own home. Police officers who arrived on the scene admitted that they had never encountered such a horrific crime scene in their practice. To solve this mystery and put all the pieces of the puzzle together, investigators spent several years on painstaking work. During all this time, the criminal remained at large and was sure that his guilt would never be proven. Perhaps it would have remained that way, but the killer was let down by his own vanity. Now, let's take the whole story from the beginning. Who is Rachel O'Reilly? Rachel O'Reilly, who was named Callie, was born in 1974 on the northern outskirts of County Dublin, Ireland. Her biological parents, a girl and boy, did not know at an early age that she was adopted by spouses Rose and Jim Cayley. She was brought up with four other adopted children of the couple, since Rose and Jim could not have children of their own. They gave all their parental love without a trace of favoritism. From a young age, Rachel was an active and purposeful child. She excelled in school, played sports, helped her parents with household chores, and never caused any problems. The girl grew up to be sociable, open and incredibly kind. She easily got along with everyone and avoided conflicts. As a teenager, Rachel was seriously engaged in softball, constantly participating in various competitions and even setting several local records. She also had a very strong bond with her foster mother, to whom she confided all her secrets, and with whom she maintained constant communication even after she got married and had children of her own. After graduating from high school, Rachel enrolled in one of the local universities to pursue a degree in marketing. At the same time, she got a job as a salesperson in a city department store, and in her spare time, she continued to play sports representing the locale team. Who is Joe O'Reilly? Joe O'Reilly became widely known for his inhumane treatment of his spouse and mother of his two children, yet little information exists on who he was as a young person. Joe O'Reilly hails from County Dublin, where he was born into an impoverished family in 1972. Raised alongside his elder sister, both children were taught that hard work should lead to success and were taught not to expect special privileges from their parents. Joe was an athletic young man with a deep appreciation of softball. Following graduation, he decided to study advertising via correspondence course. To support himself financially, he secured employment at a department store where Rachel would eventually begin working, a few months later, as manager. At their first encounter, Joe was 19, while Rachel was only 17. Joe noticed Rachel immediately as soon as he heard she was working at his company and introduced himself, being charmed by her diminutive stature and beautiful blonde locks, making a lasting impression upon him. But when Joe asked Rachel out, she emphatically refused. This left Joe baffled. Undeterred, Joe persisted with his pursuit of Rachel by offering compliments and small surprises such as flowers or chocolates at her workplace. Joe's persistence became amusing to the store's staff, but he did not abandon this pursuit of Rachel. 
To engage her more fully, he even read one of her favorite books, so as to provide common ground for conversation. Joe took notice when Rachel became interested in softball and joined her at the stadium and practices, eventually playing alongside her to lead their team to victory. This impressed Rachel so much, she agreed to go on a date with him. Joe quickly took advantage of their rapid development to demonstrate his love for Rachel. To impress her even further, he surprised her by inviting her on an unforgettable trip to Paris, where he proposed on top of the Eiffel Tower, and she accepted his proposal with joy, believing she had found her Prince Charming from fairy tale. Together, they looked forward to an eternally blissful future together. Few years later, Rachel and Angus married and welcomed two sons. Following Rachel giving birth to her eldest son, Rachel became a dedicated housewife caring for both herself and the children. Two years later, they welcomed another son. Joe became the primary breadwinner for his family by working at an advertising agency specializing in outdoor advertising. People who knew Joe personally recalled him as being confident, purposeful, charming, punctual and willing to put in extra hours as needed at work. Joe led an active lifestyle, often hitting up the gym before starting work each morning. His home even contained exercise machines and dumbbells for him to use before beginning his day. As their sons grew older, Rachel decided to become a distributor for a well-known cosmetics company and sell household goods in order to increase the family income. Her new job enabled her to interact with more of their neighbors who praised her as an amazing and caring mother. However, Joe became less present at home. He would come home only for sleep, showering, and clothing changes. His heavy workload and anticipation of an upcoming promotion kept him away. Rachel did her best to support Joe. However, gradually they drifted apart and their family relations began deteriorating significantly. A distressful event took place in 2004 when someone sent an anonymous letter alleging Rachel of mistreating her two sons aged four and two, both at that time ages four and two respectively. A special commission visited their home to investigate and found no evidence to corroborate these allegations against Rachel despite testimony from family, neighbors, and relatives about how loving and attentive Rachel is as a mother. Despite this initial letter casting doubt upon her reputation, what happened to Rachel O'Reilly? On Monday morning, October 4, 2004, Joe O'Reilly left home early, while his wife and children slept peacefully. As the day progressed, Joe attempted to contact his wife through texts, phone calls, voicemail messages, voicemail and home phone only to be met by an answering machine, finally leaving an increasingly concerned voicemail, urging his wife to contact him immediately. On Tuesday afternoon, Joe received a phone call from their kindergarten teacher informing him that Rachel had failed to pick up their children as expected, something which had never happened before. Concerned, Joe immediately called Rose, who lived nearby, to see if she knew where Rachel might be located. Since Rose didn't, Joe asked Rose to go check on them, while he himself headed back out quickly to collect his own kids from kindergarten. Rose arrived at her daughter's house and immediately noticed Rachel's car parked in the yard, indicating her presence. However, the house was unusually quiet and dark, and no one answered Rose's calls. Rose noticed firstly the chaotic state of the home resembling an attempted burglary scene, where cabinets and drawers had been opened up with contents scattered about, though no sign of Rachel. Rose was shocked at what she found when she entered Rachel's bedroom. The sight of Rachel lying amidst a pool of her own blood was enough to send shockwaves through her. Blood covered walls, furniture, and ceiling, as her skull could be seen through bloody locks tangled with blood. Rose quickly ran toward Rachel, hoping she was still alive, but when she touched Rachel's arm, it was cold and stiff. Rachel was already dead beyond any help being offered to her. Rose was so overcome with grief that she started screaming out for help and calling out to neighbors, including a doctor, that they all ran over to assist. Unfortunately, when they arrived, they discovered Rachel could no longer be saved. The doctor examined Rachel's body first before telling Rose they couldn't save her. As Joe arrived at his wife's home, a crowd had already amassed. On hearing of her death, Joe immediately became distraught, refusing to believe what had occurred. Once in their bedroom near their body, Joe became inconsolable with emotions, 
ranging from tears and sobbing to vows to seek revenge against those responsible. Police officers arriving on the scene reported never witnessing such a brutal and senseless murder of an unarmed woman before. It was evident that Rachel was brutally beaten with an iron weapon with unimaginable force until nothing of her body remained, seemingly attacked from behind since there were no visible signs of resistance from Rachel herself. While initial indications pointed to a possible robbery, investigators soon became convinced there may have been personal motives or long-held animosity at play behind this attack on a petite young mother of two children. Who could possibly harm such an innocent woman so violently? Detectives promptly began interviewing family and neighbors of Rachel. All reported confidently that there were no known enemies or bad influences among her acquaintances. Indeed, all reported nothing out of the ordinary had occurred that day, such as strange cars or unfamiliar individuals near Rachel's residence. Joe claimed he spent most of the day working at a bus depot on the opposite side of town for work, which was corroborated by one of his co-workers. Although this seemed credible to the police, they could not shake their lingering suspicions that something wasn't adding up, although initially appearing like a robbery with stolen items not fitting typical motives. Notably, your 1,000 left sitting unguarded near jewelry box left mostly intact with only few missing pieces. In addition to Rachel's camera, silverware, and one of Joe's dumbbells reported missing as well. A bag containing stolen items such as the camera, silverware, and jewelry was later found two miles away in a bush. All these items matched those on Joe's list of missing ones. This undermined Joe's theory of robbery leading him to classify this crime as premeditated murder instead, suspicious widower. Though Joe tried his hardest to show grief and pain, his efforts came across as fake. As such, he immediately became the primary suspect, since he could offer no proof yet of any crime having taken place involving himself or his former wife. Detectives needed to check his alibi carefully, study the scene of the crime closely, and get an understanding of their relationship before concluding their investigation. Joe said he visited his gym daily before work, which was verified by surveillance cameras both inside and outside the facility. From there, he drove directly to his office before traveling onward to a bus station outside the city to inspect advertisements being placed on vehicles, something his colleague confirmed as well. Investigators visited Joe's workplace and took possession of his computer for examination. Here was where things became most interesting. There were strange correspondences on it, which Joe had partially deleted himself. Yet specialists managed to recover these messages, leading the police to become convinced they were heading down the correct path. Joe would often write to his friend and sister and express his dislike of his wife through insults and profanity in these correspondences. Joe noted how she no longer attracted him as a woman and caused him discomfort. Furthermore, the computer revealed another curious correspondence between Joe and one of his colleagues, Nikki Pell. Their conversations proved that their friendship went deeper than meets the eye. Hence, it was imperative for both to be investigated further. Who exactly was Nikki Pell? Nikki also worked at an advertising firm, and, despite their age difference of 10 years, she and Joe were having an affair. Although it could not be pinpointed exactly when this workplace romance began, Joe would frequently spend evenings and even nights at her place, using work as an excuse for his visitation. What made things suspicious for Joe is when he promised Nikki they would soon be together with his sons as well, including Rachel's sons he mentioned often enough in messages sent between them. Such messages prompted concern since, should their marriage dissolve, the boys would likely remain living with their mother. After initially denying any extramarital affairs on his part, Joe eventually admitted his infidelity when confronted with irrefutable evidence and stated that their relationship had ended over a week prior. At first, Joe O'Reilly's home remained cordoned off as a crime scene. No one was permitted inside. Joe spent this period staying with his sister, while his sons went with their grandparents for the funeral service and burial. At the funeral itself, however, Joe did not behave like any grieving widower would. In fact, when it came time to say his final farewells to Rachel quickly and coldly, before suggesting the coffin should be closed and buried immediately, 
As soon as they returned home, everything looked just like it did on the day of Rachel's murder, except her absence. Joe asked his in-laws for company, thinking he needed support, but soon started making disturbing claims about how Rachel may have been attacked, walking around his wife's murder room while detailing its contents with pinpoint precision while speculating about how her attacker might have attacked. Joe went as far as suggesting the perpetrator might have gone into the bathroom to wash off blood off their hands before taking their weapon with them before moving back out into her room, an account which included animated gestures from Joe. His parents initially dismissed his actions as attempts to cope with trauma and relieve stress. Rose later acknowledged she could not shake the notion that their son-in-law might have committed crimes in the past and could possibly be the one responsible for killing their daughter. Thirst for fame. After attending his brother's funeral, O'Reilly quickly initiated dialogue with the media, giving interviews regularly. He readily invited reporters into his home for tours of the crime scene and detailing its timeline. During each interview, Joe would address directly any criminal who may have committed an act by encouraging them to surrender voluntarily with police. Three weeks after Rachel's tragic death, her loved ones agreed to participate in filming of a television program dedicated to the crime. Though Rachel's parents were devastated, Joe made himself seem like a star during filming. He actively interacted with makeup artists and seemed curious as to how he would appear on camera, while also eagerly indulging in treats and sipping coffee during breaks. Police who had been closely following Joe decided to follow his movements after the TV shoot had ended and discovered that after returning home, he immediately visited Nikki, whom he had been spending his nights with. Once it became evident that Joe was indeed responsible, their focus shifted toward collecting irrefutable evidence for court. Acquiring evidence was a long, complicated and exasperating process since no murder weapon could ever be located. Still, other evidence began piling up. Nikki and Joe's colleague, who had earlier corroborated his alibi, could face jail time for perjury charges. Therefore, they decided against risking their freedom by giving false testimony against each other. Nikki admitted that she and Joe had not broken up as originally indicated. Rather, they continued their relationship, despite what Rachel thought. When Rachel found out, this caused a heated argument between Rachel and her spouse shortly before tragedy struck. Joe's colleague expressed uncertainty regarding his whereabouts at the time of his wife's murder, but confirmed Joe's alibi when requested, not realizing at that time that Joe might be involved. Joe's computer contained alarming correspondences. These revealed an unsettling pattern. He insulted his wife while making plans with Nikki and their children for an uncertain future suggesting an alliance. This evidence further implicated Joe. Additionally, police also carefully evaluated multiple interviews with Joe, as well as footage from TV programs, wherein he described details only the perpetrator would know of such as crime scene descriptions, with precision, that suggested their guilt in this case. Joe went to the gym as captured by surveillance cameras in the morning. After informing his colleagues about this plan, he then claimed he would be absent due to work in another part of the city and may not be reachable via phone. Instead of going directly to a bus station as claimed, however, Joe instead returned home where he used a dumbbell to attack his wife from behind as she took their children to kindergarten, with no chance for escape or resistance whatsoever from him. Following this brutal murderous assault, Joe admitted cleaning off both himself and weapon afterwards in another bathroom adjacent to their bedroom in order to eliminate bloodstains left from the incident and to wash away blood from both himself and weapon within minutes after. The perpetrator quickly changed clothes, scattered his belongings around the house to simulate a robbery, and left for work. On his journey, he dumped any stolen items or dirty clothing, as well as disposing of his dumbbell, so as to prevent further detection. Joe appeared overexcited and nervous during office meetings, which some colleagues noted. His alibi story seemed convincing enough on that fateful day, but his actions belied it. Joe's careless remarks during interviews and at the crime scene allowed investigators to piece together an accurate account of his killing. From planning his gym visit to disposing of evidence, everything pointed in Joe's direction as the perpetrator. Eventually, it became increasingly clear who it was that was behind this crime spree. 
Joe wasn't apprehended for Rachel's murder until two years after the crime had been committed. This allowed time for evidence collection, with cell phone signals placing Joe at Rachel's family home at the time of Rachel's killing, which were verified through phone billing records. At trial, it became evident that Joe requested his mother write an anonymous message to Child Protective Services alleging Rachel as being bad and abusive mother, hoping this would give him sole custody if their marriage ended in divorce. Unfortunately, social services officials found no proof to back up such allegations made in this anonymous message. Joe showed no remorse while appearing in court. Instead, he smiled widely and engaged with his defense attorneys with gusto seemingly believing he would soon be released from incarceration. However, in July 2007, the court found him guilty and sentenced him to life imprisonment. Attempts by his legal representation to challenge this decision ultimately failed despite complaints and appeals being submitted on his behalf. Notably, Joe O'Reilly kept up his relationship with Nikki even after being sent to prison. She visited him regularly but for reasons unknown, the two eventually stopped communicating in 2022. Joe O'Reilly never admitted guilt while in prison and sought to become an ideal inmate with hopes of one day becoming eligible for parole eligibility. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On November 6, 2014, Mexico City police officers discovered human remains. Part of a torso was discovered in a vacant lot near Mexico City's exit and shortly after found in various parts of Mexico City, along with bags containing arms and legs. Shockingly, these limbs lacked fingers. Police immediately raised the alarm when it became evident that an extremely violent criminal was operating in the region. Patrol teams of officers quickly mobilized, searching every corner for signs of this individual as their primary objective was to find his head and arms so as to prevent future crimes from being perpetrated against innocent bystanders. At first, everyone believed this case to be the work of a brutal serial killer. Though fingers and the head had never been recovered from this site due to professional efforts of forensic experts, it was determined that all remains belonged to one individual. Yet without fingers and teeth, it was impossible to ascertain who this individual was. Alejandra La Fuente was an attractive brunette living in Mexico City who boasted searing brunette hair, bright brown eyes with thick black lashes, an athletic body built for fitness through yoga and breathing exercises, and frequented beauty salons to receive massages or spa treatments. During warm months, she would lounge on the beach, and on cloudy days, she visited tanning salons. Generally, she thought very highly of herself and was considered an icon of female attractiveness. Alejandra did not lag behind in her career either. Her father is Alberto Dente, an esteemed psychiatrist, renowned for his treatment of such deviating mental conditions as schizophrenia and manic disorder, known both for scientific research as well as experiments conducted with patients. Alejandra found inspiration in him and set about following in his footsteps, enrolling at one of the best universities for psychiatry where she graduated with honors after years of perseverance, resourcefulness, and extraordinary intelligence, combined with connections from her father, helped her write and defend her thesis about manic syndrome, syndrome, syndrome. Alejandra eventually decided not to pursue psychiatry, but was instead attracted by psychotherapy work, becoming licensed and opening her practice in a new business center at the heart of the capital with help from her father's money. Alejandra soon had clients seeking her services with eating disorders, depression, relationship difficulties, and low self-esteem, seeking counseling sessions, helping family issues along the way while leaving much unfinished. Alejandra had two charming daughters from her first marriage, both having the eyes and sense of humor of Alejandra herself and of their father, respectively. But Alejandra wasn't disheartened. Two children weren't enough reason for her to give up. She still dreamt of finding someone special who could also provide for their daughters as father figures. Once Alejandra had divorced her former partner, the ex-husband, who will remain anonymous, returned home as is often done after separation to spend time with their three young daughters and assist with household duties if needed. Unfortunately for him, this visit would turn out to be his final one. 
Alejandra asked him to enter through the backyard because the front door lock had jammed, reasoning that her youngest daughter was currently bathing, and requested him come into her bathroom. Surprising himself by following this instruction without question or hesitation, so the man went in. Eruptions were heard throughout the house. No sounds could be heard. Cartoons or children laughing weren't playing either. A man entered the bathroom to discover tape on the floor and no daughter in her tub, an indication that something had gone amiss. At that instant, his ex-wife stood behind him with a hammer and struck with all her strength, striking first to his head, then to another part. The man fell, blood pouring out through an opening in his skull. Everything around him was stained red in seconds, as experts later revealed. There was little hope for recovery, as death occurred almost instantly after receiving such a heavy blunt object strike. Unwittingly, Alejandra became an eyewitness to this truly horrific scene when she returned early from a friend's house and witnessed both of her parents quarreling. Their children frequently witnessed Alejandra being mentally disturbed, taking out her feelings on others, friends, and even her own husband who often showed scratched arms and neck. Housemates witnessed her frequent tantrums all throughout their home with inadequate behavior from Alejandra as well. Finally, however, things escalated out of control. Daughter ran outside calling out for help before neighbors rushed over and immediately called police squad, where psychologist was arrested, charged with murder charges by police a neighbor who then called law enforcement officers to arrest and charge him with murder charges. At the station, Alejandra was placed into a cell where she would remain until her first hearing in court. Alejandra denied any guilt. Lawyers provided her with an argument of self-defense based on an ex-husband who was jealous of Alejandra and claimed she brought men into their home which could negatively impact young girls. On the day of the crime, he arrived unannounced at his former wife's house through the back door, hoping to catch his ex with another man. Instead, he attacked Alejandra, who was trying to put together her nightstand. This forced Alejandra to use self-defense, striking two blows against his back, which then returned into his head, causing two blows from self-defense against him as her defense. On June 14, 2012, Alejandra's sentence was handed down, taking into consideration all evidence presented by her defense and two minor children present. Due to coordinated work between lawyers and her father's funds, it was changed into a suspended one. Months later, another appeal was filed, citing assault and self-defense as an argument. Human rights activists requested jury trial as they felt sorry for Alejandra, who presented herself at trial as victim of domestic abuse. Ultimately, the court reviewed and granted an acquittal decision. After being released from prison, Alejandra continued to provide psychological counseling services as before. She created an image of herself as a victim of gender inequality who struggled to uphold her rights, like most women across North America, before finally winning them over and becoming more popular with potential clients. This created image further cemented Alejandra's popularity among potential customers. Maria Alejandra quickly met Alan Carrera a large Mexican businessman and son of Adrian Carrera Francis. Alan was tall, handsome, and statuesque. His father had previously served as head of special services for the Central District and had seen great success during his career. Soon, Alan expanded his business and opened construction stores throughout the country. While some aspects were legitimate, other parts were closely associated with crime. Alan was dismissed from his position when one of his financial scams was discovered, as well as for having been part of a criminal organization involved in transporting psychotropic substances from Europe into America. Their base was located near a border town and protected by corrupt police officers. This group controlled some portion of psychoactive substance trafficking in South. Alan Carrera's father, Adrian, was found to be involved in his affairs, and police managed to obtain a statement from him. Adrian faced a 20-year prison term due to witness protection program restrictions. Instead, he was released early from custody thanks to witness protection on July 18, 2000, and immediately dedicated himself to raising his son, Alan, while running their legitimate business together. 
Alan quickly took after his father in terms of values and experiences and eventually decided to become an entrepreneur himself, opening an independent chain of household appliance stores that he managed himself until graduation from college when his dad passed on and ran it all from scratch with zero guidance from anyone. This business wasn't as large, but still brought good profits. Alan had been attracted to one classmate since childhood, whom he eventually married as his spouse. She was smart, beautiful, and came from a good family. Their marriage was short, but bright with one beautiful daughter produced as a result. Unfortunately, due to Alan's work schedule and almost total absence at home, eventually caused it to end in divorce, and Alan found it incredibly hard. Parting ways with his love from high school, new relationships did not bring much fulfillment or comfort, leading him down a path toward loneliness and ultimately leading him down that path towards alcoholism. Alan attempted different means to deal with his depression and alcohol dependence, such as attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and therapy. Alan eventually sought advice from Alberto, a world-renowned psychiatrist renowned for helping Maria Alejandra get divorced. During that difficult process, Alan became Maria Alejandra's only source of emotional stability. Though Alan and Maria Alejandra eventually parted ways, Maria Alejandra still felt attached to him, despite their separation and had refused any other man into her life as replacements. Eventually, Alan's ex-wife decided to consult Alberto on her own initiative, as she too decided to see a therapist for herself, as she attempted to cope with her emotions, as she sought therapeutic help herself. Alan was being treated by a psychiatrist, who explained he could not counsel both spouses due to ethical considerations, and recommended Alejandra as his daughter's counselor instead. Alejandra quickly recognized that Alan's ex-husband could be an ideal match, he was described as being pleasant in life with plenty of wealth and offered her client another consultation, believing she could solve their issue quickly in just one session while breaking their bond together. Alejandra set out from the start to seduce an entrepreneur during their steamy session with great success. Alan quickly noticed her attempts and offered the therapist coffee afterwards so they could discuss family problems together. Though initially unwilling, Alan suggested going out on a date that evening. Though initially contrary to medical ethics, their romance quickly progressed. Within weeks of their first date, they agreed to live together, and two more months later, legalized their relationship. Alan had no inkling of any surprises in Alejandra's closet, or of why she had filed for divorce from her former spouse. In April 2014, Alan decided to visit his parents in Florida and spend the weekend together. During this visit, he got the chance to discuss both Alejandra and their wedding plans, which they hadn't heard about until that point. Alan's parents were very surprised as Alejandra hadn't ever come up before in his life before. It was extremely strange. One week after meeting his parents, Alejandra asked her husband not to call any of her friends or relatives, and no invitations were sent out due to budgetary considerations. However, her father actually attended the wedding ceremony. At first glance, life with this couple seemed perfect, but quickly disintegrated into disaster. Alejandra could no longer hide her overwrought nature, and their relationship began to rapidly change. Alan kept most of his personal details to himself, and very few knew what was transpiring between them. Yet it was obvious that their previous bond had been severely tested, no longer seeming quite so happy together. Since meeting Alejandra, Alan began distancing himself from his family. The final straw was when his wedding to Alejandra was held without them, and they didn't invite their parents. After which, Alan even stopped calling his friends anymore and his remaining buddies began to notice that Alejandra seemed anxious, sometimes behaving inappropriately and rapidly losing her temper. After experiencing several incidents like these, Alan became embarrassed and decided to reduce joint family meetings. Quarrels arose on a daily basis for seemingly inexplicable reasons. One evening, Alejandra decided to check her husband's phone and discovered correspondence from other women which contained explicit material. Obviously, this could not go ignored. According to Alejandra, this was the final straw. She claimed in court that her husband beat, insulted, and humiliated her in every possible way, 
His infidelity further confirmed this view. It became evident that this marriage could no longer be saved. And yet, for unknown reasons, Alejandra did not try traditional psychotherapy methods as an attempt at repair. With her thoughts about Alan's infidelity fresh in mind, the young woman decided to use an approach she knew well to deal with him. After making this decision, all her focus shifted toward devising the perfect murder plot, while Alan carried on living life without knowing what was in store for him. Alan still had little contact with his family, yet couldn't miss the annual birthday feast held to honor Alan's late grandfather's birth. Alan attended, but his parents made it clear that Alejandra wasn't welcome in their home, something which further disturbed Alejandra and further soured their relationship. No one could have predicted that Alan would ever leave them alive again. On October 31, 2014, Alan used his phone to send one last text message, informing his family he had reached home safely after attending his birthday party and that his phone had not been used since that day to contact anyone. Since that day, there had been no further contact from Alan and no text messages received or sent from him since October 31, 2014. Alan had not been seen at work in several days, an unusual occurrence given his strong commitment to his work and imminent plans for opening a new store, so his presence was vitally needed. Alejandra devised an ingenious plan to end Alan's life after returning from vacation. She added a powerful sleeping pill to his usual milk before bedtime and then covered him up with a pillow before slowly watching him lose consciousness while desperately trying to remove it and breathe again. Alejandra reveled in seeing his valiant attempts at breaking free, but quickly saw through them and got rid of him instantly. Once that was over, Alejandra faced her most daunting task yet, disposing of Alan's body. In such an unexpected event, without much preparation or foresight, she found herself having no choice but to use whatever means available. Alan being too heavy, she made do with what she had. Time was running short, so Alejandra ran to a neighbor's vegetable garden in search of an electric saw before sawing his body into pieces with grim determination. Only an extreme sadist could do something like this. Packing all body parts away into garbage bags, she also cut off fingers and extracted teeth so investigators could identify who it belonged. Alejandra tried her best to remove the body without raising suspicion, but this plan proved unsuccessful as dawn approached and Alejandra was unable to leave without being noticed by a nearby elderly resident who suffered insomnia and saw Alejandra leave early with the suitcase behaving very strangely, and her husband refusing to assist in lifting its heavy weights. This alarmed her. At dawn's break, Alejandra returned home. To the surprise of vigilant neighbors, this surprised Alejandra even more, as it would later emerge that she had scattered bags containing her ex-husband's remains throughout different neighborhoods to conceal her tracks and continue with life as usual. Once day broke, however, she resumed normal living. On November 6, 2014, Mexican police officers made an awful discovery, an anatomically correct torso without teeth and fingers on its hand. Their entire force was on alert due to this horrific event, but less than 24 hours later body parts began turning up in various parts of the city. Their distance apart could later be linked back to Alejandra's long absence from home. All the body parts were taken to an expert forensic lab, where experts quickly established that all of them belonged to one individual. To deflect suspicion away from herself, the perpetrator began writing messages to Alan's relatives in an effort to disprove suspicion. But she only made things worse, as she didn't even realize that Alan had recently disassociated himself from family ties and had no further contact with his relatives. Alejandra informed Alan's parents on his behalf that she and Alan would be traveling and out of contact for some time. However, Alberto, Alejandra's father, began making calls to Alan's father's home to ensure his son-in-law knew where his daughter-in-law was located. Since he hadn't heard from Alejandra in a while, and the patients were extremely worried that they wouldn't be attending counseling sessions as scheduled, he wanted assurance if this plan worked or not. Later, Alan's relatives received another phony call informing them that Alan's daughter had been found and needed to be forcibly admitted into a clinic as she was suffering from depression due to Alan's infidelity. 
This caused great alarm among his relatives. All attempts at finding him failed, so the businessman's family turned to police for assistance. Laboratory experts decided to compare Allen's characteristics with those found recently, and the similarities were undeniable. All his family and relatives identified him. It was especially difficult for Allen's grandfather, as soon after being told, he became sick with heart disease from grieving over losing one grandson out of three grandchildren he cared about so deeply. Following this confirmation from investigators, search warrants were issued for both his home and office address. After digging, fingers and teeth of a deceased individual were discovered, sending shockwaves through the capital city. Alejandra was quickly arrested. Blood was also detected in one room, as well as on her trunk car and in her garage. Alejandra initially attempted to deny her guilt, hoping to get away with it without being caught as she had with her previous husband. But the investigation quickly narrowed it down. An elderly witness provided testimony correlating her time of death with that estimated by Alejandra herself. Alejandra used her position with Alan to procure powerful sleeping pills only doctors could obtain, which further implicated her in Alan's death. Evidence obtained was critical in connecting Alejandra with the brutal murder of her husband, as CCTV cameras provided proof that the man entered their house but never left again. Suitcases had also been removed, as confirmed by footage. On December 10, 2014, the jury reached its verdict. Alejandra was sentenced to life imprisonment for murder with brutality, an attempt at concealing it with official position abuse and using her official position for personal gain. Her father tried his hardest through connections and bribes to help keep his daughter free. Unfortunately, he failed. Although keeping the trial closed from public view helped, his career suffered greatly. Few would turn to someone who raised such an uncontrollable monster, nor quickly identified issues within their family, such as Alejandra's. At trial, Alejandra's first husband's death also came up. Although due to its length of time, there was no evidence in this instance. There were speculations as to Alejandra's father being involved. There were suspicions he may have conspired with his daughter in crimes committed for scientific interest. But none was ever found as proof against this hypothesis. After numerous appeals from victims, the sentence was commuted to death, an unprecedented event since such sentences are extremely rare in Mexico these days. Furthermore, neither defendant was eligible for a review of his case meaning his house and all property, should go to family of the victim. Though this provided little comfort, since their loved one could never return from death. Alejandra was an apparent pragmatic and cruel woman with severe mental health issues. Medical examinations denied this claim. She was heavily influenced by her father and used her official position to carry out her evil plans. Following her first crime, impunity only emboldened Alejandra further. Perhaps Alan would still be alive today had she not managed to escape justice so easily the first time around. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Becoming engaged can be thrilling, yet Tina Thomas felt even more anxious than Gabe Watson when discussing the idea with their parents. Both were 26 at the time and this would be Tina's third serious relationship and second attempt at wedding plans. Tina McCulloch's first attempt at family formation failed. Their relationship was fine. Only her mother objected. Scott wasn't someone Tina was fond of either. There weren't any specific claims against him, but rather just general dissatisfaction with life, as it existed at that moment for Tina. As such, the couple soon parted ways as their illusionary future faded. Tina had tried dating Stan Marks again, without parental involvement, and they couldn't overcome their first three-year crisis, parting amicably by mutual agreement. Finally, on Christmas Eve, at a party of friends, she met Gabe Watson. Although we cannot say love at first sight occurred instantly, instead it developed more as mutual support after both recently experienced breakups. While not the ideal starting point, two years later, Gabe proposed marriage. Tina accepted but needed parental permission first. 
Gabe decided, like any good prince would do, to try to charm Tina's parents on Valentine's Day. But due to him being away on that date, the dinner was postponed until February 15th instead. At dinner, when Watson announced his decision to marry Tina forever, Gabe stammered like a schoolboy but did not answer. His father of the bride asked another question which seemed simple at first. Does he love Tina? However, Gabe never answered directly or even made eye contact with his own groomsmen before leaving without speaking further with Gabe about the issue. His father took this reaction as an awkwardness common among strangers and asked his daughter the same question. To his amazement, Tina also did not directly answer this query, but began speaking by declaring she feared being alone at 26. Taking time to consider, his father blessed them both. Preparing for a wedding takes considerable time and effort, yet while Tina was focused on her outfit, guests, and overall wedding arrangements, Gabe was solely focused on planning their honeymoon. His plan included traveling to Australia's Great Barrier Reef in the Pacific Ocean near Australia for diving sessions to view sunken ship the Townsville Titanic, which had sunk in 1911, something Gabe enjoyed doing, but Tina didn't enjoy doing. Gabe would sometimes take Tina scuba diving in calm water pools with lifeguard supervision, but no further. Gabe himself was an experienced scuba diver. He had completed over 50 dives before enrolling in his rescue diving course. Not necessarily all underwater, mind you. If you don't learn to dive by our honeymoon, let me be clear. You will stay home, walking the dog or pruning rosies in the garden, not going anywhere with me, warned Gabe. Tina had no other choice. Gaby took out a loan in order to purchase Atina her equipment and pay for her classes with her first instructor, who had been disappointed in Tina's abilities. Even warning Gabe that his fiancée did not possess sufficient abilities for open ocean swimming. Gabe became increasingly annoyed with the diving instructor, accusing him of failing to explain and refusing to continue class. Tina received credit quickly from a second instructor but this only served to emphasize how everything she does from under the stick is solely meant to please Gabe as her future husband. On October 11th, Tina and Gabe finally tied the knot, spending $10,000 from their wedding gift of travel to Australia within two days after. Gabe dedicated part of his trip specifically for Tina. Together, they visited Sydney Aquarium and Zoo before traveling onward to Townsville, where on October 21st morning they boarded a boat to one of Earth's most breathtaking places, every diver's dream. Employees at the diving company quickly reveal that upon closer examination, neither Gabe nor his partner seemed like experienced divers. Even after graduating from diving courses and having years of experience under his belt, Gabe could barely comprehend any aspect of equipment as though it were all new to him. But, nonetheless, Tina relied on him for help passing the exam prior to diving, despite its being conducted independently. When offered his help underwater, Tina declined. Diving logs also recorded that there was a strong current on that particular day. Its significance should not be missed or minimized. Gabe helped his wife sort through equipment they'd purchased back home, before heading out to rent tanks for diving trips they were making together. Gabe took an 11L tank for himself and gifted Tina an 8 and 1 2 L1, which for this location would have been too small or even dangerous given her inexperience. Without these tanks, it would not have been possible for Tina to descend to the Townsville Titanic from its first try. Tina requested additional cargo since she could not dive to depth, while Gabe initially was having issues using an underwater computer that calculates and displays dive ascent speeds, as well as oxygen content of tanks. Once back at their boat, however, Gabe's computer worked, and they tried again at 49F Deep Wreck, where Tina submerged first while Gabe followed behind her swimming behind them both. Gabe said everything started off fine. At some point, Tina stopped, began waving at me, and signaled she wanted to head upwards. I quickly recognized this was just her panicking, something she used to do often. At this point, we had already reached half our ascent, Therefore, I decided to attempt to calm her and remain at the same depth for a time so she could adjust psychologically to pressure changes. She continued breathing deeply, which was dangerous. It was at that moment I noticed she was sinking. I attempted to grab Tina's belt to hold her down, but she swung her arm so hard it knocked my mask off my face, and I struggled to put it back on. 
quickly realizing Tina was already too far away for me to catch her again. For a while, I attempted swimming after her, but without success. After Gab told me of Gab's statement about my death at depth, I decided to return to the surface in search of help from lifeguards. On my way, I met another swimmer with narrow set eyes who did not pay any heed to my signal for assistance. Two Asian men had also been present, but neither confirmed Gab's statements that his body was lying there at depth. Later, when police took underwater computer readings, they confirmed Gabe attempted to swim after his drowning wife briefly, before quickly giving up and ascending as instructed, stopping at each depth level along the way. When interviewed by police, each diver claimed that Gabe could have saved his wife had he done more to try. Gabe had enough oxygen in his tanks to reach the bottom and return back up again before this tragic event occurred. Rescuers aboard the ship quickly responded upon realizing what had occurred and quickly went in search of Tina. Unfortunately, they found her very quickly, but unfortunately too late. Tina lay with eyes open under her mask at an estimated depth of 82 ft. Tina was immediately lifted off the deck and given artificial respiration on board the yacht for approximately 40 minutes. Unfortunately, it proved futile and she ultimately passed away. Gabe stood nearby during this ordeal, but did not approach his wife. According to witnesses, he simply sniffed naively from time to time. Employees from Gabe's company reported that, while on his way to shore, he smiled and even played cards with other passengers en route. Gabe denied this in court, and Tina's post-mortem examination indicated otherwise. Yes, Tina's body showed no obvious signs of violent death. However, there were bruises on her neck, as well as blood in her nostrils, which is common at an 82 ft depth, like where Tina was discovered. Tina had no traces of alcohol in her bloodstream, but high levels of medications like ibuprofen and paracetamol used for seasickness treatment, including small amounts, in her lungs that suggested fluid retention. According to reports, Tina is believed to have drowned due to oxygen deprivation before actually drowning. Tina's gear was examined by Australian Water Police, but no malfunctions were noted. At first, this could have been taken as an accident. An inexperienced diver ignored safety regulations and paid with their life, but suspicious elements persisted, such as rather vague autopsy results and Watson's unusual behavior according to diving team observations. These factors prevented investigators from quickly solving this case, therefore prolonging the investigation considerably. Gabe realized the detectives were investigating him. In addition, Tina's parents did not accept what had occurred as an unfortunate coincidence and wanted their son-in-law dragged before the courts, either as her murderer or at least for having neglected to assist in her escape. At Gabe's first interrogation, police noted he was shocked, crying and laughing frequently while being interrogated, asking to call his father, who complained of severe hearing pain, and beseeching him to inform Gabe's wife's parents of the tragedy. Late that evening, he was released. He went back to the yacht belonging to the company that sent them out and asked for one night's lodging, explaining that their trip had originally been scheduled to last two days, but due to his wife's death, had only lasted 24 hours. Additionally, he asked for half of their dive costs back since he never actually saw any sunken ships during their dive trip. On October 24th, Gabe's mother flew to Townsville to assist him and find legal advice. At his request, they visited the morgue on that same day in order to see his wife one last time before her demise. Because her husband was still being investigated as a suspect, the morgue employee called in the detective assigned to the case. Gabe could have attempted to hide some evidence, but instead only wept and begged his wife's forgiveness while crying incessantly, unaware that police officer Lawrence was standing outside, recording him on tape recorder. At court hearings later on, Detective Lawrence will quote Gabe saying, I didn't mean to hurt you. At the morgue, you told Tina you didn't mean it either. What exactly does that mean? Lawrence will pose his question of Gaby about that statement at length. Gabe repeated the story of his sore ear during his travel home with Tina's body. While in Oakland for their layover, he sought medical assistance on airport grounds and was held there to be evaluated. According to investigation, this action may have been undertaken intentionally in order to avoid meeting Tina's father. 
divers can vouch that this condition is fairly common among divers. At Tina's funeral on November 5th, Gabe took off his wedding ring from Tina and placed it over his own finger, in full view of everyone, immediately giving over earrings that would later come from Tina Thomas' family before never seeing each other again that day. Watson never met again this day either. Gabe will later be asked in court, Did you really remove your wife's jewelry during her funeral? To which he would only smile and shrug in response. I don't think I could have done it. At this point in time, everyone had different opinions of Gabe. Some thought he was kind while others called him an abusive and manipulative partner. All had one thing in common, though. The relationship between Gabe and Tina didn't appear happy, with Tina confiding to her father during family dinner on February 15th that her marriage to Gabe was solely meant as an avoidance tactic so she wouldn't die alone on February 16th. One victim who died shortly before their honeymoon revealed to a friend that her husband forced her to buy life insurance with a higher interest rate in case of his death and put his name as beneficiary in the policy's beneficiary column. Insurance agent was also present and confirmed Tina's testimony. Additionally, Tina cried throughout their journey on board despite not getting any response from her husband who ignored her anguish. Amanda Phillips provided another telling account which shed light on Tina and Mike's true nature as a couple. According to Amanda Phillips, Mike videotaped Tina urinating in the bathroom before editing and including it on their Christmas celebration videotape. That would have been fine, but he decided to perform at an open viewing with multiple guests present. He laughed like a horse while we all tried explaining to him it was inappropriate behavior. While I clutched crosses onto my fingers so Tina wouldn't think she wanted to marry him, while removing jewelry right during a funeral may seem like a frightening and denunciatory act on Gab's part. During the trial in 2008, the jury was shown an extremely disturbing footage of Watson visiting Tina's grave, taking all the flowers from it and carrying them away. They were later found in a nearby trash can. Tina's father noticed the missing flowers and, to find out the thief, he set up a hidden camera in the next row among the monuments. But he never expected to see Gaby on the tape and was outraged by such an act. In court, Gabe's defense was that he and his wife had discussed the death of one of their own on an extreme honeymoon, and the lack of flowers on the grave was her request, which sounded very strange and unlikely. There's no telling how long the search for evidence would have dragged on if the cops had put on the exact same gear the newlyweds had and hadn't tried to stage that incident. Gabe said Tina drowned while he was trying to put a mask on her face. It turned out it was impossible to put the mask on underwater by yourself unless you used another source of air, in this case Tina's oxygen. In late November 2008, the Australian police arrested Gabe, and on June 5, 2009, Gab's trial began, where he pleaded guilty, but only to failing to save his wife. So, he was charged with negligent homicide and sent to prison for 18 months. After completing his sentence, Gabe returned home to the U.S., but a year later, the now U.S. court charged him with first-degree murder, the motive for which was to receive insurance payments after the death of his wife. Gab's lawyer tried to defend his client, shifting all the blame on the diving company, claiming that the employees of this company did not take care of the safety of tourists and now, afraid of losing their license and therefore the whole business, are trying to shift the blame onto the unhappy husband who has already served his time in another country. As for the money received from the insurance company, the payout amounted to $33,000, while Gabe spent much more money on lawyers and additional expertise. Nevertheless, the prosecution continued to insist that this spending was only because the husband could not assume that he would not be believed. The prosecutor also refused to accept the fact that Gabe, with a degree in drowning rescue in hand, could not even save his wife. When Gabe had his say, he addressed the jury. It's been seven years since the tragedy, and there hasn't been a day that I haven't thought about that terrible day. The public has pounced on me, blaming me for my wife's death, calling me a murderer. There wasn't a single person who looked me in the eye and said, Yes, I understand how bad you feel, but it's not your fault. On the contrary, everyone just wants me dead, 
and here I can only understand my late wife's parents. Yes, they will never forgive me. No matter how much I kneel before them, and no matter how much I beg their forgiveness, you often hear the phrase, I can't imagine what it's like to lose a child, but I've never heard anyone say, I can't imagine what it's like to lose a wife, especially on a honeymoon. If I can be accused of anything, it's that I didn't make enough effort to save Tina, but I've already received my punishment for that. Perhaps you all would have been satisfied if I had drowned with my wife then seven years ago, but I was afraid to die, afraid I wouldn't be able to rise from the bottom to the top. I just wanted to live, as I still want to live now. No evidence of Gab's guilt was presented to the court. The jury found Gabe not guilty. What do you guys think? Is Gabe guilty of Tina's death? Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In 2012, Marcos Matsunaga's family became one of the focal points of attention in Brazil. Marcos disappeared hours before signing a billion-dollar deal that sent shockwaves through the nation. Photos showing his distraught widow made headlines across multiple national publications. Police initially assumed the culprit was one of his competitors, who wanted to use kidnap and murder in order to stop an impending deal. However, the truth turned out much darker and crueler. A cold-bloated murder and subsequent attempts at covering it up provided material for several documentaries about this terrible event. Marcos Matsunaga was one of Brazil's wealthiest individuals and managed a family business known as Yoki, founded by his grandfather Yoshizo Katano, and taking its name from its initial letters, taken from both of his names, surname first. Yoki began as a small flour milling operation that endured turbulent economic and war conditions and ultimately transformed into an international enterprise known for producing various food products with global recognition and an impressive product lineup. It all began mid-century. Marcos was fortunate enough to be born into a wealthy family and was never denied anything from an early age. Instead of starting over with business development on his own, everything his grandfather and father had created had already been handed down. Being CEO of their food company gave Marcos every chance at becoming their first billionaire, something which he strived for nearly his entire conscious life. But Marcos's ambitious plans were doomed to fail. Everyone who knew him praised his business acumen. Not only had he saved family capital, but had multiplied it several times, increasing profits as a result. Yet Marcos wasn't always easy on himself or others around him, capricious and arrogant with an overbearing personality who desired control over everyone who came near him, this businessman was far from handsome in appearance. At an early age, this boy struggled with childhood overweight, vision problems for which he wore glasses, short stature, and somewhat clumsy traits. All this presented many difficulties when communicating with peers. Consequently, he had almost no friends, as female representatives from female sex shunned him for his unusual and peculiar appearance. Marcos struggled for years to build lasting and serious relationships, which went beyond a handful of dates. Even his multi-million dollar inheritance could not make him seem appealing or desirable as an eligible bachelor. Marcos often turned women off due to his arrogance and egotism, prompting them to hire professional escorts as Marcos rarely mentioned his first wife in public sources. Unfortunately, few details exist on her existence or who exactly was her husband's first choice as his muse. As far as is known, his marriage wasn't founded in love or passion, but rather desperation and due to pressure from relatives. Still, this union lasted several years, though both spouses began regretting their decision shortly thereafter. Initial attempts by Marcos's wife to accommodate his complex personality failed miserably with little progress. Over time, they only increasingly distanced from one another. Furthermore, he frequently and openly cheated on her without trying to hide or justify his behavior, finding mistresses mostly through websites offering intimacy services in exchange for money. Alice was one of those girls. She worked as an escort, and her portfolio could be found online. 
It was there that a businessman noticed an attractive, bright blonde with an alluring figure. He began regularly inviting her on dates, generously paying for them. Alice was six years younger than him and came from an extremely poor and dysfunctional family, growing up among alcoholics who shared their addiction with men she didn't know his father, not knowing who their own father was either. Also at such an early age, Alice was subjected to beatings by roommates of her mother, as well as being bullied and bullied by these roommates of mothers. Alice had just barely finished school when she uprooted herself from home and moved permanently away from the neighborhood she'd grown up in. Taking nursing courses and eventually working at a hospice, Alice quickly realized her dreams were far exceeded by caring for dying patients. Furthermore, becoming attached to each patient she cared for made each death seem personal to her. Over time, Alice decided to obtain higher education and change careers entirely, eventually choosing law as an occupation which promised many opportunities in life. Alice had spent months preparing to enroll at university and managed to score the required number of points on her entrance exams, yet couldn't afford her studies from her modest nurse salary alone. Since she'd abandoned all ties with relatives after moving away, young and attractive, Alice decided to use external data, such as her external profile data, in order to generate income by signing up with an escort site, which assisted in creating her personal page and soon wealthy men began showing an interest in the young blonde beauty. Alice found escorting and intimate services a source of income that enabled her to pay for her studies and fully support herself, but planned on moving on to something more suitable once she earned her diploma and secured employment in her specialty field. At that time, Alice met Marcos, one of her regular customers who generously gave gifts while meeting regularly without hiding from anyone. Although Alice knew Marcos was married, at that point in time she couldn't have dreamt he'd leave his wife for her. Alice Matsunaga was like the heroine of a fairy tale, an impoverished girl from an unstable home, working as an escort service provider, meets Marcos, an eccentric multimillionaire who falls madly in love with her almost instantly. Marcos may or may not have made efforts on Alice's part to seduce Marcos. Either way, after six months, he realized he wanted more than just dating and filed for divorce while proclaiming Alice his fiancée instead of continuing their relationship. Due to his desire for privacy, Marcos didn't want anyone else knowing the details about how and when he met Alice. Therefore, the couple made up an ordinary story of an accidental meeting in a cafe and stuck to this version. Even close family and few friends didn't suspect anything. However, Alice in the Matsunaga family received less than warm reception. His parents suspected she used all her charm in order to seduce Marcos. Now that their child had married a rich but ugly person and fallen in love, Alice had used all her abilities against him and would come out later with his parents believing she used all her charm on him. Alice received not very warm reception as his parents had already fallen under a spell and now betrayed him by falling for him and now was involved with him despite everything she put out to do with his parents wondering who had duped him into falling for rich but ugly Marcos, who was now living under his spell, to seduce Marcos. After all, she would likely become his wife after she had met her. But Alice got an unwelcoming reception in Matsunaga family, where parents believed she had used all her charm to charm to fall for rich but ugly Marcos, while now had done nothing but run away with him and now taken back her place. Marcos went out of his way to pretend she didn't notice his harsh character. Nevertheless, when he announced his plans to divorce his first wife and marry Alice instead, no one voiced any objections strongly enough for this proposal. Businessman Marcos Matsunaga had planned an extravagant traditional wedding, complete with white dress, large guest list, and tiered cake as per tradition. Following their marriage, he moved his wife into his lavish mansion where she became his full-fledged mistress. Long known for collecting expensive wines and rare weapons, he amassed an extensive wine cellar, where bottles were carefully organized by year and country, while for weapons there was an entire room displaying firearms and edged weapons, much to Marco's pride, he kept adding new additions over time, which were replenished. Marcos took great pleasure in replenishing his collections by continuing to add new additions from time to time. His house was overflowing with antiques, luxury goods, 
and modern art that tastelessly decorated every surface in his house. After their wedding, they decided that they wanted an heir. But despite their best efforts, Alice struggled for months without becoming pregnant naturally. After exhausting all other means, the couple turned to in vitro fertilization, but even here success did not arrive immediately. As soon as their daughter was born, happiness seemingly flourished beyond all expectation for this couple. Young parents were enthusiastic to educate and raise their daughter with love, care, and luxury, truly creating an ideal childhood for her. Plans were made for future adventures when she began walking. Soon thereafter, they began traveling the globe together to experience different cultures and traditions firsthand. Their little princess truly became part of their hearts as she enjoyed every bit of lavish upbringing possible. But the couple shared one particular hobby, hunting large animals. Though strictly speaking, this was Marcos's passion. Many women disliked or were put off by it, and many did not embrace his pastime. Eventually, Marcos stopped trying and gave up. Alice took up hunting to gain favor with Marcos and ultimately win his heart. Initially, by learning how to handle various firearms at shooting ranges, and then in the woods, hunting wild animals together. Alice had no qualms about taking animal lives, as she treated it as a kind of competition. Either you do it, or you don't. Marcos enjoyed this approach, and would watch Alice handle weapons and hunt her prey with relish. Together they taught Alice to skin and carve wild boars, deer and other forest creatures together, using large knives, special cleavers, and axes. Skin them separately using large knives, while using special cleavers, axes, and large knives to separate body parts using large knives as well as special cleavers axes. Also, rather than cats or dogs for pets, they owned poisonous snakes, which had special terrariums created specifically to replicate conditions, as close as possible to natural conditions, fulfilling another long-standing dream of Marcos, who adored snakes, but his first wife disapproved of having one as pets, despite wanting one. But then, Alice had done wonders to keep Marcos at ease by sharing in his unusual hobbies. In 2012, Matsunaga was prepping to make what would likely become his signature deal and make him a billionaire, selling off family company and using proceeds of sale to invest into another profitable enterprise. At this time, he rarely appeared, being consumed by work and grandiose plans, moving with wife into an opulent apartment complex close to main office of company where his work resided. Marco seemed to be away almost all of the time, while his young wife remained lonely in a luxurious apartment with panoramic city views. Marcos's work schedule was packed full of meetings, business appointments, and consultations with specialists. So much so that often he did not even spend the night at home, promising his wife that as soon as the deal was signed and sealed, their lives would change and transform completely. On May 19, 2012, on the eve of a multi-billion dollar deal, Marcos vanished without trace. Alice only reported it the next day, due to believing he was at work. According to Alice's account of Marcos's schedule for that evening meeting, that could last into the night and early morning, meeting with business partner. So he took some items, warned he might spend the night in office before going directly for deal, when Marcos didn't return home nor answered his phone anymore, she became concerned and reported him missing immediately. Police were quick to notice when Matsunaga failed to appear for meetings that he simply could not miss, such as evening events and morning appointments he absolutely could not miss. Initial speculation suggested he may have been kidnapped. Ransom demands likely would soon follow within 24 or 48 hours and hopes of Matsunaga still living were dissipating like smoke before our very eyes. Investigators were swift to act. They interviewed relatives, friends, and business partners of the businessman in question in order to discover any enemies who might wish for his death or disrupt an imminent deal. But it proved futile despite our best efforts. No single individual or group were capable of orchestrating a strategy to target or kill this businessman who ran his enterprise with diligence. Each strategic decision from him benefited almost everyone involved in his endeavors. After collecting her daughter, 
Alice returned home to inform Marcos's father-in-law and mother-in-law what she had not dared tell the police, that her husband Marcos was cheating with Natasha Villalima for years, without hiding it from Alice or hiding their affair from anyone. Although after several major arguments and threats of divorce, Marcos promised that he would drop Natasha for family reasons, but instead continued meeting up with Natasha more subtly, so as not to create yet another family scandal. Alice suspected Marcos's infidelity and decided to hire a private detective in order to gather evidence. Alice had photographs and videos showing Marcos on romantic dates with Natasha. It was notable that Marcos took Natasha with him to restaurants and entertainment venues frequented by both himself and Alice. It seemed Marcos wanted others to witness his disdain for Alice by openly cheating without hiding it from anyone. Later, Natasha Lima, a businessman, discovered escort services through the same website where he met Alice. They spent about five months together, during which he gave her an expensive car and paid an exorbitant sum to have Natasha take down her profile from that site. Photos and videos showing Marcos's infidelity were presented to his parents by his daughter-in-law before disappearing without explanation or apology. Instead of making excuses or asking forgiveness from anyone involved, Marco simply packed his things, told his wife he was leaving, and left their apartment without explanation or apology or explanation, without asking forgiveness, or making excuses or asking forgiveness. Instead, he simply packed his things and told his wife he was leaving before leaving without explanation, or making excuses, nor asking forgiveness from anyone involved, dissolving without trace. Alice told how, consumed with passion, Matsunaga decided to run away with another woman. However, everyone who knew him insisted he could never simply abandon the business because his family had built it over decades. One week later, answers to many questions were finally provided when a passerby discovered scattered garbage bags near a deserted area half a hundred kilometers from where the businessman resided containing human remains in each bag. This man immediately reported his discovery to police and soon it became evident that Marcos Matsunaga whom police had been looking for across the nation, had been killed. Experts determined that the businessman was killed with a gunshot to the head, then dismembered, packed in garbage bags, and taken outside the city for disposal. Pathologists noted that, according to them, the murderer was either a surgeon or experienced butcher, with skill at using a carving knife. Their conclusion was inevitable, as cuts had been precisely placed to separate body parts from each other and keep them apart. As no leads were immediately apparent in the investigation, it was decided to begin in the location where the deceased had last been seen alive. Marcos lived in an elite residential complex equipped with numerous video surveillance cameras, the records from which were then closely examined. On the evening prior to Marcos' disappearance, his wife and daughter ordered food delivery service directly into their home. Marcos could be seen going down to the first floor and returning up with pizza boxes in his hands, entering his apartment without leaving until morning time, when his wife left with three large wheeled suitcases that she struggled to move. According to camera recordings from an elevator's camera recording device, Marcos never left his own home again until leaving with them in hand and never returning later that evening or day either. Matsunaga seemed content in his home until morning came along when his wife left with three heavy-wheeled suitcases, which she struggled to move along a hallway corridor. The footage showed her struggle as she moved them along a hallway corridor before exiting. Investigators had a good sense of what type of luggage had been found. On the same day, the businessman's widow was taken into custody and brought to testify at a police station. Initially, she denied everything and maintained her initial story that her husband had left her for another woman. However, when Alice saw the elevator footage, she quickly broke into tears and started talking. According to Alice, their family life had long since fallen apart, with her husband routinely humiliating and belittling her, often criticizing her work as an escort by criticizing his efforts in pulling her up out of poverty and giving her false hope about recovery from mental illness. Marco stated that Alice was an inadequate mother for their daughter. He attempted to control every move his wife made and would forbid her from making friends. When Alice brought up divorce as a possibility, 
Marcos laughed it off by responding that he would leave her with nothing, take their daughter, and prohibit any contact between him and Alice. Alice stated that on that fateful evening, she showed Marcos pictures obtained from a detective showing his mistress with Alice. Instead, he only responded by getting angry, slapping his wife, and becoming abusive towards Alice. According to Alice herself, this all happened so suddenly, she cannot recall how or where she got the gun with which she shot him. When Alice realized what had occurred later, she decided to dispose of his body so as to appear as though it had disappeared without trace. Knowing human anatomy, as well as having learned how to skinning and cutting up animal carcasses, which they had tools at home for. This task became part of an easy process that Alice took part in with ease and ease, compared to what had previously taken place only moments earlier. As Alice cut up and bagged Marcos's body in their living room, their young daughter slept soundly nearby. Alice's testimony soon raised many doubts and questions. Also, it soon became evident that pictures and videos proving Marcos's infidelity that his wife received from the detective were only obtained on May 20th after Alice had killed him. Alice took these images back to his parents, claiming he had abandoned her by running off with another woman. Natasha Lima testified as a witness against Marcos in court. According to Natasha, Marcos himself wanted a divorce, but feared Alice as she was mentally unstable and capable of doing terrible things. Natasha saw Marcos shortly before his disappearance, complaining about constant family arguments while saying he planned to relocate from Vernia after selling his company, moving with Alice being no part of his plan, as she would simply fade into memory like some nightmare dream. Experts made another shocking and horrifying discovery. Blood was still present in Marcos's lungs after Alice separated his head from his body, suggesting he was alive and trying to breathe when his wife separated them apart. Alice flatly denied this account of events, insisted instead that Marcos died instantly from being shot with a bullet from her gun. Furthermore, pathology found that Marcos didn't react at all when his head was struck by bullet, contrary to Alice's claim of him, attacking her before trying to defend herself with weapons from her gun, contrary to Alice's account, that she tried defending herself with gunfire from behind which came a bullet shot directly from behind and didn't defend against its effect either. Contrary also contradicted Alice's account that her husband attacked her before trying to defend herself by trying defensive measures against it all from Alice herself. Nearly all witnesses who testified at the trial denied that Matsunaga could have physically hurt Alice. While he may have had a difficult character and said hurtful words, in real life, he never raised his hand against anyone. Instead, this episode seemed as though Alice herself had made up since Marcos could not refute it. As a result, Alice Matsunaga was found guilty of premeditated murder with particular cruelty and concealing it from police. As punishment, 20 years in prison were handed out. Many considered this punishment excessive for such a serious crime. Alice is now responsible for raising their daughter as well. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. North Carolina, famous as home to Cherokee Indians, is currently an extremely conservative and prosperous state located in the northern region of South Atlantic states. Crime rates here tend to be much lower than South Carolina. When North Carolina makes national news outlets, it usually because of snowstorms, tornadoes, severe thunderstorms along the coast, tropical storms flooding large areas, dense wildlife refugees at risk from wildfires or landslides that pose more danger than humans themselves, though that isn't always the case either. Tristan Borras, 17 years old at the time, unleashed the storm on April 10, 2019. An adolescent from a religious and large family committed a violent act at their Deep Gap residence on Wednesday evening, which resulted in their deaths. Emergency services received a call from a young woman reporting significant amounts of blood in her residence, as well as three family members she could no longer contact. Her parents and younger brother were missing. Law enforcement arrived quickly at Deep Gap located approximately one mile from both Watauga and Wilkes County borders to make an arrest or investigation possible. Once they arrived at the residence, 
patrol officers saw blood on the pathways leading up to it, on its doormat, and trailing up the staircase. Police officers discovered an injured male concealed by leaves outside his vicinity, who was suffering multiple stab wounds and was located beneath a hammock. At 10.30 p.m. that same evening, family's pickup truck was discovered hidden in a forest nearby where female body had been hidden behind blanket, with mulch bags piled upon it. Jeffrey Boris, Tristan's father, was born April 16, 1975. He served as pastor of Conservative Pist Bible Fellowship Church, a Protestant religious group with Mennonite roots. Jeffrey raised Tristan in an environment which stressed individual devotion, as well as his sense of always being closely observed by God. Through careful and careful examination of Bible passages at gatherings, as well as moral guidance, he received guidance throughout his upbringing. All forms of amusement such as humor and colorful clothing were disapproved of. Acts of kindness, philanthropy, missionary efforts, compassion towards adversaries, and rejection of aggression were seen as positive attributes. Jeffrey learned all these basics as Pastor Harry Boris's son, thus becoming an affectionate, mild-mannered youngster raised by him. Jeffrey found his first summer job at Big Surf Water Park, located on Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. On his initial day of employment, he met Tanya Mae Trandum, who shared similar perspectives and upbringing as Jeffrey. Tanya, too, had been raised within a Christian household. An altruistic girl, she saw this devout young man as an ideal future spouse and nurturing parent. Tanya Brown gave Jeffrey a photograph, depicting an older couple clasping hands, telling him it would be their future. Jeffrey's mother, Kathy Brown, began praying that God would provide his son with someone who shared a strong devotion to Christ. Eventually, the young couple married and carried forward similar traditions within their family unit, saving Tanya's picture in their family photo album as proof. Soon thereafter, they welcomed their first child, a charming girl named Taylor. Three more babies soon followed, Tristan being their youngest. Taylor quickly proved herself an exceptional older sibling to her siblings, providing care, assistance, and friendship towards all but most notably being best friends with Tristan as their youngest sibling. Tristan found Taylor his best and only companion despite an age difference, even though they both attended different churches. As they became older, Jeffrey and Tanya decided to fulfill their Christian responsibility by adopting four additional boys from an institution. Family was open, affectionate, and friendly, and eventually expanded to eight children. Taylor, the twins Kay and Alexis, Miss Ariel, Stephen Miku Tristan. According to religious views in their family home, cell phones and social networks weren't permitted until a certain age, and children were encouraged to exercise self-discipline with regard to demands and desires. Boys were not permitted to begin romantic relationships until they finished high school, typically around the age of 18, which required attendance at Bible studies and religious affairs. Otherwise, children matured similarly as typical boys and girls would. Parents did not distinguish between biological and adoptive children. All received equal consideration, care, and affection from them. A thoughtful mother created an atmosphere of peace by paying close attention to internal dynamics and sibling relationships, praying frequently, and performing acts of kindness. Together with her partner, she realized it was essential to develop good qualities through their behavior and set an example for her children of how important kindness can be in society. After Hurricane Ike struck Haiti, Tanya decided to sell her expensive wedding ring and donate the proceeds to an organization building homes for those affected by it. She bought herself an ordinary and inexpensive band instead. In 2015, Taylor completed high school and relocated to Boone for Appalachian State University. This event greatly affected Tristan. Without his friend around anymore, he felt alone and abandoned. Taylor returned home quickly, living her own independent life, while Tristan continued with the same restrictions and routines imposed upon him since early years by his parents' religious beliefs. Tristan felt restrained by not having access to social media, as this form of communication has become integral in teenagers' lives today. After Taylor had moved away, tension between his parents only worsened. In December 2017, however, 
Jeffrey and his family made significant positive steps forward when they relocated to a spacious lot in Deep Gap in Watauga County, in North Carolina, on an unpaved road that led into forested areas. It was significantly larger than their former residence. Robin was Tanya's mother and the children's grandma. This close proximity allowed for easy access in case additional care were necessary for caring for Tristan or not. While moving had likely been positive overall, Tristan may have needed time to adjust to his new environment by switching schools and adapting to life with new peers. At first, Tristan Boris's life may have seemed trouble-free. Attending Watauga High School and joining its track and field team seemed effortless, while other children found work as counselors at summer camps. While Tristan may have seemed perfect from outsiders' perspectives, over time his behavior became alarming enough that multiple meetings with a psychologist were scheduled in 2018. These meetings centered around his problems with managing anger and impulsivity. In 2019, when this young student was attending high school, he experienced difficulties understanding certain subjects despite his strong capabilities. These challenges persisted with every passing day and, since his relocation, have worsened significantly. Once settled in, he quickly transitioned from an enthusiastic student who actively participated in school activities into an indolent, and disinterested adolescent who lost all interest in academic pursuits. Tristan began arriving late for lessons and had no desire or motivation to study, often wearing headphones in class with an uncommitted expression on his face. Teachers attempted to help, even reaching out directly, yet nothing seemed to change his apathy or enthusiasm toward studying. Tristan was not always behaving appropriately at home. At that point in his life, he already owned everything. There were often arguments between he and his parents over his mobile phone use and social media usage. In addition, Tristan spent hours surfing the web using Instagram as his portal of expression, where he described himself as a musician. Taylor had always taken an avid interest in her siblings' lives and noticed that Tristan frequently clashed with both of his parents over religious matters. She discovered other issues at school as well. Although she attempted to communicate with Tristan again, their former intimacy no longer existed. Tristan eventually met Evelyn Faith Jackson, a girl from his religious community. They began meeting regularly, without paying attention to any restrictions on close relationships, occasionally smoking prohibited plants together, and Tristan often complained to his mother, who would debate his behavior with him at night, leaving him exhausted and unable to focus in school. The young man expressed concern over his numerous shortcomings that prevented him from meeting his mother's expectations and earning her pride. He noted that while with his father he could be his true self, that wasn't necessarily the case with her. On April 10, 2019, several previously undisclosed aspects of Tristan's life came to light. Security cameras were set up in his barn where goats were kept, his previous mobile phone, which he often used without telling his parents about became an avenue of access for Tanya. She found texts showing that Tristan had engaged in explicit talks with female visitors, as well as discussed illicit substances. Tristan was at school when his phone started beeping with new messages from Tanya Boris and her husband, Daniel Boris. Alarmed, Tristan's parents communicated with each other over what had been found on Tristan's old phone. Upon learning this news, they started text messaging him and discussing the data discovered there. That same day, Sher King, Tristan's English instructor, called his mother with concerns regarding Tristan's academic performance and conduct. Later during trial, Sher King testified that Tanya Boris informed her they would collect Tristan early from school to discuss his grades with Tanya Boris, who she would also discuss it further with Sher King, regarding concerns she expressed about Tristan's academic performance and conduct before later testifying that Tanya Boris told her and her husband would pick Tristan up early from school in order to discuss grades with Tristan before collecting him beforehand, in order to discuss grades with Tristan himself, before anyone else would know about this matter, involving Tristan being spoken about by Sher King, who then phoned his mother, expressing concern regarding academic performance and conduct issues, of which Tanya Boras informed her and husband would arrive shortly and collect him ahead of schedule in order to discuss possible academic performance 
and conduct issues concerning him being involved. Later testifying, Tanya Boras informed her and her husband would soon arrive shortly thereafter in order to collect him ahead of schedule from school, in order to discuss his grades together before collection from school shortly. Sherry King relayed Tristan's parents' message to him, who was shocked at what he heard. Tristan and Sherry left their youngest child with his grandma before heading over to his middle school to address the situation. Upon their return home, it was relatively peaceful. During trial, Tristan would recall that his mother appeared distressed while searching through his phone. Home discussions lasted approximately 90 minutes. Following their session, Tanya sent a text message to Tristan's mother informing her that Tristan wasn't bothered by his phone and car keys being confiscated until his grades and behavior improved. Tanya also mentioned she would soon arrive to collect Tristan. Tanya sent this text at 4 more p.m. Once Tristan and Tanya discussed performing well academically, maintaining healthy relationships with girls, illegal substances risks as well as her preference that Tristan focus on Christianity rather than other religions. He was made to listen and became acutely aware of where improvements needed to be made in his life. They created a list of traits necessary for personal growth, empathy and integrity among them, later to be discovered by cops. Tristan recounted how his mother approached from behind, placed her arm around his neck, exerted force upon it, forcing him to respond impulsively by rising, pivoting, and unwittingly striking her with his elbow, something his mother had never done before, which may explain his response. Her response? To grab what appeared to be scissors from a shelf. However, as Tristan felt overwhelmed by his surroundings, he took action himself by stabbing his mother, believing he was protecting himself and fled for assistance from his father before returning. Subsequently, a forensic investigation would fail to uncover evidence on Tristan's neck, proving his mother strangled him. At trial, the prosecution would present photographs from a medical examiner depicting a fractured neck bone. In contrast to this testimony provided by psychologists, who demonstrated Tristan Boris was mentally sound when the crime was committed, but suffered from compromised cognitive conditions, which caused depersonalization, derealization, and an unreal feeling. Unfortunately for Tristan, both court and jury would disregard psychologists' interpretation by simply concluding he is an adept manipulator and socially risky individual. Tristan was confused and disoriented during this encounter with his father as he could not comprehend why he was fleeing him, and why, upon finally catching up, he ended up stabbing him despite pleas for assistance. Tristan remembered his father grabbing a stone and shouting, Tristan refrained before apparently preferring that his life end, rather than attempt to harm or maim Tristan further. Neighbors reported hearing loud screaming coming from Boris' property around 5.30 p.m. Wednesday. Once it was over, Tristan returned home and vomited, according to his psychologist's analysis. This indicated a high degree of stress rather than premeditated murder. However, the jury held a different view than the psychologist. Eventually receiving reports from a forensic medical examiner, at trial, Jeffrey Boris's post-mortem report listed several knife wounds to his left chest and back, slash wounds on both arms and hands, and abrasions to his skull and forehead. Tanya Boris's autopsy report showed numerous stab wounds across her left chest, back, arm as well as possible neck trauma from pressure applied by Jeffrey. Additionally, injuries could have resulted from pressure applied when Tristan felt threatened by Tanya. These findings demonstrated that Tristan could distance himself from his mother should he feel threatened, also provided him the chance to distance himself in case his mother should he feel threatened himself during his attack on Tristan. Though her actions were likely caused by a rapid error of judgment and misunderstand of self-defense, their son Tristan's murder and subsequent behavior was immediately clear. After taking Tristan's mother's body from her residence and placing it into their vehicle covered with a tarpaulin cover for transport, later he cleaned up the area surrounding his residence for around an hour before using a garden hose to rinse out its porch next door. At approximately 8.30 p.m., Tristan arrived at Robin's residence to collect his younger sibling from school, something she found peculiar, only for him to inform her that their parents needed to run to a store quickly and didn't have time to collect him themselves.
20 minutes later, she received a phone call from another grandson, upset because neither parent was responding to his calls nor arriving as per usual at his part-time work site, where they usually picked him up afterward. Grandma called Alexis and asked her to fetch Robin. Once at Jeffrey and Tanya's residence, Robin noticed blood on the porch. However, because the couple owned pets, she wasn't overly concerned. When entering the house to collect a flashlight and inspect her animals, she noticed there was significant blood present. At that moment, Alexis quickly entered her home and reported her discovery of a body near the animal barn, along with believing she saw Tristan with bloody wounds escaping in a car used for escape. Alexis quickly contacted emergency services. An operator advised Alexis and family members to lock themselves into a vehicle until police arrived to respond. After 10 minutes of waiting outside and speaking with other officers, all were transported back to the station where they learned of Jeffrey and Tanya Barassi's deaths. While inspecting the crime site, officers discovered a computer interface linking an indoor video surveillance system with monitors in the house. The display showed multiple cameras streaming live footage onto monitors, prompting authorities to obtain login credentials from the firm that maintained it and request a warrant to obtain its login data from that firm. Tristan reached out to Evelyn and met up at her house, causing concern among Evelyn, as well as some scratches to appear on his forehead and arms. Tristan assured Evelyn that all was okay after an argument between his parents and playing with their dog led to scratching. Evelyn later noted three scrapes on Tristan's forehead, two cuts on his hand, laceration on one fingertip, a bruised fingernail, and more scrapes than were visible. Tristan uploaded an image to Snapchat of his injuries after the incident and claimed they had been caused by his father's dog. Evelyn believed they matched up to injuries she saw him suffering during that evening's visit to Tristan and offered for him to stay overnight at her place and then visit Walmart and McDonald's the following morning before visiting Walmart and McDonald's as planned, but later decided against going. Tristan desired temporary separation from both of his parents, so Evelyn suggested staying with one of her family members for some time until Tristan agreed, and they journeyed together across state lines. On April 11th, Officers from the sheriff's office obtained login and password credentials to the video surveillance system at Borley residence and examined video footage to unearth details regarding this crime. Police obtained an arrest warrant for Tristan and provided details regarding his vehicle used to flee to the National Crime Information Center, leading to an intensive search and pursuit operation being initiated in its search for it. Investigator Matthew received information that Tristan had been seen in Tennessee, so he began the necessary paperwork for extradition. To facilitate conversation between themselves and Tristan due to his young age, Robin, Tristan's grandmother, joined Investigator Matthew on their apprehension trip. Tristan noticed blue lights following him while driving his Ford with Evelyn. Attempting to distance himself, Tristan drove quickly along the highway, but eventually surrendered and stopped for good, being restrained with handcuffs before being led away into an officer-manned police vehicle, with ease by officers observing he did not seem distressed or anxious during this encounter. Investigator Matthew captured both video and audio of Tristan Boris's interview, held April 11, 2019, both videotaped and audiotaped. Tristan responded to all inquiries, admitted his conduct had violated law, and provided an in-depth account of it, sometimes breaking down in tears during their conversation. Tristan, who was only 17 at the time, was detained without bail. Shortly thereafter, the sheriff's office obtained a warrant to examine Tristan's Snapchat account, as well as five cell phones, which may contain evidence on this incident. A search warrant was also issued for Tristan's Orchard Road residence, where investigators discovered an additional mobile phone in the main bedroom as well as paper cups, hammers, straws, knives, swabs with red stains, eyeglasses, kitchen towels, hammock digital video recorders, a rug, and various papers, cards, and boots from storage. Legal papers indicate that a search warrant was also authorized for Tristan's Ford F-150 vehicle, where a swab with red stains, a charger for his laptop computer and steering wheel cover were taken. Another search warrant was also issued against his girlfriend's residence in Boone, as he had spent the night there. 
Pillowcases, zipper sweaters, and notebooks were confiscated from these premises by court order. Investigations and searches provided detectives with enough evidence to reconstruct every detail of events, even those seemingly minor ones that had not occurred yet, thus making self-defense unfeasible. Funeral ceremonies for this couple took place on April 17, 2019 at Bible Fellowship Church and were led by pastors William C.R. and Brad Gray. Even after losing both parents so soon in life, their children found the strength to write heartfelt obituaries for them both. Jeff and Tanya brought immense happiness and pride to both of our parents. As such, we aim to carry on their legacy by loving others fully while following Jesus. Following her brother Tristan's funeral, Taylor visited him for the first time in prison and was shocked at his behavior. Tristan showed no regret or attempted to place blame onto other family members. To her sister it appeared like he believed he'd eventually gain his freedom again. She felt repulsed and left quickly. On May 11th, she returned to commemorate Tristan's birthday with his grandma Robin present, but the encounter mirrored that of previous visits, with Tristan commending their organized birthday celebration at a correctional facility to mark his special day, despite Taylor considering this behavior inappropriate given their parents' untimely demises. Following this visit, their family made the decision to end any further communication with Tristan. Trial began on February 16, 2022. At trial, Tristan expressed regret over what had taken place, agreed with what his family had said about him, and supported the choice for long-term restrictions to ensure their sense of security. On March 3rd, he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole on each count of first-degree murder by Judge Horn, who noted mental health was an element in this case as Tristan Boris still experienced anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, like symptoms according to psychologist reports. Judge Horn noted that although the psychologist did not detect signs of psychotic disorders, anxiety and despair might have been compounded by her use of illegal narcotics. One striking aspect of Tristan's case was his family, lawyer or himself, not providing any explanation as to the reasoning for his crime. On one side, there is a religious household and socially risky person, using illicit drugs who did not fully grasp why events transpired nor effectively manage miscommunication. While on the other is Tristan himself, who wasn't sure why something went wrong. On the other side of the coin is a young man with an inadequate self-perception, no confidence, frequently experiencing depression, showing symptoms of anxiety, and not seeking professional health care services. At his court hearing, it was brought up that he experienced panic attacks, which his mother helped manage as she too experienced them frequently. One of the central principles of teaching PISM is based on the belief that children born with original sin are inherently immoral and therefore need education and schooling in order to rectify their behavior and prepare them for living an ethical lifestyle. Establishing strict discipline and suppressing children's self-awareness are effective in accomplishing this aim, according to some. Strict love may even prove helpful. Children genetically predisposed for increased sensitivity of the nervous system often struggled when raised within severely limited environments that were overprotective, leading them to feel insufficient when it came to religious belief systems. Some individuals naturally require more affection while others demand less. As his older sister recalled, the young child felt threatened by the arrival of new siblings that caused their parents' priorities to shift in response to them. Initial reactions included revolt, followed by feelings of sorrow and low self-esteem, evidenced by illicit marijuana usage, sudden attacks of anxiety, and feelings of being detached from both oneself and their surroundings. His religious beliefs differed from his parents, he could not fulfill his mother's expectations, and the changes needed were listed in a joint document they created together. Instead of finding contacts for competent therapists, they had reached the breaking point, leaving no way out but separation in what had once been an affectionate family unit. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Royal Caribbean was sailing across the Asian Sea, where its expanse seemed endless, 
caring newly married couple George Smith and Jennifer, who had recently been joined together in marriage. Sitting on deck, enjoying the cool breeze in their hair, and gazing upon beautiful surroundings, Asian sea was stretched out before them like an expansive canvas filled with promise and potential. Thus began an extraordinary wedding journey that eventually turned into an unexpected voyage that led to unexpected results and ultimately to an intriguing tale. On July 5, 2005, at approximately 8 a.m. in one of the cabins on Deck 7 of Royal Caribbean Cruise Liner in Chicago, 16-year-old Emily Roosh noticed something that caused concern. Something resembling blood was spread across a canopy that protected lifeboat in her immediate area, as well as an apparent blood mark near its outer part, suggesting someone had fallen through and vanished into the sea. Emily could not help reacting when she noticed these strange footprints and quickly informed the staff of the liner about them. Shortly thereafter, other passengers from nearby staterooms noticed similar evidence on Deck 7. An engaging discussion began about what might have caused these footprints to appear, leading to stories that eventually appeared on multiple international magazines' front pages. Unforeseen events took place within cabin number 962 that caused immediate and profound distress for this young couple on their Mediterranean honeymoon vacation disrupting their happiness abruptly and suddenly. Accounts of this incident varied and were confusing, including accounts that ranged from an accidental mishap, potential theft, and possible even intentional murder. Investigators grew increasingly confused as their inquiry unfolded, with evidence collected on board suggesting multiple potential culprits who kept undisclosed information to themselves. It seems as though many on board knew more than they wanted to share. And now investigators, reporters, and others tracking this mysterious case are left scratching their heads as to exactly what transpired on that ominous night aboard ship. George Smith was an optimistic, curious, and intelligent young person born in Greenwich, Connecticut. George enjoyed an enjoyable childhood filled with happiness thanks to the love and support from his family, most especially his parents, George Sr., an owner and manager of a liquor business himself who managed it himself with passion, though Bree was his primary priority, as she always felt safe around them both. His family business, George Sr., ran by Bree, was owned and managed personally. For him, it wasn't simply work, but an endeavor worth dedicating hours every week. George took pride in making sure his family were his top priority, an activity they all shared, along with Bree, also owned and managed personally by George's father. George Sr. and owned and managed a liquor business managed personally by him himself. More than simply work, its operation became his true passion. George Smith Jr. graduated with honors from Babson College, located in Massachusetts. Following graduation, he spent some years as an analyst specializing in computer data mining in Boston before returning home and joining his parents' store as an assistant manager to gain insight into all its details so he could eventually take over and give his parents time for much-needed vacation. George Smith met Jennifer from Connecticut and recently offered a teaching position during one of his gatherings with friends in 2002. They quickly fell deeply in love, with George's parents also being thrilled about this choice of partner for their son. Three years later, in 2005, when George was 26 years old, they made the decision to get married and start a new chapter of their lives together. They held their wedding at Castle Hill Inn, located in Newport, Rhode Island, with the ceremony taking place by the waterfront, an idyllic venue for such an important milestone in life. Following their ceremony, the newlyweds went on their 12-day honeymoon cruise aboard one of Royal Caribbean's grand vessels, sailing around Asia from Barcelona. Visits were made to France's Côte d'Azur and Italian coast. On their cruise, George and Jennifer quickly made friends with another couple from California, as well as Josh Asen, a 20-year-old with an engaging sense of humor, from California. Josh quickly befriended George before joining their cheerful group for fun hangout sessions aboard ship. On July 1st, after departing Italy's coast, they made plans to disembark and spend all day having fun on land together. On July 4th, youth explored Mykonos Island with eager excitement, strolling through its historic town's narrow alleyways and taking a dip in its clear Asian seawater were highlights for them, along with sampling delicious local cuisine and charming eateries. Happy and content, 
they enjoyed one another's company and this lovely location. Mykonos created lasting memories and they planned to finish their evening together on the ship's deck. George and Jennifer joined their friends on board ship for another enjoyable dinner and decided to come together as a group and share in some good lacks to remember this special part of the world. It was an energetic evening as George, Jennifer, and Josh Asen all took advantage of tasty starters and beverages before moving on to having fun at the casino aboard ship. George liked sitting at the craps table while Josh found entertainment playing poker, while Jennifer preferred poker tables for entertainment purposes. By the end of their evening, newly married couple had lost considerable sums, but laughed about it without regret. After all, this was their honeymoon. Following casino closure, companions made the decision to continue with their evening. George was most recently seen exiting the casino at approximately 2.30 a.m. and did not necessarily indicate that he would return to his cabin. On June 5, 2005, in the early morning hours, an unusual plan began unfolding on Mykonos in Greece. George Smith, recently married 26-year-old from West Virginia, was on an Asian cruise when he mysteriously vanished that evening. Witnesses described a vibrant, exciting evening on board which George loved. However, everything soon proved more sinister in its aftermath. The ship's captain conducted an examination of the stateroom, where strange footprints had been found, as well as surrounding deck areas, including where any possible acts of aggression might have taken place. There was nobody inside this cabin where such footprints had been left behind, and evidence hinted at something significant having taken place in it. Potentially related acts had led to its disappearance by violence against newly married couple. Word quickly spread among passengers aboard the ship about these mysterious happenings, creating unease among all of them and prompting Deck 7 to be closed off so no passengers were permitted to enter or leave their cabins. Meanwhile, ship's crew extensively explored all potential locations on board in an effort to track down George and Jennifer who had vanished without trace. After discovering blood, it was assumed that newly married couple had vanished for unknown reasons. A senior officer took control of the situation by taking action himself. Going back to their cabin to assess what had occurred, all available evidence indicated that George may have fallen into the water and disappeared off ship. Meanwhile, on the opposite side, searches continued for George and Caroline. At 10 a.m., Jennifer was discovered receiving an otherwise scheduled massage in the ship's spa. To her shock and concern, Jennifer disclosed that her husband hadn't been present when she woke up today, though initially this didn't appear odd as they'd shared a cabin together before moving into different cabins for sleepover. So instead of searching for him immediately, she decided to indulge in some spa treatment rather than worry. At midday, Turkish officials arrived aboard to begin an inquiry. The captain comforted anxious passengers by explaining that recent events necessitated working closely with local authorities in order to clarify them quickly. He expressed hope that any issues would be dealt with quickly. Police officers began their interrogation of Jennifer, wife of the missing guy. Due to her unsettling state and apparent ignorance about George's whereabouts, Jennifer became the primary focus. She mentioned having not seen George since last night. Men from Royal Caribbean came knocking at her door, telling her it's possible he may have fallen overboard from their ship. Bloodstains could also be seen on its awning, suggesting something terrible had taken place with George. Investigators conducted an inspection of Stateroom 962 aboard a cruise ship. When they entered, the room was in disarray from a quick search or conflict. Fingerprints could also be seen on the balcony railings in the bathroom area, where spots of blood could be seen on rugs, towels, and surfaces like the balcony railings. Turkish investigators discovered two two-centimeter bloodstains on bedspreads belonging to George. Samples were identified as belonging to him before disappearing mysteriously from cabin 962. All indications pointed to George having experienced trauma prior to his mysterious departure, suggesting trauma had taken place prior to his unexpected disappearance from cabin 962, prior to his untimely disappearance a short while after experiencing trauma within this cabin before his mysterious departure without explanation from its confines 
before its vanishing meant, from which all records could not be traced. Detectives were particularly intrigued by a chair on the balcony, which had been moved closer to the railing so someone could sit on it next to it, and discovered indications on it suggesting someone had been sitting. This aroused suspicion among many, including the captain of the ship, that George may have fallen from there and injured himself. However, due to tall barriers on either side of him, as well as bloodstains found inside both cabin and awning of boat, also leading them to suspect that there had been an act of murder committed on board ship. Investigators began piecing together what had transpired that evening, trying to ascertain who George had been socializing with and what could have caused this tragic incident. Though their inquiry had only just started, it soon became evident that it presented them with an intricate tale filled with riddles and unexpected developments. Turkish authorities entered the ship to begin investigating George Smith's disappearance and decided to begin by interviewing a group of young men with whom his newly married couple had socialized prior to leaving port. Since the case remained obscure, each clue could potentially provide important insight. Company members reported that George and Jennifer had consumed excessive quantities of wine on that fateful night. George was under the influence of alcohol, so they assisted him back to his cabin where they helped him into bed before taking off his shoes before leaving him alone. Jennifer could not be found, and they speculated she might return later. Josh Askin's statement contains other inconsistencies, including his claim that he witnessed Jennifer leaving with casino staff member Lloyd, believing there to be an intense emotional bond between George and Jennifer, and them not hiding their feelings towards one another in George's presence. Video camera footage, however, showed Jennifer leaving without Lloyd at 3.25 a.m., leaving George with new acquaintances. Lloyd returned home around 3.25 a.m., as confirmed by key card data, as well as by his girlfriend waking up when entering their cabin at this time. Detectives were perplexed by these discrepancies and began to suspect Josh Askin had personal motivations for concealing certain information from them. Investigators continued their probe, uncovering more and more details that deepened the enigma surrounding Greg Rosenberg's tale. At 19 years old, Greg was enjoying himself aboard a cruise ship with family and friends, such as cousin Zach Rosenberg and close acquaintance Rostislav Kaufman. All three had Russian origins, but held American passports and resided in New York City. Jennifer and Greg Rosenberg decided to test their luck at poker at the casino. Betting activity continued well into the evening. When it closed at 2.30 a.m., their group decided to continue the fun at a club, dancing, sipping drinks, and enjoying drinks while Lloyd Botha, the manager of the casino, was present and joined it in their nightly amusement. After this incident, accounts of what transpired began to diverge as members of the group slowly made their own ways back to their cabins. Some boys intoxicated with alcohol had become particularly boisterous late into the evening. Pursuant to ship regulations, delivery staff refused to serve two intoxicated guests who claimed that they had bought absinthe on Mykonos Island, but this wasn't permitted, as passengers weren't permitted to consume their own alcoholic beverages on board. At some point, Josh returned to his cabin on the same deck and obtained an extremely potent bottle of absinthe, which had an alcohol content exceeding 70% one of the strongest alcoholic beverages available on the market. George decided to help Josh out and concealed it beneath his short waistband so as to remain undetected for as long as possible. After 3 a.m., when the ship had become totally silent, a vigilant janitor observed something unusual. Four young individuals, including Greg, Zach, Rostislav, Josh, and George, were drinking from an absinthe bottle and making noise about drinking more. This incident was taken seriously and became another factor in the investigation. Not only were men drinking heavily that evening, even Jennifer, who had initially appeared more reserved, began showing signs of impairment later that night. Witnesses had varied interpretations of her behavior. Some saw it as her trying to maintain balance, while others took it as flirtatious behavior. No one knows exactly what happened after this, though eyewitness accounts indicate a disagreement between them. Perhaps they were discussing events from the night before, either in an upbeat or serious tone, 
when Jennifer struck George without apparent provocation. Whether this act of violence could have been playful or caused out of anger is still unknown. Following that, Jennifer abruptly left the disco at 3.30 a.m., seemingly under the influence and leaving George behind in the company of his newly acquired friends. This act marked an abrupt turning point in their evening together. Staff witnesses were essential in providing accurate accounts of what transpired at the incident scene. Jennifer, walking unsteadily down the hallway, caught the janitor's attention, and, according to him, young men drinking absinthe had previously been seen doing so. He provided her with assistance, accompanied her to the elevator, and observed as she made an odd right turn when reaching her floor, despite having a stateroom on her left. Jennifer was eventually discovered sleeping in the corridor, some distance from her room. Two security personnel and a female cop used a wheelchair to transport her back. At 4.52 a.m. when they arrived back in their living quarters, George was absent and his balcony drapes had remained tight even with gusts of wind. Raising questions, could he move independently out to his balcony once his new acquaintances left and left him in bed? Chit Hyman and his spouse were enjoying a relaxing getaway at a nearby cabin when the situation escalated rapidly. While sleeping peacefully for some time prior to 4 a.m., when an inexplicable noise began disturbing their rest, Chit Hyman immediately reported the noise to guest services. Additionally, he banged on his wall and shouted at his neighbors until there was some relief in their cabin. After another noisy conversation lasting approximately three minutes, an extremely heated discussion broke out on the balcony. Chit and his spouse overheard someone repeat, Good night, as if encouraging people to leave the cabin, followed by sounds resembling furniture rearrangement, followed by what could only have been an item dropping to the ground. Chit Hyman decided to investigate and opened up the door, whereupon he observed three individuals whom he could not recognize. Other passengers on board reported hearing loud sounds that seemed to mimic someone hitting the roof of the boat, followed by a female's scream for help. However, none of the witnesses could provide conclusive proof that a female was present during that period in the cabin. Eyewitness accounts indicate four young males entered, yet only three of them could be seen leaving at any one time. Question was, could one of them have remained indoors to attempt to obtain money from a newly married couple following a large gambling session? and possibly try to steal. Heist appears likely, although Greg, Zach, and Rostislav may have had other plans after Chit Hyman noticed three unknown individuals outside his room. George Smith had no trace of two men entering his stateroom after entering it at 4.05 a.m., according to their evidence, and leaving without returning within the same hour, prompting several hypotheses as to what may have transpired since. Here are a few theories as to what might have transpired regarding George. Robbery. Robberies are of great concern, and George and Jennifer had become intoxicated quickly that evening, yet witnesses saw them leave the casino at 2.30 a.m., seemingly relatively sober. At 3.30 a.m., however, they could no longer access their cabin alone due to possible exposure to illegal substances. This theory is supported by reports from casino patrons, who reported hearing George and Jennifer boast about possessing significant amounts of money which may have come either as wedding gifts or won in gambling at the casino. Witnesses reported having fortunes worth several tens of thousands of dollars. It appears likely they may have been targeted for theft. George owned an expensive Breitling watch, while Jennifer owned an exquisite engagement ring. Both items signaled their wealth. Perhaps their living space was searched in an attempt to discover it. Blued stains on their sheet may have resulted from George's watch, being taken off his wrist by a kidnapper. Alcohol's Impact, the second rendition of events related to the effects of alcohol and hallucinogens. When informed of passengers' intoxication levels and footprints left on the balcony, Captain concluded there may have been an inadvertent incident such as when grappling instructor George fell into the water while grappling. A special focus is given on hallucinations caused by drinking absinthe. Specialists in toxicology stress that concentration of active ingredients, such as thujone, is key. At present, this beverage is being sold across Europe. However, its strength has been severely limited by restrictions set forth by the European Union. This evidence 
suggests that in legally sold absinthe, the amount of thujone present is so small as to prevent hallucinations. However, illegally produced absinthe that contains much higher potencies can be obtained via illegal channels and could theoretically cause hallucinations effects. Given that the Smith couple obtained their absinthe legally in Europe and could not have caused such harmful results, this situation seems improbable. Experts agree that in order to experience hallucinogenic effects from legal absinthe, a person would need to consume a substantial quantity. Unfortunately, such an amount would likely exceed what their body can tolerate and could even result in potentially deadly alcohol poisoning. Alcohol and hallucinogen use appear unlikely here and lack compelling proof. Questioning individuals from George Smith's company as part of the investigation into his disappearance remains key. FBI investigators conducted lie detector interviews with several key figures involved in this story, such as Jennifer and casino manager Lloyd Botha, both successfully passing their lie detector tests. Josh Askin did not pass his polygraph interview, however. It could indicate that the Russian had knowledge about George's disappearance, or it could have been caused by questioning methods designed to extract more details from him. Furthermore, video footage was produced showing three individuals discussing it casually and playful. The audio was found to be significant evidence and was taken into consideration by FBI investigators. One of the unknown individuals on the recording can be heard speaking the phrase, we taught him a lesson in paragliding without parachute, which could suggest something related to George. Greg, Zach, Rostislav, and Josh Osson were interviewed as witnesses during an investigation into George Smith's mysterious death in 2009. Zach Rosenberg and Josh Askin did not provide straight answers or make statements clearly explaining events, which transpired as Zach relied on self-incrimination clause of Fifth Amendment of U.S. Constitution to avoid providing straightforward responses, leaving their statements unclear or lacking completeness. Greg Rosenberg was among those present at George Smith's gathering that evening and made statements which undermined his investigation. For instance, one such statement from him stated that they ordered food delivery that day, an allegation which provided them with a plausible alibi against Russian boys present there. Yet this assertion remains suspect given there are inconsistencies with it. No orders were recorded by ship service logs on that date. Stateroom delivery had been banned that morning, employees were instructed not to assist with them that evening, and Greg remains uncertain who placed orders. Witnesses offered varied responses about George and Jennifer's relationship based on their observations and memories. Greg testified that due to excessive alcohol intake, it was difficult to assess their quality relationship due to intoxication in general. All members in their group were truly drunk, making definitive statements difficult. Josh Askin suggested Greg had left shortly after placing an order for meals, but Greg denied this claim by asserting he never left. Consistencies added an additional level of complexity to the investigation and necessitated further verification and gathering of facts. Greg stated he knew nothing about any connection between Jennifer or Lloyd Botha and George's disappearance. Yet, according to him, it must have been intentional as something strange occurred that night. Sooner or later, this will all come out into the open. Greg Rosenberg was murdered in December 2019, and the cause of his death remains unanswered. Authorities are currently conducting an investigation to ascertain any link between this killing and George Smith's demise. George Smith's untimely disappearance became a national scandal that devastated his family. The circumstances became more intricate as time progressed, drawing interest both from law enforcement authorities and members of the general public alike. Meanwhile, George's relatives continued pressing authorities to uncover the truth and provide justice. The FBI's Connecticut Regional Office transferred George's case to New York. Their determination and media outreach efforts resulted in little progress on this undisclosed matter. George's family offered a $100,000 reward for any information which might lead to finding and punishing those responsible while also encouraging people not to support shipowner firms as they suspected these firms of trying to cover up what had occurred for financial gain. After the incident, relations between George's parents and Jennifer became unstable. A comprehensive assessment of her conduct began publicly, 
she appeared excessively composed and calculated while refusing to provide sufficient details sparked suspicion. Yet, according to FBI agents, she stated she was simply following their instructions and adhering to their guidelines. In their pursuit of fairness and truth, the Smith family became disillusioned when Jennifer accepted an offer from an arbitration firm to settle the litigation privately for $1 million. Seen by many as betrayal and as a way to avoid further accusations against cruise organizers. They were unhappy with Turkish authorities' investigations as well as Jennifer, accepting this settlement offer too quickly and accepting an arbitration firm offer too quickly, believing she may be hiding something and not showing curiosity enough about uncovering truth. Jennifer herself reported having very few memories after 2.30 a.m. that night. She wasn't aware that ship's crew discovered and brought back Jennifer to her room from where they found her in the hallway. Since the Turkish inquiry didn't meet their expectations and their doubtful attitude toward official conclusions, the Smith family decided to seek justice on their own and sought help from independent forensic scientist Henry Lee in their pursuit for justice. Henry Lee conducted several tests inside and on the balcony that were not included in his official report, hoping to uncover key facts about what had taken place and validate one of two possible explanations, murder or accident. Henry Lee suggests that due to the height of the balcony, its fall could cause injury in any number of ways. A third party could have pushed George over or, being in some state of mental confusion, he could have climbed up on it himself and fallen. Either scenario generated numerous inquiries and uncertainties. An expert wanted to conduct an experiment designed to replicate such an occurrence. However, however, this proposal was turned down by firm owner of Liner. Henry Lee conducted investigations in the cabin, on the balcony and boat, without disclosing their findings to anyone. Simultaneously, the FBI began their own probe. Their studies and discoveries remained undisclosed as well. They seemed particularly intrigued with four young guys who spent one night with George, Josh Asin from Los Angeles, as well as Greg Zach Rosenberg, Rostislav Kaufman from Russia, who differed significantly in account from that given by other witnesses, creating an unusual and confusing scenario. George Smith's mysterious disappearance remains an incomprehensible puzzle, shrouded in secrecy and unfamiliar conditions. Following an exhaustive investigation and consideration of various hypotheses, his loved ones remain committed to uncovering the truth about her disappearance. At first, they doubted Jennifer's involvement, but later, they became convinced of her innocence and raised their lawsuit settlement amount against a corporation. With this money divided amongst themselves as family and obtained access to findings from ship owner company, inquiries that included testimonies from witnesses as well as any relevant details that revealed by ship owner's company. Inquiries that included testimonies of witnesses as well as relevant details regarding other details regarding George Smith's disappearance. Jennifer was left with memories of her first spouse and dedicated herself to charitable associations in his memory, striving to perform acts of kindness. Over time, she married again. Unfortunately, Despite all attempts and investigations by the FBI to uncover what had occurred or where George's body might have been hidden, their efforts failed. At its conclusion, it was determined that George died accidentally. Furthermore, there wasn't sufficient evidence available for further investigations as stated by their official statement of the Federal Bureau. George Smith has vanished and his loved ones continue to search for answers as to his demise. They feel deeply distressed that they cannot pay their respects to him at his burial site, yet hope they'll eventually unravel his mystery and uncover its truth. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. At London 2012 Summer Olympic Games, Felix Vero Sanchez stood out. Dubbed one of Puerto Rico's greatest talents and most anticipated athletes, Many anticipated him winning championships and gold medals for Puerto Rico. All eyes turned towards him believing that this young person would go far in athletics. In 2021, boxing once again made headlines worldwide media, this time in relation to criminal news. This storyline involves an early romantic connection 
that eventually developed into dependency that eventually lead to devastating consequences. Also includes details regarding who orchestrated 2014 main knockout, which earned praise from two-time Olympic champion Vasil Lomachenko before receiving almost severe punishment, but eventually getting sentenced to life imprisonment. Be mindful that despite evidence and confession from his boxer's accomplice, he refuses to own up to his guilt. At nine years old, an unexpected incident altered his future direction dramatically. An acquaintance visited with their nine-year-old, prompting an altercation that included physical contact that required both parents to intervene to separate the youngsters. His father later suggested that should any fights arise again in future, they should wear boxing gloves for protection. After his altercation, Felix requested being taken to a gym nearby. During this initial training session, he discovered his passion for boxing, later confessing it himself. At 16 years old, he won Pan American Junior Championships with flying colors. One year later, he won his national championship, while two years later, he participated in London Olympic Games where he reached quarterfinals, all markers of success in professional boxing. That year marked his path toward great success as an athlete. Verdeo took part in 29 bouts, winning 27 victories en route. In 2014, he earned recognition for delivering an outstanding knockout against Sergio Villanueva. Felix won his inaugural championship belt when he won the WBO Latino belt, which he successfully defended six more times over two years. It became clear to those watching that this young boxer would leave an indelible mark in global boxing history. Now let us get acquainted with KLA Rodriguez. She was born in San Juan on November 23, 1993, with the name KLA Marlene Rodriguez Ortiz, and raised by Jose and Kayla Rodriguez as one of their children. Barris Nicole was also adopted into their family, alongside Jonathan from Kayla's prior marriage. KLA was known to be both friendly and outgoing during her upbringing, performing admirably in school while harboring deep affection for animals that may lead her down a career path as a veterinarian one day. KLA was especially close with her sister Barris, with whom she shared all kinds of secrets regarding personal matters as well. KLA Rodriguez attended school alongside Felix Verdejo, her contemporary. They first met as children, but later began an intense romance during adolescence. Following Rodriguez's parents' separation in 2011, Kayla relocated to Florida, while her daughters chose to remain behind in San Juan. Though their separate lives had taken different directions for years, both sisters still shared close bonds that kept them close and shared the details of each life with one another. When an accomplished Olympic boxer named Elisa Maria Santiago Sierra became interested in dating him. At 18 years old, he met young schoolgirl and model. Elisa Maria Santiago Sierra, who at 14 was attending school but still harboring big aspirations, one being to partner with an internationally acclaimed athlete such as himself or herself. Eliza's parents did not object to this relationship. Felix, both beautiful and skilled, attracted many admirers due to his boxing success as well as media attention he received for being good-looking and skilled. Many women took an interest in him. He took advantage of any chance for casual encounters or brief affairs, even while in a relationship with Eliza, even meeting up with KLA regularly afterwards. Keisha's brother Barris and parent Kayla Rodriguez knew about Keisha's affair, yet did not approve. Furthermore, Eliza believed she was Felix's only female companion and made plans for their future together. Keisha, on the other hand, was aware that he was engaged, but Felix refused to end their relationship. Furthermore, he was her initial strong affection, while deep inside Keisha still craved acceptance as her chosen one. In 2016, boxer Anthony Jabari married Eliza, then nearly 19 years old at that time and who had already garnered significant recognition as a model with numerous followers on social media. Additionally, she had established her own beauty studio specializing in eyelash extensions. Shortly after their wedding ceremony took place in August that same year, shortly before driving his motorcycle in a hurry, an athlete was involved in a serious car accident while riding it quickly. Ricky Marquez, Felix's trainer, had serious concerns that his great athlete may lose control 
at an important juncture of their careers. Yet contrary to expectations, Felix experienced rapid healing and quickly returned to boxing ring competition. At September 2019, boxer Jose Verdejo Santiago shared a photo on social media featuring Eliza, who was far along in her pregnancy. In the caption of the photo, he stated, In the near future, I will meet my father's beloved daughter. And one month later announced her birth, Miranda Verdejo Santiago. At first glance, he appeared to be an attentive husband and loving parent. Yet unbeknownst to Eliza, he continued meeting up with Keisha without breaking off his relationship, each time emotionally promising that this relationship would end, yet each time he would promise this would end too, thus increasing Eliza's suspicions each time he promised his promise, and they would end it. But eventually, she revealed this fact through confession later. KLA attempted multiple times to end her difficult relationship, but Felix would not let go. She avoided dating other guys since Felix warned her that any time he discovered she was with another, it could have severe repercussions for both parties involved. Especially because KLA herself had developed feelings for Verdejo since high school. Their feelings continued regardless. Rodriguez pursued an animal care career and found employment at a veterinary medicine and aesthetics clinic. Her colleagues described her as hardworking. Eliza was responsible and reliable. She lived with two dogs and a cat whom she loved dearly. However, in 2020, Eliza found out her husband's involvement with other romantic partners, such as KLA. As soon as this came to light, Eliza made waves by expelling him from their house, with threats that she would initiate divorce proceedings and prevent him from seeing their daughter anymore. Eliza's warnings had an immediate impact. Additionally, at that point in KLA's athletic career, there had been an abrupt decrease, leaving no time or desire for unwanted issues to arise. For some time, he stopped seeing Rodriguez. Felix, however, still kept an eye on nearly every action of Rodriguez and attempted to monitor each interaction they had together. After some unspoken meetings, they resumed dating, and in April 2021, KLA found out she was pregnant through purchasing a quick test at her pharmacy which only confirmed what KLA already suspected. She bought quick tests there, which confirmed what she already suspected was already confirmed in KLA. KLA reached out to her sister first, as someone familiar with her connection with an athlete, for advice. Keisha did not consider abortion an option due to being 27 and being willing to raise the child independently. A few days later, she informed Felix, believing he would understand. Instead, he became angry and advised his mistress to visit a doctor immediately to determine her pregnancy, suggesting an abortion if necessary, if confirmed by medical testing. Rodriguez denied Felix's allegations, but continued to receive intimidation and persistence from him. Felix asserted that the existence of an illegitimate child could compromise his reputation, something which he could no longer tolerate. Keisha was then taken to the hospital, where her pregnancy was verified and she received an official certificate as evidence. When Keisha called Felix with the news, his response was immediate. Anger. Felix raised his voice to demand Keisha take the child immediately from her care, but she refused. Instead, Felix chose to act discreetly by raising questions and personally reviewing KLA's medical certificate before scheduling an evening meeting at an unobtrusive spot. KLA wasn't surprised. Their effort had always been to avoid drawing unnecessary attention to themselves and not cause interference with anyone's agenda. Before the encounter, Felix visited an old acquaintance named Luis Antonio Cadiz, who worked in a nearby workshop and had connections to the illicit drug trade. Felix briefly described the scenario to Luis and asked it for his assistance in resolving it with his pregnant partner. Luis had attracted the attention of police fearing prison would follow them home. Felix assured him there would be no issues, and they wouldn't go anywhere. Additionally, he promised a substantial monetary incentive and Luis agreed. Felix sought help from her partner and told KLA of his plan to meet on April 29th to discuss her pregnancy and make decisions moving forward. Keisha phoned Barris as soon as she spoke with Felix. Keisha expressed hope that Felix would accept their child and would not push for an abortion. Barris was concerned, knowing Felix had threatened Keisha before, so was fearful he might take some form of action against KLA. 
Even together, Barris and her mother attempted unsuccessfully to convince KLA not to meet on that fateful evening on April 29th. Even together, they failed in convincing KLA, of course. At the scheduled meeting time, Rodriguez came bearing a medical letter in her Kia Forte car and arrived with Verdejo in his truck, carrying Luis in its bed. Keisha promptly entered Verdejo's vehicle to present test results to him, once again discussing ending her pregnancy but being met by tears from KLA. Once this discussion occurred again, Felix struck Keisha in the head with his fist causing her unconsciousness, and an intense argument ensued between the couple before Felix abruptly hit Keisha with his fist and caused her unconsciousness almost instantly. After KLA had become unconscious, Felix used Luis to obtain a syringe filled with illicit chemicals from the glove compartment of their car and administered them directly to KLA. After transporting Rodriguez with his partner to the back of their vehicle, where there were already set out sections of wire and concrete blocks, they bound her and concealed her under a tarp in order to reduce any chance of visibility. Felix then returned to his pickup truck while Keisha took her partner's seat as they headed towards a bridge that crossed San Jose Lagoon. Once there, Felix made sure he wasn't seen while tossing KLA into the river as quickly as he could without anyone noticing. Later, however, they decided to fire several trial rounds from guns they brought along while chasing after him in order to eliminate any risk for victims of violence. When their mission had been accomplished, all returned home. Keisha's colleagues were the first to express concern when she failed to arrive at the Veterinary Medicine and Aesthetic Center the following day, knowing she is always highly reliable. Since she didn't answer their phone call or respond when called back by KLA herself, it was decided to reach out to Keisha's sister to inquire further into what had occurred. After trying several unsuccessful methods of communication with KLA, Barris decided to visit her house. There was no response at the door but thanks to an extra key, she gained entry without difficulty and found mostly starved animals who had gone 24 hours without food, giving rise to fear as Barris realized something horrific or irreparable had occurred to KLA. She called her mother and shared all details before notifying authorities of threats made against KLA. When calling Felix directly, he insisted on staying home with his family instead. Kayla Rodriguez flew from Florida to San Juan as soon as an airplane became available, fearful that her partner may have taken Keisha without permission to a confidential medical facility for an abortion procedure without her knowledge or consent. After speaking with neighbors and co-workers of Keisha Rodriguez, her missing sister, but no useful details emerged from them during this phase of investigation. Posts were put out asking anyone with knowledge regarding Rodriguez's fate or whereabouts to contact them immediately. After it became known that the girl missing was engaged to an athlete and pregnant, journalists immediately sought interviews with Rodriguez's relatives. Many expressed doubts and blamed Felix as being responsible for this tragedy, among other charges. Keisha's car was discovered abandoned on April 30th on the eastern edge of the city, still filled with her paperwork and personal items, without signs of struggle inside. On May 1st, while walking across Lagoon Bridge, Someone noticed something which seemed like human remains floating near shore. This person promptly reported this sighting to authorities who quickly located a young female corpse, likely the one everyone in town had been searching for over multiple days. Rodriguez's family members came to identify the body, holding on to hope until the very last moment that it wasn't Keisha, but unfortunately, their hopes weren't fulfilled. Though submerged for some days and showing visible changes, due to being submerged underwater for many hours. Her distinctive tattoo on her arm helped identify Keisha swiftly and identify who had killed her. When learning of this horrifying discovery, the citizens of the city reacted harshly and began organizing spontaneous gatherings demanding justice against those responsible. On that same day, Verdejo was arrested and taken to the police station for questioning, yet he vehemently denied any involvement and stated he was home with his family on the evening of Keisha's disappearance. Felix was released without charges against him. One key witness for Verdejo's alibi verification was his wife, who confirmed her husband wasn't at home during that evening of crime. 
Investigators initially examined traffic surveillance footage along the route leading up to the bridge from which Keisha had been thrown, identifying Felix's pickup truck and Kia Fort as vehicles driving near each other. It became evident that Felix wasn't driving his Kia. On that same day, Felix's vehicle was brought in for inspection. Within it, they found some hair of deceased person found within it. Louise was the first to turn herself in to police, agreeing to provide all the facts in exchange for a shorter sentence. Felix was detained as well, yet refused to participate with the investigation or respond to inquiries, even in spite of overwhelming proof against him. A gun that Felix used to shoot the victim from a bridge was recovered with valid license documentation attached. Furthermore, a mobile phone check verified all three as being present during that fateful evening. Keisha Rodriguez had her final farewell on May 8th in a funeral service which received widespread media coverage. Not only was this held to demand that those responsible be punished as legally as possible, but also to raise public awareness on gender violence issues. Her body was brought to her burial in an unconventional white carriage vehicle, while white flower petals were scattered from above. Puerto Rico was gripped with excitement after Verdejo was accused of stealing a car, abducting someone, planning murderous plots, and killing an unborn baby, crimes punishable by death sentence. However, family members of deceased ask that instead a life sentence be issued so that Verdejo may experience lifelong incarceration instead. Due to a global coronavirus outbreak, hearings for this case were frequently postponed until spring 2021 when an online trial took place. It determined that a group of individuals had committed the crime through premeditation and extreme brutality against an expectant mother. Reconstructing events from that night and its details was made possible thanks to Luis's testimony, as he did not deny his guilt. Rather, he confessed his involvement by purchasing medicine for injection upon request of his friend, as well as gathering wire and concrete blocks with which to dispose of his body. Felix repeatedly asserted his disengagement from the case, even if his statements made no noticeable impactful statements about it. Coincidentally, his spouse who testified shortly after his imprisonment has begun divorce proceedings to distance herself from the situation and focus on growing their business while raising their daughter. According to various reports, Alisa Santiago recently married again and, during an interview, revealed she had received multiple anonymous phone calls and texts with death threats and requests that both she and Miranda be killed. Miranda's spouse was suspected in this crime, but no tangible proof was ever discovered against them. In 2023, it became public knowledge that after reviewing all available evidence, and listening to testimony from all witnesses, the jury would make its final determination on Felix Verdejo and Luis Cadiz for all charges brought against them. They have both been found guilty on all allegations brought against them. Yet their respective court hearing is scheduled for mid-November 2023, with both individuals most likely receiving life imprisonment sentences without parole for killing Keisha Rodriguez and her unborn child. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Wendy OGG was born February 15, 1958. While much is not known about Wendy's early life, what is certain is that by 1978, she was living in Bellingham with her daughter Charlena as a 29-year-old single mother and attending McDonald's Beauty School to further her own education for an improved future for herself and Charlena. Whatever Wendy's motivation for learning may have been, one thing is clear. She was clearly an amazing individual with immense determination and resilience. On April 24, 1987, Wendy found herself taking a break from beauty school to visit La Paloma restaurant across the street for lunch. With spring just around the corner and hopes of relaxation high in Bellingham, Wendy likely relished this chance to stop studying for a moment and relax while having lunch with family and friends. Wendy returned from lunch with some exciting news for her classmates at beauty school. She told of a chance meeting she had at La Paloma restaurant with Mike Johnson, whom she immediately liked due to his distinguished three-piece suit and charming personality. 
Wendy revealed she planned on going out on a date with Mike later that afternoon. As the sun began to set that evening, Wendy left her daughter in the care of a trusted babysitter and set out on her journey towards Mike for their first date. With anticipation and excitement consuming her thoughts, it wasn't long until Mike and Wendy found themselves growing more comfortable with one another as the evening progressed, eventually ending up at one of Wendy's friends' homes, where they chatted until early hours of morning before calling it quits and heading off into darkness together. No one could have predicted it would be the last time anyone would see Wendy alive. Wendy had failed to come home as planned and collect her daughter, leading the babysitter of Wendy's daughter to become anxious and ultimately fearful that something was amiss. They eventually reported her missing to police and sought assistance in finding Wendy. The police acted swiftly, arriving at Wendy's house quickly in hopes of discovering evidence or leads that might help locate her. Once inside, they began their search of the house. When they reached her bedroom, they found something unsettling. Two pools of dried blood at the head of Wendy's bed, with its sheets saturated in bloodstains from two pools at its head, as well as another unidentifiable stain on its sheet soaked with blood that shocked them. It became evident that something violent had taken place within this home, and the mystery behind her disappearance had taken a dark turn. Detectives were immediately put into action upon discovering the horrific scene in Wendy's bedroom, interviewing her friends to gain any information they could gather, including interviewing Mike, her recent date who vanished with stolen cash and liquor from La Paloma restaurant where they worked bartending for two days before going missing with stolen funds and liquor from La Paloma's liquor cabinet, driving off in Wendy's 1972 Ford Torino vehicle making his disappearance even more perplexing for investigators. They knew they must find Mike as soon as possible, or else risk further investigation would further delays could ensue in finding their target's whereabouts as soon as possible. Mike had quickly disappeared from Bellingham, and they quickly discovered a promising lead. They learned of an individual entering the United States from Canada in Wendy's car the day after Mike vanished. United States Customs Authorities even snapped a photo and collected information on him. Hours after this photo was taken, Wendy's vehicle was found abandoned near Eugene, Oregon. Authorities conducted a search of the vehicle and made an unexpected find, bloodied men's pants. Additionally, they discovered a Burger King hamburger box where they were able to lift fingerprints belonging to one Darren D. O'Neill, who had an extensive criminal background that included robbery, and assault offenses. After further analysis revealed this result, detectives quickly realized Mike may be an alias used by O'Neill himself. To verify their suspicions, they obtained the job application Mike had submitted to La Paloma Restaurant and ran it through fingerprint matching software. Their hunch was proven right when O'Neill's fingerprints matched those on Mike, leaving no doubt as to his identity as being who had gone by Mike since being seen last with Wendy. Authorities were determined to locate O'Neill, but he seemed to vanish without trace. Additionally, his identity and appearance often changed frequently, making tracking him nearly impossible. Finally, in September 1987, detectives finally had success when O'Neill was apprehended in Florida on an outstanding stolen car warrant and then extradited back to Washington State, where charges for his heinous crimes would be filed against him. O'Neill faced several charges related to Robin Smith, 21, from Pierce County in Washington State, who had gone missing just four weeks prior to Wendy. Her body was discovered in May 1987. When asked by police about Wendy, O'Neill refused to reveal any information and instead refused any information regarding Robin's whereabouts or whereabouts. Two years later, in 1989, he pleaded guilty and received life imprisonment while also being found guilty for second-degree auto theft for having stolen her vehicle, thus providing some level of closure for Wendy's family and friends. O'Neill's crimes became public knowledge once again in August 1990 as another victim story emerged. O'Neill was charged with kidnapping and perpetrating unspeakable atrocities upon a 14-year-old Portland girl back in 1987. Following swift and decisive jury deliberation, 
he was handed 135 years imprisonment as punishment in this particular case alone. O'Neill's imprisonment certainly brought some measure of justice. However, his silence surrounding Wendy's disappearance was deafening. No one knew if she was still alive or where her body could be located. Efforts by authorities, Wendy's family and friends as well as Wendy herself, failed to shed any light into what had transpired with her disappearance. Instead, it seemed as if she had seemingly vanished without trace, leaving only speculation and speculation by community members regarding what may have transpired with her fateful journey. As time passed, hope of finding Wendy alive began fading, and only search for her body was left. Bellingham Police Department had given up hope of solving Wendy's disappearance, until in 2015, they received a startling report from Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory about evidence found at her home that could potentially open the case wide open. Detectives had noticed a suspicious stain on Wendy's bedsheet years before, but only now was its identity confirmed as semen stain. DNA extracted from the stain was used to create a profile, and results were final. O'Neill had already been serving a life sentence for various crimes, and now justice might finally be done for Wendy after all these years. In November 2020, the Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory informed detectives about an important development relating to Wendy O'Neill's car after it had been abandoned by O'Neill, specifically, that blood from one pair of pants found there belonged to Wendy herself. As more pieces fell into place, it became evident that O'Neill was responsible for Wendy's disappearance and likely death. Finally, in October 2022, authorities moved against him, charging him with second-degree murder of Wendy with an astonishing 10 million bail set amount. On March 1, 2023, O'Neill was extradited from Oregon, where he had been serving a 135-year prison term, and on March 10, he appeared before Whatcom County Superior Court, where despite overwhelming evidence against him, he pled not guilty, leaving the courtroom stunned in silence. O'Neill's public defense attorney Stark Fallis argued that due to its long gap since Ogg's murder, and charges being laid upon O'Neill should also be considered. Additionally, Fallis asked why O'Neill wasn't charged back then for stealing her car instead. At present, O'Neill's next scheduled appearance is set for April 5, 2023, leaving many to speculate as to its outcome. But these five cases demonstrate how justice may take its time, but never forgets. Thanks to law enforcement efforts and advancements in forensic technology that enabled investigators to solve cases once thought unsolvable, families of victims now can rest easy knowing their loved ones haven't been forgotten. Jeremiah Watkins was born August 22nd in Morgantown, Monongalia County, to James Edward Watkins and Enid Nicola, who were filled with pride at bringing into this world their precious bundle. Tragically, however, tragedy struck just four years later, with James Edward Watkins dying, leaving Enid to raise Jeremiah alone despite her grief. Nevertheless, she remained strong and loving toward him, providing all he needed as she raised their son with all their love and care she could. After their divorce, Enid was living in Terra Alta with Jeremiah and her infant daughter Jamie, only just months old at that point. But there is no evidence she remarried. Jeremiah had always found immense pleasure in doting on his baby sister, spending hours playing and making her laugh. Additionally, there was one other thing which brought him great pleasure, his beloved Kit Kat. After every tasty, crunchy bite of that sweet and salty goodness, Jeremiah felt like the happiest boy alive. To work off some calories after feasting his eyes upon its delicious sweetness, he'd explore every inch of West Virginia with his bicycle. His adventurous spirit would often lead him down different routes in West Virginia's rolling hills and valleys, just what his life needed, family love and natural splendor. However, as they hoped for it, things took an unexpected and tragic turn. One day when Jeremiah went for his usual playdate, but never returned home, Something that happened sometime during early November 1985, when West Virginia was hit with a powerful rainstorm that caused severe flooding, which destroyed roads and bridges, 
leaving authorities scrambling to assist those affected while also taking over 40 lives. Shocking. Authorities started looking for Jeremiah as soon as the floodwater receded, yet their efforts were hindered by floodwater and Jeremiah was missing for days. On November 12, 1985, Deputies discovered a shallow grave near train tracks near Terra Alta, about 30 miles from Morgantown, containing his lifeless body. Their hearts broke at this news. Initial investigations led the officers to believe the flooding had claimed another victim, but upon closer examination, they made a shocking discovery. There was a stab wound on the boy's back that revealed a violent end. Desperate to discover any leads, officers searched around. But the torrential rains and flooding had washed away any potential evidence, leaving only questions and heartbreaking tragedy as answers. Enid was left in pieces when she learned of Jeremiah's death, as she could not comprehend such a senseless and tragic event happened to her son. The pain of losing him was immense, and Enid struggled with accepting that her child may never see another day. An autopsy conducted later revealed that in addition to suffering a fatal stab wound, leading directly to his demise, Jeremiah also experienced a devastating blow to the head, which resulted in a fatal brain bleed causing his death. Due to this news, detectives launched an intensive investigation to bring justice. After interviewing many witnesses and following every lead possible, none of their efforts proved fruitful as no suspect was ever identified or arrests made, leaving the case open and unsolved for years. Yaimi couldn't help but reflect upon her brother she'd barely known, whom she only vaguely remembered. I have some memory of him, but how much do you remember at first glance? When Jaime learned the truth behind how her brother had died, it left her devastated and full of unanswered questions. Who had done this and why had it happened to him? It haunted her daily thoughts for days after. Jaime struggled with the unsolved murder of her brother Jeremiah after becoming an adult. While attending college in the early 2000s, she took action by reaching out to authorities seeking information. Unfortunately, however, their response was disheartening, as the investigation had long since gone cold. Any possibility of finding the culprit being minimal at best. Captain T.N. Ticknell of the Preston County Sheriff's Office took on the decades-old unsolved murder case of Jeremiah in February 2023 with great enthusiasm, out of compassion for Jeremiah's family being denied justice for so long, to uncover any overlooked clues that could lead to an investigation breakthrough. After hours spent poring over interviews and witness statements, he came upon David Monroe Adams, aged 18 at time of murder and living in Terra Alta. This caught his attention. Captain Ticknell noted some discrepancies in Adams's statement and decided to find and interview him again, although those discrepancies remain undisclosed. Captain Ticknell's dedication to solving Jeremiah's case led him to track down Adams that same February. With the assistance of other law enforcement agencies, he conducted several interviews with him. One interview led Adams confessing to killing Jeremiah. The pieces finally fitted together. Adams had apparently engaged Jeremiah in an argument over a stolen bicycle, which quickly escalated to violence. Adams subsequently attacked Jeremiah with a blow to the face before taking him to a nearby shed where he fatally stabbed him before tossing his lifeless body into a shallow hole that eventually led to its discovery. Detectives were overjoyed at Adams' confession to them. They finally felt as if the unsolved case that had haunted their community for nearly four decades had finally come to a conclusion. Adams was immediately arrested and charged with second-degree murder before being taken to North Central Regional Jail, where he remains held today. Enid was informed by a deputy that her son's murderer had been captured. Enid immediately reached out to Jaime to share this news. Jaime was stunned and in disbelief at being given such good news. Though questions still linger regarding Jaime's brother's demise, everyone remains hopeful for justice to finally prevail. Back in 2011, Hyannis, Massachusetts's charming seaside town, was alive with an infectious energy. On April 7, 1959, Joseph and Elisa Bellino welcomed their fourth child into this world. They named him Brad. 
the tiniest bundle of joy they'd ever laid eyes upon. Growing up, Brad became known as the baby of his family, growing up alongside two older brothers and one older sister. However, his connection with his siblings remained undisruptible, built over years of laughter, tears, and mischief-making. From an early age, Brad was drawn to adventure. His insatiable curiosity drove him forward as he explored unknown territories or tried new experiences, something which kept Brad upbeat and excited by life. Never one to back down from a challenge, Brad never hesitated when presented with one. Brad was very outgoing. We both took risks, but he often initiated them and I always agreed, explained Don Templeman, Brad's close friend and confidant. In reality, Don and Brad shared an excellent relationship. At what point exactly they became friends remains unclear, though their bond probably began after meeting at Boardman Center Middle School, where they both were students. Both shared an appreciation of adventure which bound them together. It eventually kept them apart as well. Children often rode bikes through town, discovering every corner and crevice possible. A favorite location was Boardman Mall, where they would meet friends to exchange gossip and exchange news of what's new in school life. But their thirst for exploration didn't end there. These children also hitchhiked often. The two boys shared an interest in rocks and gemstones and would visit a rock and gem shop near Brad's house frequently to marvel at its breathtaking display of rocks and minerals. Not only did their shared love for adventure bring them together, Don's father served as their coach. Soon enough, these two became regular house guests for each other. Brad and Don lived just three miles apart, making it easy for them to meet whenever desired. Don would head over to Brad's house every Friday night, where they would head off to the cinema together. Brad lived near a cinema, so every Friday and Saturday they'd walk there together, discussing new movies they were looking forward to watching and what adventures lay in wait for them over the weekend. However, on Saturdays, Brad would visit Don at Applewood Acres for a sleepover party. These two would spend their evenings playing games and talking late into the night. On Sunday mornings, Don and Brad joined his family for church, an important tradition that only deepened their bonds further. His mother would usually drive Brad home after this service was complete, before saying their goodbyes with hopes that another sleepover was soon coming up. Don and Brad found these weekends to be filled with pure happiness and friendship. They cherished every second they spent together, living life to its fullest in all its adventures. But then something devastating occurred, changing everything forever. Brad, 12, and Don, 11, who were sixth graders, were excited about having some time off school and spending it together. Soon enough, they met up and set off exploring as usual before becoming disturbed when a brown van began following them around everywhere they went. The boys first thought it was mere coincidence, but when it continued happening over and over, it turned from playful into fearful. Sensing danger, they acted swiftly to head back towards Don's house in order to escape the mysterious vehicle. At that time, it had begun to set, and it seemed wiser for them to return home after such a long day. Little did they know their day was far from over. Brad was eager to begin an enjoyable evening at Don's home when the phone rang, only for it to be answered by his father demanding that he come home immediately, before reluctantly breaking the news to Don that he needed to leave. Due to circumstances beyond his control, Don was at a grocery store when Joseph, Brad's father, called and therefore couldn't take him home as usual. Additionally, his own father was sick in bed so Brad was forced to travel alone, home from his destination. At dusk and after 7.30 p.m., Brad decided to walk back home. Before long, he bid farewell to Don, as they said their farewells and waved goodbye through the door as he left. These would likely be Don's last memories of him alive. Joseph had spent much of the evening out late, and when he returned, had no inkling that Brad was missing. He assumed he'd returned from his outing to find Brad sleeping peacefully inside, and had simply gone back out again only to be surprised to discover his world had just been turned upside down. Elisa was away on an important work trip in Cleveland during this fateful day, unaware of what was transpiring back home. On Saturday morning of April 1, 1972, which was also a Saturday, Joseph took advantage of sleeping until noon before realizing something was amiss. Brad was nowhere to be found. 
With growing concern, he called Templeman's house and learned he'd left their residence the previous evening at around 7.30 p.m. without anyone reporting him as missing. Hearing this information brought an immediate feeling of unease. Joseph dialed them immediately as well to confirm what he'd heard earlier from Brad himself. They hadn't seen or heard from him since then. Joseph's heart pounded as he hung up the phone. Where was Brad? Knowing it was urgent that he find his son quickly, Joseph immediately ran from home and began searching his neighborhood calling out his name in desperation and hopelessness until finally midday came along and Joseph made a call to 911 for assistance. He reported that Brad, whom he dearly loved, had gone missing. Soon thereafter, word spread quickly around town of his disappearance. Elisa was devastated up on hearing the news. No trace had been found of her son despot and intensive police and volunteer search, effort that included both departments. Brad's disappearance quickly reached the media, and local newspapers soon joined in the search efforts. They published a detailed description of Brad, hoping someone might recognize him. They described him as 4 feet 8 inches in height and 80 pounds in weight with striking blue eyes and short blonde hair that fell below his ears. Last seen wearing blue jeans. Tony DePolito, his first cousin from Youngstown and police officer himself, knew something had to be done when news of Brad's disappearance reached him. So he joined search efforts in Boardman with hopes of finding and returning his cousin safely home. Unfortunately, their efforts had no success as it seemed as though Brad had simply vanished into thin air, leaving his loved ones heartbroken and the community feeling vulnerable. His absence created an air of uncertainty around town, which hasn't subsided since. Paul Smith, a sanitation worker, began his regular trash collection routine on April 4, 1972, at Isali's Dairy Store when he noticed something unnerving. The dumpster was partially full with sneakers sticking up at an odd angle and partially filled. Closer inspection revealed the body of a young boy, covered in cardboard boxes from Asali's dairy store waist. His head lay downward, with his neck tightly fastened by an iron belt. Paul immediately made calls to authorities to report what he found there. Paul found himself overwhelmed by what he saw, so he immediately called the police, who arrived within moments. Once inside the dumpster and witnessed a small body lying therein, which may or may not have been that of the missing boy they had been searching for, they felt despair. They immediately reached out to Tony who had also been helping searchers locate his cousin, asking him for identification assistance in order to confirm its identification as theirs. Tony quickly arrived on the scene and confirmed the horror. The body in the dumpster belonged to Tony's beloved cousin Brad. With heavy hearts, Tony removed and transported Brad's remains to Southside Hospital for autopsy, then faced the heartbreaking task of informing Brad's parents of this devastating news. Tony described how tragic this event had been for his Aunt Elisa and the entire family. You never truly recover from something like this happening to someone close to you. Don was in school when his teacher broke the news of Brad's passing away. Shock and grief hit hard. It took several minutes before Don could even process what had just occurred. While Brad's family and friends were reeling from the shock of his tragic death, results of the autopsy were released. According to the coroner's report, Brad had been strangled to death and subjected to some form of physical abuse before passing away at 9 p.m. on Saturday, April 1st, over 24 hours after he had last been seen alive. These details only compounded their grief. Police initiated an immediate investigation to identify those responsible. As part of their efforts, Don was called into the station where he was shown Brad's clothing that matched what he was wearing when leaving Don's house. Don confirmed this was correct, and when shown his own belt found on Brad, he identified it as belonging to Brad himself. Don couldn't get his mind off of seeing a brown van on Brad's day of disappearance, which may have had something to do with his death. Don believed this might have played some part. Don, as part of his investigation into Brad's murder, suggested that someone within that van may have waited until Brad was in a dark area before seizing him. Following this tragedy, members from across town came together for his funeral, attended by pupils from his school as well as parents and teachers, all mourning his sudden departure far too soon. Almost the whole community seemed united in its sorrow, 
Sadness permeated the air in an outpouring of sadness. After Brad's death, Boardman never seemed the same again. Don and his family could no longer bear to live with reminders of this tragic event. So they decided it was time for a change and decided to relocate their family from Minnesota to Tennessee and start over from scratch. Two months after Brad's funeral service, they packed their belongings and left Boardman forever. Days turned to weeks and then months and the investigation into Brad's death seemed to progress no further. Even after following up numerous leads and interviewing several suspects, detectives assigned to this case kept hitting date ends at every turn. Tony recalls of the investigation into Brad's death as being one of absolute nothing. Overtime, hope of justice being doned for Brad wanted rapidly and eventually vanished altogether. In 2001, Boardman's former police chief, Jeffrey Patterson, refused to let Brad's case die quietly. Instead, he took bold action by reopening it, dispatching detectives to exhume Brad's body for DNA evidence collection and taking Brad's clothing as evidence for submission at the State Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, BCII. On closer examination, however, forensic scientists discovered something that dismayed them. DNA that did not belong to Brad. The discovery provided new life to the investigation as detectives set about searching for justice without compromise. Yet, despite of their best efforts, the investigation stalled for several years. In 2007, Police Chief Jeffrey decided to assign the case of Brad's disappearance to two new detectives, Jack Nichols and Bob Rupp. Nichols had grown up near where Brad went missing in 1972. At 14, he witnessed what became a tragic event, so this case had always lingered with him. Now it was finally time for justice for Brad, so he promised himself that this case would receive all his effort and dedication. Nichols and Rupp began the investigation immediately upon being assigned the task, diving headfirst into sorting through mountains of paperwork and boxes of poorly organized evidence. While this task proved challenging, the two forged ahead in making the best use of their time, looking through files, eventually noticing seven individuals' names pop up repeatedly as persons of interest that might ultimately become suspects, but without enough concrete evidence, they couldn't yet be considered such. However, Nichols and Rupp did not give up. They quickly obtained search warrants and set about serving them, collecting DNA samples from each of those involved and sending them off for testing in hopes that any would match up with what had been discovered on Brad's clothing. But their hopes were dashed when none did. None could match with Brad. Under such adversity, Nichols and Rupp were back at square one, yet they refused to give up on finding answers. Instead, they diligently combed through case files in an effort to unearth new leads. Unfortunately, their efforts yielded nothing new. After years of working on the case together, however, Nichols and Rupp retired while another team took over their investigations. Albert Kekasik led an experienced Boardman police captain team. Armed with fresh eyes and perspectives, this investigation would soon take an unexpected turn. Boardman police detectives understood that advanced technology would be required to analyze the DNA found on Brad's clothing. In 2018, they turned to Virginia-based DNA technology firm Parabon Nanolabs, which utilized familial DNA matching methods to narrow down suspects to those sharing similar physical traits or family trees. Over four years, detectives labored tirelessly gathering DNA samples from individuals identified by Parabon as possibly related to Joseph Norman Hill and performing DNA tests on them. With help of these tests, they narrowed their search to specific branches of an extended family tree while eliminating others. Eventually, all their hard work paid off with Joseph Norman Hill becoming their target. Follow this lead. Detectives worked diligently to locate Hill and collect DNA samples for testing. Testing Hill's relative revealed an almost 99.2% likelihood that Brad's clothes contained Hill's DNA, suggesting they had finally located the person responsible. Unfortunately, however, Hill passed away due to cancer and had since been cremated, which prevented further testing being conducted on his remains to ascertain his guilt. Detectives were taken aback as they dug deeper into Joseph Norman Hill's life, discovering both that he had gone undetected all these years but also his living situation at the time of Brad's murder. 
32 and living on Shadyside Drive in Boardman, with no known connections to Brad or his family, driving for a bottled water company before moving out west in 1978 for work purposes, driving truck for them until eventually moving permanently in 1978 when relocated for employment opportunities there in California. Yet no connection between him or Brad himself and Brad or his family, leaving detectives baffled. His only brush with law being an arrest charge from 1986 for disorderly conduct and solicitation for conduct related to rude acts committed in Los Angeles that year. Gina Deganova of Mahoning County Prosecution Services was charged with reviewing all the evidence compiled by Boardman Police in Brad's murder case. Her team carefully examined every piece of information until they reached an understanding that Joseph Norman Hill could present all this to a grand jury without fear. This marked a massive breakthrough for this investigation and finally allowed detectives to relax knowing their hard work had paid off. Boardman Police Chief Todd Worth revealed during a press conference held on January 24, 2023, that Brad's family had chosen not to make any public statements and requested space and privacy during this difficult period of their healing journey. Any additional disturbance from media intrusion or further disturbance would only add further distress for them and disrupt their healing journey further. Terra Alta, West Virginia's Unasiming town took it into its rolling hills, offers up an unforgettable experience. Boasting just over Watson 400 residents and plenty of charm, Terra Alta stands out as an idyllic small community. On August 9, 1980, high school sweethearts Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, both 19 years old at the time, went missing after attending a wedding reception at Concord House in Concord, Wisconsin. Over time, searchers found some clues as to where Tim and Kelly might have gone. Pants left behind by Tim in his car with wallet inside, ropes used by searchers in Concord as well as undergarment containing women's underwear belonging to Kelly. These leads ultimately led, two months later, when bodies of Tim and Kelly were found violated and left lying neglected among trees near Concord House. But nearly 30 years later, advances in DNA technology combined with an unlikely witness and an investigator's tenacious search for truth led to the identification of the perpetrator, who had gone so unnoticed by even his neighbours that no one suspected anything sinister from him. So who was this man, and why did it take so long to locate them? Our story today takes us back to Concord, Wisconsin, a small town located within Jefferson County that boasts just over 2,000 people. Concord was an idyllic town filled with parks and natural spaces, making it the ideal place for people who loved being outside. Activities such as hiking, biking, fishing, camping, and other outdoor pursuits were popular with residents. Concord boasted an incredibly low violent crime rate of just 7% during the 1980s when Tim Hack and Kelly Drew's story took place. That figure was significantly below the US average of 22.7% that decade. People didn't lock their doors and neighbours looked out for each other, precisely the type of place where Tim Hack and Kelly Drew believed they could get married, settle on a farm, raise their children, while growing old together. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew were 19-year-old high school sweethearts engaged to be married. Tim resided with his family in Hine, a small town located within Jefferson County. Kelly resided with hers in Fort Atkinson. Tim first met Kelly while attending Fort Atkinson High School. They first met again while attending Fort Atkinson Middle School together, where Kelly excelled at cosmetology, while Tim excelled as a hard-working farmer. Both were highly admired among friends and family for their kind-hearted qualities, and Tim was revered among young people, aspiring to emulate them both as individuals or couples themselves. Tim started his professional life after graduation as a farmer. His best friend was his beloved tractor, known as the Lonesome Loser. Meanwhile, Kelly attended beauty school and graduated in 1980 in hopes of becoming a hairstylist or beautician. 
Tim and Kelly attended a wedding reception at Concord House in Wisconsin on August 9, 1980, with plans of meeting friends afterward to visit a carnival, but never turned up. At 11 p.m. on August 9, 1980, when they left the reception, Tim Hack was seen leaving by anyone alive. On August 10, when no trace had been seen or heard from them since leaving reception, his father David Hack filed missing person reports for both of them and later found Tim's brown e-mobile in Concord House parking lot with $67 in his wallet locked inside, along with jacket and checkbook inside. There were speculations as to where exactly they had taken a bus ride to. On August 15th, searchers discovered Kelly's pants and underwear by the roadside about three miles from Concord House with male bodily fluids on them. Additionally, searchers discovered some ropes tied with various knots, suggesting military experience. Over the course of ten days, multiple pieces of Kelly's clothing were found within a six-mile radius from Concord House, as well as about a dozen rope pieces tied with various knots. This discovery marked an immediate transformation in the case. Suddenly, it wasn't just about finding two people who may have just decided to escape together for romantic getaway, but more about finding them alive because their lives could now be in imminent peril. Two months later, some squirrel hunters from Milwaukee were hunting squirrels near Aonia, Wisconsin, about seven miles from Concord House. As they traversed through wooded areas paralleling Highway 16 east of Watertown, they came upon Kelly Drew's badly decomposed remains near a railroad track paralleling it. She had been completely naked. As well as a hundred yards later, found Tim Hack's fully clothed male body. Both had suffered fatal stabbing wounds on their bodies, as well as ligature marks suggesting deaths by stabbing and strangulation, respectively. It became known as sweetheart murders. Investigative interviews began by conducting in-depth interviews of everyone associated with the couple to ascertain any motive for harm against them. Police interviewed attendees of their wedding reception at Concord House as well as staff. Edward Wayne. Edwards, who lived nearby but worked at Concord House as a handyman, was interrogated for clues as a possible suspect. Edward claimed not having seen them and wasn't even at Concord House around when they went missing. Instead, he claimed deer hunting in nearby woods which raised suspicion as deer hunting season typically started around November. After questioning Edward in September 1980, his wife and five children left Wisconsin for good. Investigators' most promising lead came from eyewitness accounts of a dirty-looking van parked next to Tim's car at Concord House parking lot that suddenly drove away suspiciously around the time Tim and Kelly were last seen alive. Edward owned Sucha van, which often housed his 357 revolver. However, without license plate numbers or strong evidence linking Edward to the crime scene, there were limited leads they could pursue further. As all leads for investigation were exhausted, the file was shelved and eventually forgotten about. Twenty years after Tim Hack and Kelly Drew's murders had taken place, Richard Lewell, from Wisconsin Department of Justice requested its reopening due to advances in DNA technology, which gave him hope there might finally be an answer. After digging through files, witness statements, and interview recordings for two months without success, one name stood out. Edward Wayne Edwards. Lewell and her cold case investigator team decided to pursue Edward as a potential suspect when interviewing his former neighbors from when he lived in Concord, Wisconsin. Interviewing Edward's neighbors revealed a difficult person who was short-tempered and volatile. John Edwards described his father as troubled. In 2009, April Baseo, Edward's daughter, contacted authorities with disturbing details regarding Tim Hack and Kelly Drew murders that could assist the investigation. Investigators quickly concluded the case. However, this information implicated Edward Wayne Edwards. 
her own father, who had served in the Marines for some time prior, who has an extensive criminal background. April was drawn into exploring her father's strange life due to her curiosity, wondering why their family had to move around so frequently. Later, as an adult, she came across a news article regarding the unsolved murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew from Concord, Wisconsin, around this same period, and remembered having moved from Concord shortly thereafter. This triggered more pieces of puzzle coming together and prompting April to reach out to authorities immediately. Edward Wayne Edwards was born in Akron, Ohio in 1933 and suffered at the hands of nun-run orphanages due to early parent loss. Abuse from nuns led to restless and rebellious teenagehood that manifested itself at 18 when released from juvenile detention on condition that he join the U.S. Marines, but just months after signing on, he mysteriously vanished and had to be dishonorably discharged from their ranks. Edward's life quickly took an illegal path with numerous run-ins, with police for shoplifting and breaking and entering. By 1955, at 22, he had served time at a juvenile detention centre before escaping in Akron, Ohio, and robbing gas stations along his journey across states before spending much of his twenties and thirties as a fugitive, working odd jobs, committing crimes, while enjoying notoriety from doing so. Edward refused to use any aliases when engaging in these criminal activities because he wanted his crimes to become known and famous. At 27 years old, Edward was placed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list due to suspicion for two homicides in Portland, Oregon. Though no proof was ever produced to implicate him directly in these murders, Edward already had an extensive criminal history that included robbery, vehicle theft, fraud and arson. Also possessing characteristics associated with serial killers, such as starting fires easily and exerting extreme control. Edward was arrested by authorities and jailed at the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth until 1967, when he was paroled due to good behavior and credits his personal development to a kind guard during this period of incarceration. After his parole expired, Edward married and became a motivational speaker. By 1972, at 39, he appeared on TV shows such as to tell the truth, and what's my line. Edward wrote his autobiography entitled The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, the true life story of Ed Edwards, chronicling his criminal lifestyle while reveling in its notoriety. At 44 years old, Edward committed his first confirmed murders. 21-year-old Billy Larko and 18-year-old Judith Straub in Sterling, Ohio. They had gone out on a date together, but never returned. Their bodies were later found with gunshot wounds, but investigators couldn't tie Edward to it at that time, and so he remained free. Edward continued his criminal activities after release, and by 1982, at age 49, was back behind bars in Pennsylvania on arson charges. Proud of his past accomplishments, in 1993, Edward sent letters to 19 states demanding criminal history records of individuals, including Tony Provenzano, Charles Manson, and Jimmy Hoffa, that had come across his path during their time in prison. Edward committed his third confirmed murder at age 63 when he killed Danny Boy Edwards, his foster son, who had recently returned home after serving in the U.S. Army tricking him into nearby woods, shooting two bullets directly into his face before leaving him in a shallow grave that was eventually found by a hunter. Edward was a confirmed serial killer with an increasing body count who managed to avoid capture for years. People close to him, including his children, described him as troubled and abusive, leading them to distance themselves from him. Due to this behavior and criminal history, Edward became the prime suspect 
when DNA from Kelly's clothing matched Edward in 2009. Edward Wayne Edwards was found guilty in April 2010 for the 1980 murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, receiving two concurrent life sentences. Although Edward initially requested the death penalty in Wisconsin, no such option existed at that time. Subsequently, in 2011, during a jailhouse interview, Edward confessed to another two murders from 1977, which took place. Billy Lacko and Judith Strobb's deaths had also occurred. However, these convictions received life sentences due to being unconstitutional in those years. Edward finally got his wish when he admitted killing Danny Boy Edwards, his foster son, in 2011. This act resulted in the death penalty being applied. While Edward was charged with five murders, investigators believe there could have been up to 15 victims or even more involved. Edward Wayne Edwards died from natural causes on April 7, 2011, at 77 years old, at Columbus, Ohio Corrections Medical Center, marking an end to a deadly crime spree which had claimed five lives and broken numerous families apart. Although Edward's arrest and conviction provided some closure, Kelly Walker's mother noted how it reopened old wounds, while Tim's father, David Hack, expressed relief and expressed thanks for DNA technology that identified Edward as her killer. April Baseo, Edward's daughter, who played an instrumental role in solving this cold case, now dedicates her time and efforts to providing other victims' families with closure through her podcast, The Clearing. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew had an optimistic future ahead of them that was tragically cut short when Edward Edwards killed them without provocation or personal malice. Rather, they were caught in Edward's crosshairs at an unfortunate time and place. Although Edward was ultimately arrested and sentenced, some believe he escaped full justice by dying of natural causes shortly before scheduled execution. At 4.45 p.m. on January 24, 1991 in East Harlem, New York, 13-year-old Pa Allah returned home after attending school and entered her apartment building's elevator headed toward her 30-floor unit, yet somehow mysteriously vanished during that short journey. Three hours later at around 7.30 p.m., when sunset approached on that tragic day, a passerby discovered Pa's lifeless body half a mile away, prompting questions regarding who might have been behind her disappearance and death in her community. Why did she vanish and why did her body not appear at home? Pa and her family resided in East Harlem, also known as El Barrio, situated at the heart of Manhattan in New York City. Renowned for its eclectic blend of traditions, art, and community spirit, East Harlem boasts an eclectic population with strong Hispanic-Latino roots that is evident by lively festivals, eateries, and colorful murals that adorn its streets, also home to Museum of the City of New York, which highlights New York history. Statistically, your chances of crime being committed are roughly one out of 22, which is where our story began. Paala was born in Colombia to Caesar and Olga Alera. She had two older siblings named Julio and Alexander. In June 1990, Pa moved with her mother and siblings to East Harlem in New York City in search of better opportunities. They resided on the 30th floor of an apartment building at 420 East 111th Street. Pa stayed with Uncle Guo Opina. Her father, Caesar, continued working as a taxi driver in Colombia while saving money to join his family in New York one day. As soon as they arrived in New York, Pa started attending junior high school 99 and excelling academically, according to her sister, Alexandra. Her uncle Guo described Pa as highly intelligent and mature for her age. With many plans in the future, she had many friends but few confidants compared with those at school where she resided with only a handful of classmates as friends, her goal being becoming a lawyer. According to Alexandra, she thrived academically as her focus lay in English and mathematics studies during free time. Her mother described her as highly intelligent, as well as enjoying time spent learning these subjects outside her class, with classmates like classmates as peers. 
She only had few classmates as close friends due to studying English and mathematics during free periods at school where she attended. Her uncle Guo described Pa as highly intelligent for her age while thinking beyond her years, something her uncle Guo noted because Pa delighted in New York thanks to her love of English. He noted as well as being happy because of loving the English language itself, according to him. Uncle Guo went on describing Pa as highly intelligent with plans of her own, while saying something along these lines when speaking. Of course being told the word spoken, of course being read aloud about plans of future plans. When asked by him in class on being told by him as told her Uncle Guo, that Pa said something similar on an earlier time, saying it seemed that made him extremely impressed upon hearing, of course had not occurred when learning more of course than ever would. At first, everything seemed to be going as expected for Pa and her family until an unfortunate event changed their lives forever. On January 24, 1991, 13-year-old Pa left school early and made her way home through familiar streets towards her apartment building, arriving around 4.45 p.m. via intercom call to her mother Olga, who answered and let her in by pressing the button that unlocked the lobby door. However, this would be Olga's final interaction with Pa before passing away in 1993. Paula entered the lobby and boarded an elevator, only to never arrive at their 30th floor apartment. When Pa hadn't come home after 10 minutes had passed, her brother and uncle became concerned. Something wasn't right, so they went searching for her. Upon arrival at the lobby, they found it completely vacant, searching desperately through their neighborhood, but no sign of Pa could be found anywhere. Three hours later, at approximately 7.30 p.m., while out walking his dog, he made a shocking discovery. He saw a lifeless figure lying near the East River, with items related to drugs strewn about such as vials, syringes, and lighters scattered nearby. This tragic discovery turned out to be Pa's slender body lying there after she had died, half a mile south from where she resided in an apartment building nearby. Detectives were met with a deeply saddening sight at Pia's scene. She had sustained a single stab wound in her center chest area, and further examination revealed a ligature wrapped around her neck with minimal blood pouring out from it. No evidence indicated who committed this act. All they found on Pa was a new kids on the block watch on her wrist and some chalk in her pocket. Pa's murder had an enormous impact, not only on her immediate family, but also the surrounding neighborhood. Her mother, Olga, struggled to accept the loss of her daughter. At her school, both students and teachers were devastated. Teachers held meetings with affected classmates in order to provide support in helping them cope with grief. In addition, all pupils were advised against walking alone around that area for safety concerns. As a response to this incident, reporters were not permitted access to the school and principal and district officials declined to speak with them. Detectives were left with numerous unanswered questions. They went door to door in the 32 floor building looking for witnesses who may have seen Pa in the area where her body would eventually be discovered. Unfortunately, they could not locate any. Furthermore, there was no indication as to who may have committed this tragedy, leaving it unknown whether Pei's body had been murdered at this spot filled with crack vials or elsewhere. Detectives were able to unearth several crucial details during their investigation. They learned that Pia would often stay after school hours for journalism workshops on Wednesdays and Thursdays. On the day she was killed, she was working on an article for him as a Valentine's Day gift. Furthermore, they determined that after leaving school around 4 p.m. after her workshop on First Avenue with another friend at around 4 u.m., both eventually dispersing at 106th Street, with Pia deciding she wanted to continue on to her family apartment building alone. Detectives learned through their investigations that another teenager named Aaron Wofford had entered the same elevator with Pa, yet claimed to have exited at only 19th floor while Pa continued ascending the tower. As a result, detectives changed their focus away from him as a suspect. An autopsy showed the full extent of Pa's ordeal. She had been violated, strangled, and stabbed three times near her heart in addition to this mark being observed by medical examiner. Pa had shown great courage in resisting an assault, with her attacker using force to separate her legs, leaving bruises that mirrored their fingers on both thighs. 
Additionally, an examiner collected male hair from Pa's body. This evidence would be stored. On February 2, 1991, Paola Pa was laid to rest at St. Michael's Cemetery in East Elmhurst, Queens, four months after her tragic murder. Victim services was there for them when they relocated to Flushing, New York. Olga found solace through counseling at Families of Homicide Victims Program, operated by Victim Services. She and the rest of her family also held on to hope that Pa's case might yet bring justice. But as time progressed and justice seemed further away than ever, their journey for answers became more challenging than ever. Murder of a 13-year-old girl should have been an explosive news story anywhere and at any time. Yet in New York of 1991, it largely went unnoticed. Between 1990 and 1992, New York City reported over 2,000 murders annually, with six bodies found daily across its five boroughs. Most occurred in impoverished, predominantly minority neighborhoods such as East Harlem, the South Bronx, or East New York in Brooklyn. Unfortunately, very few cases like these received significant media coverage. Instead, more upscale crimes involving white victims or wealthy victims located elsewhere than East Harlem or East New New York, Brooklyn. Without media or political pressure, Paya's case quickly became low priority and her murder remained unresolved and forgotten for much of the 1990s. By mid-1999, crime rates in New York City had decreased, but East Harlem housing projects saw an alarming trend develop involving several seemingly unrelated assaults and killings of young, attractive teenagers with large-scale DNA evidence connecting Iran to six out of seven cases. John Earn and Richard Plansky presented an impressive case against Iran during his fall 2000 trial, offering testimony and DNA evidence against him. Prosecution witnesses included two victims, as well as 13 prosecution witnesses overall, with Iran himself taking the stand first as his defense witness and then testifying over two days. During these sessions, he displayed emotions ranging from giggling like a schoolgirl to crying like an infant. Furthermore, he expressed his disdain at being prosecuted as well as anger towards being tried. His monologue, mostly uninterrupted by judge or attorneys, or his own attorneys alike, covered topics including pop culture, drugs, rap music, jail food issues, as well as reflections upon criminal justice systems. Iran presented an elaborate defense before his trial began in 2000 for his violent serial violence against young women. He maintained that police conspired against him as part of an elaborate cover-up scheme orchestrated by an organ-harvesting medical examiner he suspected was involved with harvesting and selling human organs, even asserting that his DNA had been altered through what he termed genetic shuffling. However, when the jury rendered its guilty verdict on December 16, 2000, they burst out into cheers and relief. As Iran was led past a crowd of grieving relatives, he directed an impolite curse at them. At his sentencing a month later in January 2001, family members of Iran's victims had the opportunity to address him directly. Olga Pa's mother addressed Iran directly and conveyed to him her wish that he understood their torment. Sleepless nights, loss of appetite, inability to walk or breathe properly, lack of peace all while thinking of her daughter's suffering at her death. She expressed her pain at having brought her daughter here from Russia as they pursued American dreams together with her daughter Olga, spoke directly about her daughter having brought her daughter here from Russia as she spoke of her pain due to her having brought her daughter here from Russia as she talked about her family. Iran wept openly as he spoke at his sentencing hearing, offering his apology and saying that he felt responsible. At that moment, Joas Castro's male cousin became infuriated and attempted to leap over the barrier so as to attack Iran directly. Justice Joan Sedan then rendered her verdict. She issued three life sentences without parole for each murder, as well as four 400-year sentences for four counts of abuse against Iran, who was then sentenced at Clinton Correctional Facility, located in Dannemora, New York. Before Iran's sentencing, lawmakers in New York and many other states had passed laws mandating DNA testing for individuals arrested in relation to violent crimes. Since then, DNA testing has expanded to cover most felony arrests, spanning both violent and nonviolent offenses, 
and even some jurisdictions have instituted testing of individuals arrested on misdemeanor charges. Olga's anguish over Pa's sudden and senseless death remains fresh. She understands well the trauma caused by such sudden loss doesn't fade with time, especially if there are unanswered questions. We journey along Pa's heartbreaking tale as Iran commits crimes such as these heinous ones against society, leaving us to ask what drives such behavior and how can society identify and address such triggers. At 2 a.m. on October 31st, 1991, in Tyler, Texas, as the fall season settled in, it struck two. Everyone was asleep in their beds except a small framed house on 29th Street at this peaceful moment, unaware that it would soon become the scene of horror for eight-year-old Chad Choice who lay dreaming away when an intruder silently entered and abducted him out into the darkness of night. Initial considered as a runaway case due to lack of evidence, this case shifted into an investigator's nightmare when 48-hour window closed without Chad returning home. His captors may have found ways into his home without leaving any trace, taking him without trace, or ever returning for reunion with family and return, but the primary question still stands. Would Chad ever rejoin them and return home? Tyler, Texas, named after John Tyler, 10th President of the United States, is one of the largest cities in northeastern Texas and often known as Rose City due to its extensive rose production, cultivation, and processing history. Each October, it welcomes thousands of tourists. However, October 1991 brought unexpected sadness, as Chad Choice mysteriously vanished without trace, souring an otherwise vibrant atmosphere. Ernest Chadwick Choice, affectionately known as Chad Choice, entered this world on April 26, 1983, in Texas. As one of four cherished children living within his household, Chad was highly loved by both family and particularly his mother, Karen Elaine Choice. Chad was known to make many friends easily and enjoyed spending quality time with them. Furthermore, his bond between siblings was evident and they often spent quality time together. Chad was known for his energetic and playful nature, as evidenced by his frequent visits to the playground. Chad had an older sister named Angela Choice, who recalls that Chad loved riding bikes, scaling trees, and engaging in sports. Details on any further siblings have yet to be made public. Chad was just eight years old, attending Mommy G. Griffin Elementary School when his life took an unexpected and tragic turn. Destiny often plays havoc, and unfortunately, Chad's destiny had already been determined. On October 31st, 1991, my birthday, the daily routine of the Choice family was abruptly altered. While preparing to attend church services and drink coffee and read, as is often my custom on such days, without disturbing Chad or his siblings, Karen rose early and went to church without waking them. As planned. Just minutes into her service, however, she received a phone call from my daughter, asking where Chad had gone, to which I replied no, instead leaving him at home as planned, and she asked why I hadn't brought him along, to which she replied she searched everywhere but couldn't find him anywhere. Finally, she told her church service that her time of peace had run out, leaving Chad at home on their own accord. Karen returned home and immediately began searching the neighborhood for Chad, seeking assistance from neighbors as well. However, their collective search efforts proved fruitless, as Chad appeared to have vanished without trace or even seeming to disappear entirely into thin air. At first we thought he was just playing a trick on us and were wandering around looking up at trees to see if he was there, but something kept bothering me. Something kept feeling off about this whole situation. Now it was the police's turn to investigate. Karen dialed 711 and reached Tyler Police Station. Sergeant Bill Ging quickly arrived at their house soon afterward for his initial inspection, where he looked for signs of forced entry, 
struggle, or pry marks on their door. None were detected during this initial assessment. Jing began to wonder whether Chad might have fled home. Her initial investigation suggested this possibility. No signs of forced entry or ransacking were apparent at any point during our inspection of this building. None of the indicators that might point towards crime scenes. Karen had long held on to the belief that her son had been abducted, and as the sun set and day turned to night, her anxiety turned into fear. Fear sets in as you wonder what's happening and who he may be with, knowing it's getting dark outside and that he should come home soon. Fear gripped her heart even further as forty-eight hours had gone by without any sign of him. Of course, this rule of thumb doesn't always hold true, but generally, if something hasn't been resolved within forty-eight hours of becoming apparent, it will likely become harder and harder to tackle later on. Angela Choice provided a key piece of information during her interview with Detective Coat. She claimed her house keys had gone missing the day prior, recalling placing them by the back door of Chad's residence. This revelation raised serious concerns, suggesting the possibility of kidnap, kidnap for hire, or something even more troubling. Two days after Chad disappeared, Greg Sterling, Chad's uncle, discovered a ransom note at his business. Although hopes that Chad was alive were diminishing by this point, so another demand seemed very odd to us, thus prompting our investigation to quickly focus on kidnapping scenarios instead of waiting around, hoping he might resurface alive. As the family tried to deliver their money at the Greyhound bus station as instructed, their kidnapper did not appear. Shortly afterwards, however, our hopes were revived, only for that momentary renewal to quickly fade and remain unfulfilled as time went on and they failed to appear. Chad's mother received an anonymous phone call revealing that Chad had vanished due to an ongoing drug debt with Paco, who owned three Colombian drug dealers located nearby, Paco Jr., Carlos and Greg Sterling, who collectively owed over $20,000. Although these discoveries provided insight into potential motivations behind Chad's disappearance, no definitive resolution had yet been found in his abduction case. On the one-year anniversary of Chad's disappearance, Karen Choice found a note on her car windshield asserting that Chad was still alive and demanding $66,000 to bring him home safely. This development reignited their investigation, giving hope to Karen Choice's family that their son might yet return safely. Unfortunately, however, that hope was dashed when his kidnapper failed to contact them once more, and the case became moribund again. Time was against them. Each passing year reduced Chad Choice to an open case, as his disappearance turned cold case. Four years later, in October 1995, an unexpected package arrived on their doorstep that seemed harmless enough. Upon opening it, however, something that would haunt Karen Choice forever became evident. There was an actual human skull inside. Part of me thought, this could be Chad, while another part said, nope, Chad is still here and alive. After providing Choice with DNA samples from her family members for analysis, the skull was sent back to the FBI for examination. DNA testing on samples taken from these relatives allowed for comparative purposes between the samples that came back. Although our DNA experts performed tests to identify Chad's skull, their efforts proved inconclusive. Therefore, the skull was shipped off to a university in Texas for further forensic anthropological analysis. Sometimes, especially in cases involving children where there are few medical or dental records available, we might use alternative techniques if we think we know who the remains represent. For instance, we might request photographs of that individual in an attempt to compare skeletal remains with them 
and see which matches best. Karen was devastated to learn of Chad's fate after forensic analysis confirmed his skull belonged to him. Detectives struggled to comprehend a person capable of not only perpetrating a crime, but continuing to terrorize victims' families for years afterwards. All Karen knew was that Chad would never see another day alive and was forced to pray for justice in his behalf. Whoever was responsible for placing such an unsettling act at our family's doorstep sparked something deep within me. An anger that I hadn't experienced before rose up within me. I needed to figure out who this person was before any more time could pass. As Chad Choice's case became harder and harder to solve, another story began unfolding at Smith County Jail in early 1996. Patrick Horn was scheduled to be sentenced in federal court for credit union robberies and carjacking, in addition to murdering fruit stand owner J.C. Lazor. Credit union has been targeted for theft yet again. Two masked men with weapons enter, wearing masks, quickly rush into the tellers, catching them off guard, and demand money. It was our belief that likely these same two people had done this again, as two black males entered, wearing masks similar to previous incidents. As it became apparent that he would spend the remainder of his life behind bars or face potential execution, this man became central to Chad Choice's murder investigation when he mentioned his name during his time behind bars. Although this might have been part of a plea bargain agreement or just accidental discovery by police investigators, for them, this marked an important breakthrough in their investigations thus far. Horn was a resident in Chad Choice's neighborhood and close friend. During an interview regarding Chad's death, Horn informed investigators of who killed Chad. According to Horn's account, Chad was murdered by two Colombian drug dealers known by their street names Paco and Carlos. However, this claim would soon prove incorrect. The truth would soon emerge as this story became even more intricate. After Horn made his statement, he received in his jail cell a package containing Chad's leg bone for analysis. Jailers intercept this package addressed to Pat Horn and discover what appears to be a leg bone and a note threatening him if he divulges any information on Chad Choice. In such an event, they'd kill either himself or his family members. Horn told police that Paco and Carlos had sent the package, yet detectives felt like something was amiss with his story. After multiple questions from them, Horn insisted he had no more information other than Paco and Carlos being the culprits. Horn finally revealed something additional on May 31, 1996. He revealed to us that he had assisted Paco and Carlos with digging a grave for Chad at their instruction. He claimed to us that he too was victimized by this crime, as his only involvement was helping bury Chad. He added, Essentially, all I'm guilty of here is helping burying him. Any involvement beyond this was strictly incidental. Horn then revealed the exact location where Chad was interred, prompting police officers to accompany him directly to 401 Sunnyside in Tyler, Horn's personal backyard. Pat Horn was always known for exaggerating and exaggerating his involvement with these guys, therefore it fueled suspicion about whether or not he really was as involved as claimed. It opens the door for us to view him as potentially being involved far more than is indicated by what he tells us. Some agents and officers dug deep. After hitting a plastic bag, they continued digging deeper until they located bone fragments and clothing items. At 4 hydrant p.m. that same day, detectives began digging and discovered Chad's remains along with several. Caliber shell casings, this discovery marked a sudden shift in their investigation and all suspicion now rested with Patrick Horn. In June 1996, investigators immediately traveled to Athens in Texas and to a jail cell where an important piece of the puzzle would sit. 
one who would aid in conclusively solving this case. Athens police had taken advantage of an opportunity when we conducted a rigorous interview with him in custody and encouraged him to come forward with information. Eventually, he made his choice known. Keaton Horn was Patrick Horn's brother, who had recently been charged with violating probation terms and faced charges related to this infamous crime. With Keaton's statements as evidence, this case became concrete proof that Horn was indeed behind this misdeed. He admitted digging up and mailing Pat in jail some bones from her leg, with instructions to make the letter look like it came from Paco and Carlos as threats against Pat. Keaton demonstrated how Paco and Carlos hadn't reached out to Pat in order to threaten him. Rather, Pat himself reached out in an effort to appear threatened, which proved invaluable as an evidence break in this case. Horn's scheme to mislead investigators had finally come undone, and the solution to what had seemed an unsolvable case was finally in reach. One question still lingered, though. Why had Patrick Horn gone to such lengths, kidnapping Chad, refusing the ransom offer, and ultimately taking his life? Could you shed light on why someone could commit such an atrocious act, and do you believe his mother will ever find peace again? Please share your views. We welcome hearing them all. On January 5, 1997, in her 23rd floor apartment in Bronx, New York City, USA, Rosemary Penta, an elderly school teacher aged 64, was enjoying her day off when tragedy struck on January 6. One of Rosemary's neighbors noticed that Rosemary's lights had been on since midnight of January 5. When she decided to check up on her, she came face to face with an unspeakable scene. Rosemary Penta's cold, lifeless body lying untouched on her kitchen table amid bloodied evidence from where she had come. Before calling the authorities, this neighbor collapsed to the floor sobbing in horror at what could only be described as an act of extreme cruelty towards an elderly school teacher. Who could have committed such an anus crime against such a vulnerable individual? Today's case takes us to Bronx, one of New York City's boroughs. Co-op City in the Bronx is widely known, while other notable attractions in this borough include Yankee Stadium, Bronx Zoo, and New York City Botanical Gardens. Bronx offers affordable rent while being close to other high-end boroughs like Manhattan. However, the Bronx does have its share of risks. Only 14% of U.S. neighborhoods are safer than it with violent crime rate, 1 Wyoming 28, making it a highly dangerous location. Rosemary Pente, born July 28, 1932, and living alone at 140 Alla Place in Co-op City of the Bronx for 25 years before moving out and marrying at age 70, was brutally murdered on March 10, 1997 in her own apartment. Although little is known of her early life or relationships, it is certain she never married and mostly kept to herself for most of her adulthood. Although she led a quiet existence with only occasional outings with some neighbors in her building and school teaching, as her occupation, Eventually, though, her life became monotonous until one fateful morning when Rosemary would emerge and would spend time talking with neighbors, whom she had become close over time and would come out and see people she knew from before, leaving on March 10, 1997, when she would step outside, one last time before leaving. On January 5, 1997, in the Bronx, it was an unusually cold day, so Rosemary decided to stay at home. Unfortunately, on Monday morning, January 6, 1997, she never arrived for school where she worked despite repeated phone calls, disruption of pin-drop silence in her apartment, no answer from Rosemary on her cell phone number and lights staying on all night in Rosemary's apartment. This raised concern from one of Rosemary's neighbors. When no response came back during the day, they decided at 6.15 p.m. to check up on Rosemary before leaving her own apartment and checked up on her in her apartment and found Rosemary and decided on her behalf, at 6.15 p.m. that evening came knocked on Rosemary's doorbell. Rosemary was home when they found her at 6.15 p.m., where they found her. Beginning when she arrived at Rosemary's apartment door, her neighbor felt unnerved by its proximity. As soon as she entered, however, 
Her worst fears came true when she entered Rosemary's kitchen and saw Rosemary lying lifeless in a pool of blood, prompting shrieks of horror before quickly notifying the authorities, who soon after sent out Detective George Wood and Sergeant Curtis Oates from New York Police Department to inspect the crime scene. She called out for Rosemary but received no answer. While searching the apartment, she happened upon the kitchen area where Rosemary lay dead with multiple stab wounds on her body, still lodged deep into her back, proof that Rosemary's death must have been extremely agonizing for those present. Detective Wood remembered finding up to 25 stab wounds on Rosemary, including several in her neck area and one or two wounds to her head, with defensive wounds on her right hand, suggesting she fought with someone before succumbing. Additionally, Rosemary's throat had been cut open, as evidenced by defensive bruises on her hands, suggesting resistance from Rosemary herself against their attacker. As the two engaged in their struggle outside Rosemary's apartment in the lobby, detectives discovered more evidence to back their theory. Blood stains on a wall near an elevator but no trace inside led them to search the staircase of their building. On the tenth floor there was another trail of blood leading up a flight of stairs. This gave rise to their belief that at some point during their struggle, Rosemary had managed to wound her attacker during a struggle between the two parties. Detectives were convinced that the blood found smeared across an elevator wall and staircase 13 floors below Rosemary's apartment belonged to her killer, giving detectives an idea of how he might have left. At first they considered taking an elevator with blood-covered hands to press its button while leaving a trail on the wall, but maybe someone in it suspected them as it took too long or someone saw through their messy appearance. Therefore, it seemed best for them to take the stairs instead and leave without being noticed. Exactly what happened. Bloodstains were strong evidence in Rosemary's murder case, yet didn't provide detectives with enough clues as to who might have committed it. Samples were collected and preserved for future testing and use. An autopsy later confirmed she had been stabbed 39 times. Eight wounds had occurred on her back alone. Furthermore, the knife found jammed into Rosemary was part of a kitchen set belonging to Rosemary herself, which led investigators to conclude her murder likely was not premeditated. They theorized that when Rosemary's attacker entered her apartment, initially they didn't intend to kill her, but when a struggle ensued they did so anyway, and since several items were missing from Rosemary's place it appeared like theft was their motive for doing so. Soon after Rosemary was murdered, her funeral was held at Granby Cemetery, Hartford County, Connecticut, USA, with family and friends present to pay their respects and lay her to rest. Unfortunately, months passed with no significant progress being made on this case despite strong evidence and theories to follow. Soon enough, though, New York police departments diverted their focus away from Rosemary and focused instead on another murder investigation. Her case went cold. More than two years later in May 1999, Detective Kevin Lawler from the NYPD Cold Cases Squad was assigned Rosemary's case and began reviewing its feel. While doing this research, he developed an idea for moving forward with it. He requested that any blood found at the crime scene be entered into CODIS to compare with any samples provided from known persons who have provided DNA samples. Detective Lawler sought assistance from Detective Mark Tans in re-examining blood samples found on the elevator wall and staircase and developed a DNA profile of Rosemary's killer that could be uploaded into CODIS a nationwide database. They now had only to wait and hope for a match. Detective Lawler received word from the New York Police Crime Lab that blood recovered at Rosemary's crime scene had matched with that of Charles Jones, 28 years old at that time, through CODIS. Detective Lawler had long anticipated this phone call, and once he received it, he wasted no time investigating further into Jones's genetic link to make sure nothing had been overlooked. After performing a background check, he found some very startling information, or learned of Jones's extensive criminal past, including a past robbery where he attacked his victim with a knife. At first, Jones wasn't suspected in Rosemary's killing. However, since he had been imprisoned after pleading guilty to robbery and assault charges committed against another Co-op City resident on August 13, 1998, he was required to submit a DNA sample before being released on August 10, 2001.
CODIS accepted Jones's DNA profile on August 20, 2001, and found it was consistent with that belonging to Rosemary's killer. At the time of Rosemary's murder, he lived nearby in Co-op City. Though this evidence strengthened Detective Lawler's case against Charles Jones, it still wasn't enough for her to charge him with Rosemary's murder. Although blood sample evidence placed him within Rosemary's apartment, where the killing had taken place, creating another challenge and prompting additional information and proof. To put Jones behind bars, theory states that the perpetrator of this homicide entered the building with intent to rob someone, looking for an opportunity to gain entry to someone's apartment. Since his blood had traveled some distance before arriving at that fifth floor hallway, they sought to understand how it got there. After unsuccessfully tracking him down through his parole officer and discovering an arrest warrant against him, their plan became to collect him up and talk with him directly. Unfortunately, when they arrived at Jones's apartment, they learned he wasn't there, but his family had covered for him. As soon as the detectives arrived at Jones's place, they were informed that he wasn't home at that moment, so they should come back later since there wasn't any solid evidence against him yet. Being extremely cautious about their case was imperative. One misstep could mean everything going downhill quickly. They wanted no member of Jones's family learning why they were visiting. Any news could give him another opportunity for escape. As a precautionary measure, they left a message for Jones, saying they wanted only to speak with him in regards to an outstanding traffic violation issued earlier. Two days later, Jones took the bite and came into the precinct to discuss his traffic violation. What followed next was key, as Jones would soon discover the real purpose for questioning. Detectives tried to create an inviting environment before confronting Jones directly. They offered lunch and soda as comfort measures before beginning interrogation after just 30 minutes of being friendly towards Jones. When asked by detectives if he had ever been at a 140 Alcott place, Jones initially denied it, but after hearing that his blood had been discovered there at the same time as the murder, he changed his story and claimed he used to deliver groceries and had cut himself on a shopping cart, thus possibly accounting for why his blood could be found there at that same moment as murder occurred. After being pressed further by detectives who asked how this could possibly explain itself, he eventually admitted being inside the building for a while prior to confessing. At first, Jones was still not fully cooperative, prompting detectives to question and interrogate him extensively. They even showed him images from the crime scene to try and induce a confession from him. Finally, after hours of interrogation, he finally confessed and proposed a plea bargain offering an eight-year term in exchange for his confession. According to Jones's account of what transpired that night, Rosemary attacked him first and claimed self-defense as the motive. Detectives, however, had their doubts regarding Jones's story, as it seemed unlikely that such a physically powerful individual like Jones could defend themselves against such an elderly and much smaller woman like Rosemary Pacente. Jones was nonetheless arrested for robbery, in Rosemary Pacente's death. Charged with robbery but eventually plead guilty and received 19-year sentence in January 2002 for first-degree manslaughter conviction, pled guilty on January 11, 2002 to first-degree manslaughter charges related to Rosemary Pacente's death. Charles Jones's capture provided relief to many Bronx residents, particularly Rosemary's neighbors and friends. Her case had remained an unsolved mystery for nearly four years. Detectives used DNA technology to solve even more cold cases and bring justice for victims and their loved ones. Jonas confessed differently than what had been Theory Zed, raising questions as to whether he was withholding information from authorities. Jones was linked to another assault from 1998, prompting further questions as to whether there might be additional incidents where Jones went undetected. Crystal Rogers lived in Bardstown, Kentucky, with her partner Brooks and two-year-old son Eli, as well as four additional children she had from her 2015 marriage, and that ended shortly before the incident occurred. Bardstown is widely known as the bourbon capital worldwide, but with only 14,000 residents. Crystal was Tommy Ballard and Sher Ballard's youngest child. By all accounts, they were extremely close. Crystal worked two jobs to ensure her children's well-being was taken care of properly. 
Crystal, Eli, and Brooks visited his parents' 245-acre farm over 4th of July weekend 2015. Crystal dropped two children off with her ex-husband before leaving two with babysitters on July 4, 2015. Brooks awakened early with Eli beside him, but found no trace of Crystal. Even her car wasn't in the driveway. However, Brooks didn't report this mysterious disappearance at first, since he wasn't concerned she might just have gone out with friends late into the night before returning later than expected in the morning. Apparently, though, as it often did happen from time zone differences or simply not making their return time. After numerous unsuccessful attempts to reach her on July 3rd, Crystal's family became extremely worried. Her mother, Sherry Ballard, reported her missing two days later on July 5th. The newspaper reported that she told Brooks she would take her to the police to report her as missing, and he agreed that it was the appropriate thing to do. Tommy Ballard found her maroon 2007 Chevrolet Impala with a flat tire near mile marker 14 of the Bluegrass Parkway on 5 July. Keys still inside its ignition, as well as her purse and cell phone had been left inside. Crystal's car was found with its driver's seat shifted out of its usual place, and her family quickly realized she wasn't driving alone. Unfortunately, finding her vehicle did not yield any useful leads on where to look for her. Eventually, her family announced a 25,000 reward for information leading to her abduction. Cher Ballard of her family offered with tears in his eyes, We love her, and hope we can find her, with tears running down his cheeks, adding, But until then, we just hope she can be found. Community involvement was immense as strangers and relatives from far and wide set out searching every inch of Nelson County and its surroundings for victims. Sammy Johnson of the Ballard family stated, We have searched every inch of water, home, farm, and well, as well as wells and sinkholes where she may be. According to reports, they held strong suspicions against Brooks for being involved with Crystal's disappearance. Crystal's sister claimed in an interview that Brooks never offered to search or help the family of Crystal, or assist with search efforts in any capacity. Brooks admitted their relationship was tenuous, but strongly denied any responsibility in her disappearance, stating, I am totally innocent of this. In spite of criticisms from Crystal's family, he claimed he was helping out in some form with search efforts in the background. After Crystal's vehicle was located on July 8th, Brooks was brought in for investigation by Nelson County Sheriff's Office and told they he and Crystal were on a date the evening she last seen. Brooks stated they fed cows, went for a late-night walk, and returned home only to sleep together in bed when Crystal had already been using her smartphone to access social media apps on her device. His narrative did not add up or make sense in other aspects. At nightfall, it had rained heavily, and it made little sense for Brooks and Crystal to walk in a field together at that same time. Nelson County Detective John Snow was conducting the investigation, noting the disparities in their narrative, yet Brooks insisted he had no part in her disappearance. John Snow questioned Brooks in the taped interview regarding an early morning call with an unknown number. The night Crystal disappeared. Brooks, Crystal, and the children had been traveling home in their car at that time when this call came through. Detective Snow questioned Brooks as to who had called, and Brooks reluctantly revealed the number belonged to Steve Lawson, whom Brooks revealed was one of Steve Lawson's employees. Brooks admitted to Detective Snow that he could not recall why Steve had called so long ago, prompting her to have Brooks contact Steve directly in the interrogation area. Steve claimed he called Brooks about rental property. Brooks told him to speak to Katie, who would follow up with Steve following their conversation. But Brooks immediately corrected him by informing him it should have been Crystal instead. Detective Snow questioned Brooks on why he told Steve Lawson that Crystal would call back later when she was sitting right beside him in his vehicle at that moment. Brooks offered as an explanation that he did not want to disturb Crystal during her work-related issues and not pester her with unnecessary phone calls or messages. Nick Hal, Brooks's brother and a Bardstown police officer, was the one who first contacted Brooks via his cell phone when aware that he was being interrogated by detectives. Nick advised his sibling not to contact police. Nick had been summoned by officials from his city the previous evening 
to testify before an unidentified grand jury. This led police to suspect his possible involvement with Crystal's death. At this stage, Nick could no longer cooperate with the sheriff's office. However, after being interrogated by Kentucky State Police, he agreed to undergo polygraph examinations. After being approached with the FBI, Nick finally took an exam for polygraphs on 20th of July. When confronted by what the examiner found from his test results, Bardstown Police Chief McCubbin raised grave concern with him over what had transpired from them and claimed Nick had lied during their examination, upon which Nick responded by declaring, I don't care what your computer results say about me, being considerate an untrustworthy liar, and I don't appreciate being called one by others. Tommy and Sherry Ballard, Cristal's parents, started seeking custody of two-year-old Ely, the child she shared with Brooks. On August 8, 2015, at court hearing, they finally saw Brooks again after Crystal disappeared. Tommy said afterward, During eye contact between me and him, there was eye contact between us both. My grandchild seemed content that day compared with any others around him, and thus the decision was made at that time that Eli would stay with Brooks. Three months after Crystal was reported missing, authorities from Nelson County Sheriff's Office declared her deceased on 16 October 2015 at their press conference. Nick Hall was fired from Bardstown Police Department due to interfering with their investigation of Crystal's disappearance. Police accuse him of warning his brother about an interview and instructing them not to talk with the detectives. Nick later informed Kentucky State Police that he only spoke with his brother to inform them they may be trying to scare him and that he needed to take measures in order to safeguard himself. Kentucky State Police officially charged Brooks as an individual involved with Crystal's disappearance this October, with eight documents that led them to believe he was their main suspect in direction. Hal denied these accusations against him. My family's name has been ruined over an issue that does not pertain to me and requires lots of energy and effort. Driving past without appearing as though I am being dishonest is becoming tiresome and unreasonable since there is no reason for an attorney, since I am innocent. For me, this seems ridiculous. For myself, this situation seems ridiculous. Police released video footage of both Hal brothers' interviews. Additionally, in December 2015, the local paper announced that police had arrested Danny Singleton on 38 counts of false swearing for lying under oath before an unnamed grand jury investigating Crystal's disappearance investigation. Singleton is close associate and long-term employee of Brooks. After being held for six months, he pled guilty and was released. An investigator from a private firm discovered a white Buick to be key evidence after discovering it was in the garage at Hal Farm on the night Crystal disappeared. Evidence showed Anna Whitesides owned an white Buick that she sold shortly after Crystal vanished. Police issued a subpoena requiring the 82-year-old woman to appear before a grand juror for questioning in June 2016. Subpoenaed for use as evidence disposal, the car was cleaned out and offered for sale to prevent evidence being discovered. Anna Whitesides invoked her Fifth Amendment rights and refused to testify before an impartial jury for fear that giving testimony would incriminate herself further. Whiteside's lawyer, Jason Floyd, informed the court, In a high-profile, fast investigation case such as this one, many things could come together to trap an elderly woman like Whiteside's who is 82 years old, according to Mr. Floyd. Anna Whiteside's confession and vehicle details were enough for police. A judge decided to keep any legal proceedings regarding Whiteside's confidential, although Crystal has never been found or charged with her disappearance. Crystal was missing for approximately one year prior to August 2016, when police conducted a more intensive search using 14 dead dog teams across 300 acres in search of Hal Family Farm and Crystal. John Snow reported, There may have been an incident involving Crystal on Hal Farm. Hal Farm. Anna Whiteside's house, as well as those of Nick Hal, his brother and Rosemary Hal, were examined in order to uncover evidence such as DNA or human remains. Jon Snow stated afterwards, I am optimistic. I believe we are heading in the correct direction, although this journey has been long, but I feel we're getting closer. 
Brooks's then-lover Crystal Morin was arrested after she was caught ripping down signs supporting Crystal Rogers' case and family in Bardstown. Following Crystal Rogers' disappearance and her family's dispersal from Bardstown, signs supporting them could be found all around town and were stolen by Crystal Morin. Sherry Ballard expressed her opinion. Crystal could have apologized by simply saying, I apologize for my actions, but instead tried to defend herself with false claims of guilt instead of apologize. Instead, she attempted to defend herself with accusations. Tommy Ballard searched daily for Crystal and even initiated an independent investigation on her behalf. Thirteen months after Crystal disappeared on November 19, 2017, her devoted father prepared to embark on a hunting excursion at Ed Brent Lake property with their 12-year-old grandchild and attendant. Tommy Ballard was attacked by an individual and shot in the chest. Unfortunately, he did not survive his injuries and passed away at 54. Nelson County Coroner's Office has reported that Crystal's father was shot once before the bullet exited through his back. Sure Ballard believed he had been shot while close to finding their daughter, whom had gone missing. According to newspaper accounts, his death may have been related to searching for their missing child. Cher Ballard had long been obsessed with finding his wife Crystal and was the prime figure in their search efforts. He believes that he was targeted, having seen himself being watched over for weeks prior to being shot dead. Anna Whiteside's home was searched after she was shot dead, yet nothing was discovered there. Commissar Rick Sanders hired two retired troopers to investigate a series of high-profile and unsolved cases in Bardstown and surrounding areas, including her murder. Crystal Ballard, as well as her dad. Tommy Ballard had died recently, and this caused them to go in search of any information regarding it. At that time, Crystal's mother was trying to gain custody over Eli Crystal's youngest son, as Brooks was sole guardian of him. Nelson Circuit Judge Stephen Hayden issued his final ruling regarding this custody dispute and found there to be clear and convincing evidence of strong hostility between Brooks and members of the Ballard family such as Brooke's mother, and that could cause psychological harm for their child. Cher Ballard filed a petition with her late husband's estate seeking grandparent visitation rights shortly after Crystal went missing, telling local papers, I have done all that the court requires of me, yet still cannot visit my grandson. My daughter claims the boy as her own, and I refuse to acknowledge he's not my child, though they would like for me to remove him from her life something which I'm no longer willing to do, according to this decision. Following that ruling, numerous custody hearings were held at trial court level. Ramon Pina was elected sheriff of Nelson County following former sheriff Ed Mattingly's departure, serving as primary investigators in Crystal's disappearance case. Ramon stated his resolve in solving it and told reporters they have an idea what occurred with Crystal, and their job is to find enough details and evidence to make an arrest possible. Over time, Crystal's family never stopped fighting for justice in her disappearance, broadcasting it via True Creamy podcasts and TV series. Case of Mother of Five Crystal Rogers has inspired podcasts, documentaries, and many reports. The Disappearance Crystal Rogers is a crime themed series. Bourbon Town Mystery, produced with help from HLN Investigations Team, presents its third season. This docu-series delves deeply into the mysterious circumstances of Christelle Rogers' disappearance. Various crime dramas have focused upon this case since her disappearance. Christelle's family erected posters throughout Bardstone and nearby communities in search of any details surrounding her disappearance, which had left law enforcement officials puzzled, her family infuriated, and Bardstown struggling with an unexplained tragedy for years. John Snow, the detective in charge of Crystal's case, retired after one final interview where an air reporter asked whether her body had ever been found. Up on hearing that response, he answered in the affirmative. Nelson County Sheriff Chief Deputy Joe Gillang would shortly thereafter become her principal detective within months. In 2019, Crystal's family held a memorial service and stated, Every day is difficult, despite everyone telling her it will get easier. A vigil for prayer was held not only to remember Crystal, but also in hopes of finding answers about her whereabouts. Her favorite color pink was prevalent throughout, 
including pink t-shirts and ribbons as well as a balloon released at the close of the evening by Cher Ballard, who said it was encouraging seeing people continue showing support throughout these many years. She plans on taking Crystal home, regardless of the length. Before Crystal disappeared, her household was extremely close. Though it has been difficult for the children, I do not want them to give up hope as God works miracles. And there's always hope. With regard to clues in the case, Schur expressed confidence in the police to find Crystal. Court records reveal a second hearing for Crystal Ballard's youngest child took place on September 10, 2020, and new evidence was presented during this hearing. On October 5, 2020, Judge Hayden denied temporary visitation rights to Schur Ballard. Schur Ballard. Hayden determined that the child had an intimate relationship with Brooks, whom the judge described as an attentive father figure. Brooks testified in court that their son spends all of his time with his mother, him, and Crystal Mopin, as his only three immediate family members. Judge Hayden stated that while they believe Sher Ballard's testimony was honest and they didn't intentionally violate the law, the court is uncertain that they can uphold their vows because of their strong dislike for Brooks. Judge Hayden further commented, stating, It would be fair to suggest there exists an irreparable gap between the parties that may never be closed. July 2020 marked five years since Crystal had last been seen at Bardstown. Her disappearance caused widespread attention, but still no answers or evidence had surfaced of where she might have gone. For the first time ever, Kylie, one of Crystal's five children, sat down with an radio station and spoke openly about life without her mother. Kylie stated, waking up every morning not being able to say, hey mom, what are we going to do today? Like normal things, small details matter more than big things, millions that she missed out on all these years now. Kylie was only 14 when her mom went missing, yet still recalls texting and calling to reach her, but with no response or way to contact her. Graduations became particularly difficult due to this experience. As I graduated high school, it was amazing to see all the children and their mothers so happy for each other. Although my mom felt proud and I knew she wanted me there physically too, it was difficult for her to stand aside while looking around at other moms. Kylie admitted that, following such events, she often uses journals and her mother to relay details from that day to her mother and share with her. What happened? Over time, her family raised funds in an attempt to gather evidence that could lead to arrest for Crystal and Tommy Ballard trials. When Kylie was 19 years old, there was even an impressive $100,000 reward. As long as justice does not arrive for Crystal's death, her family made one simple request. Keep praying and do not allow hope to slip away. Your presence brings us hope and helps us keep pushing forward. Federal authorities made their intention known in August to assume control of the investigation into Crystal Hall's disappearance, known and issued search warrants at several homes belonging to her family. In June and July 2017, the FBI assumed the roles of Kentucky State Police and Nelson County Sheriff's Office as principal investigators of this investigation, with over 150 agents serving search warrants on three properties owned by Hall and his family members. An FBI Louisville spokesperson previously noted that three locations had been thoroughly explored over time, particularly Woodland Springs, subdivision, where Brooks Hall constructed several homes shortly after Crystal vanished. Federal agents working together with Nelson County Highway Department personnel surveyed an area suitable for driveway installation. Once determined, concrete pieces, as well as other items from outside an apartment building, were stored away securely before concealing them from view. Photographers working for the local newspaper were able to witness police using a jackhammer to clear away driveways of houses in an estate subdivision. Officers allowed only certain cars into the subdivision during this investigation and reporters were barred. Crystal's mother noted, I don't believe they would randomly choose driveways without some justification. My daughter had been missing for some time while Hall was building in this area. On August 27, 2021, the FBI made public their investigations in this area and announced that an object of interest had been discovered from concrete in one of the homes they searched recently. Furthermore, they mentioned knowing of residents in Bardstown who may have knowledge about this case, 
calling upon them to come forward if possible, some properties owned by Brooks Hall, while another belonged to his brother, Nick Hall. On September 7, 2021, the FBI made public their announcement that their search in Bardstown had concluded, and several items of interest had been sent off to a laboratory located in Virginia for testing. Sherry spoke to a local newspaper with hopes that her family can learn the truth of what had occurred with their daughter. She told the paper, I believe that this is where investigation should take place, as they can give me information here. Sherry indicated her desire to know what occurred with her daughter but acknowledged it would be difficult. She hopes she can handle being confronted with their announcement. Having been waiting six years, closure has long been needed, as do the children who want answers about what they may have experienced and been told about by Sherry herself and others involved. This will be very challenging on us. To date, the FBI has provided no further details about items of interest submitted for testing by Virginia Laboratories. In October 2021, spokesperson Katie Anderson informed a local newspaper that no new updates had been received regarding the ongoing Crystal Rogers investigation. In 2021, the FBI offered a reward of $25,000 to any individual or persons, providing information leading to the identification arrest and conviction of anyone responsible for Crystal's disappearance. Crystal's case remains unsolved due to being passed around between various agencies. Sherry Ballard disclosed during an interview in 2022 that her daughter's children at the time of Crystal's death were aged 21, 19, 17, and 9. Crystal was an extraordinary girl. We miss her dearly. She was an incredible daughter, always kind and helpful to all she encountered even offering to stay with a friend who couldn't leave due to illness, because we were a close family unit and I would do nothing different from any other mother for my daughter's well-being. Crystal's mother expressed hope for some sort of closure as well. She recalls vividly the day she visited the station of police to report Crystal as missing and was told it could take up to one year before any answers come through. Ballard expressed this shock with tears rolling down his cheeks. In October 2022, the FBI conducted another raid at Brooks Farm for five days and announced they would not share what information was gathered during their investigations. Brooks Hall owned this property along with her mother. Brooks Hall Sr. Daniel Cameron appointed a special prosecutor in January 2023 to investigate Crystal and her father's murder cases. On July 3, 2023, eight years after Crystal disappeared, her agency announced substantial progress had been made toward reaching a proper conclusion of this case and promised, we will follow every lead possible until those responsible for her disappearance are held accountable. On September 7, 2023, the investigation took a dramatic new turn when reports surfaced of Joseph Lawson, 32 years old and currently accused, being accused of participating in the probe. Joseph Lawson had never been officially identified as a suspect or had any connection to Crystal's case before his arrest marked an important shift in recent years. While not being charged with her murder, Joseph is now facing accusations of conspiracist activities against him. Authorities suspect he's involved with some aspect of planning or carrying out actions, which led to Crystal's presumed death, as no body had yet been located. Investigators believed Lawson may have hidden destroyed, removed, or altered evidence so as to derail proceedings against her. Lawson was charged with conspiracy on July 24th, as well as tampering evidence in June, but neither case could be resolved due to his hospitalization and Zoom while being brought before Nelson Circuit Court for trial. Lawson appeared before Nelson Circuit Court, and his indictment was read aloud before the judge accepted his plea of not guilty for both counts with $50,000 set as bond on one and $500,000 on another, conspiracy count and involvement in tampering with physical evidence respectively. Although Crystal wasn't specifically mentioned in the indictment, the charge outlined that on July 3, 2015 and or 4, 2015, defendant committed the criminal conspiracy with the intent to take away life by signing contracts to assist any one or more of those involved in planning executing, soliciting, 
or attempting to commit the offense when either themselves or one of their co-conspirators intentionally committed suicide. Kevin Coleman, Lawson's attorney, confirmed the charges related to Crystal's case but refused to provide further details. Lawson is scheduled to appear before a court for an initial pre-trial conference on the 26th of October, 2023. Lawson had an extensive criminal history, which included methamphetamine possession, burglary, trespassing, and assault charges. Investigators were not certain as to whether Steve Lawson, who called Brooks Hall the night Crystal disappeared, was related to Joseph Lawson. However, an exhaustive lookup of public records published shed by newspapers revealed the following information that Steve Lawson in Bardstown, Kentucky is related to Joseph and that they share a common birthday. Till Ballard, Crystal's grandpa, confirmed to the local paper that Lawson has been arrested by FBI. Mr. Ballard Sr. believed both murders may be linked and was hopeful that Lawson's arrest in Crystal's case might result in some changes regarding Tommy's shooting. Someone had to do something. Someone needed to know about Tommy, and someone needed to intervene against Tommy. Till believed Lawson may know about both murderers, although federal law prevented his exact place of residence being disclosed at this time. Lawson remains in federal custody. However, due to federal requirements, this information won't be disclosed due to federal requirements regarding federal jurisdiction and legal obligations regarding reporting requirements on federal legal requirements regarding federal requirements for legal matters regarding reporting requirements when reporting requirements arises regarding lawful authorities when reporting criminal activities are ongoing against them and not disclosing details regarding either victim relatives who can report suspected killers that could make arrest warranted charges brought against Tommy's shooters as he intended stop looking something someone needed to change in Tommy's shooting of Tommy was made public resulting in some kind of change by arresting someone else that someone knew about Tommy was shooting of Tommy being given custody however his exact whereabouts won't be revealed due to federal regulations requirements being revealed at all times during this case Lawson is being held as per federal regulations regarding his exact place of residence being kept confidentially Brooks Hall was arrested and charged with the murder of Crystal Rogers on September 27, 2023. Bail has been set at $10 million cash, and he's not allowed to communicate with Rogers' family. A statement issued by the FBI office stated their agent's dedication in finding those accountable in the case of Crystal Rogers. Today is an important step toward fulfilling that commitment. Hall was in court on October 5th and will likely face trial later that month. Another suspect could also be detained as well. Cher Ballard wrote this when the arrest was made, to say that today was overwhelming is overstatement. She said, I've endured eight long agonizing years to get here. To witness Brooks Hall put in handcuffs was an experience that was completely surreal to me. I've always believed that he was guilty, but now everyone knows that. I'm not sure of the feelings I experienced today. I'm sure that's all you can imagine. I would like to say thank for the FBI. God sent me an angel when they showed up at my house. I am personally familiar with the effort that a particular agent put into this case as well as the long and exhausting hours he worked to make this happen. He never once forgot how I had been a mom as well as a wife, experiencing the most difficult time spouses and mothers can endure. I can't even imagine the impact it caused on him. This event would never have been possible without his help. Thank you for his team for all the help they provided in his office. His co-workers worked extremely difficult. I would like be grateful to them for watching out for myself and our family. Thanks also for my family and friends at the Nelson County Sheriff's Office for helping in ensuring that this event took place. Thanks to both the attorney for prosecution and office. Kevin Coleman, Lawson's attorney, confirmed the charges related to Crystal's case but refused to provide further details. Lawson is scheduled to appear before a court for an initial pre-trial conference on the 26th of October, 2023. Lawson had an extensive criminal history, which included methamphetamine possession, burglary, trespassing, and assault charges. Investigators were not certain as to whether Steve Lawson who called Brooks Hall the night Crystal disappeared, 
was related to Joseph Lawson. However, an exhaustive lookup of public records published shed by newspapers revealed the following information that Steve Lawson in Bardstown, Kentucky is related to Joseph and that they share a common birthday. Till Ballard, Crystal's grandpa, confirmed to the local paper that Lawson has been arrested by FBI. Mr. Ballard Sr. believed both murders may be linked and was hopeful that Lawson's arrest in Crystal's case might result in some changes regarding Tommy's shooting. Someone had to do something. Someone needed to know about Tommy, and someone needed to intervene against Tommy. Till believed Lawson may know about both murderers, although federal law prevented his exact place of residence being disclosed at this time. Lawson remains in federal custody. However, due to federal requirements, this information won't be disclosed due to federal requirements regarding federal jurisdiction and legal obligations regarding reporting requirements on federal legal requirements regarding federal requirements for legal matters regarding reporting requirements when reporting requirements arises regarding lawful authorities when reporting criminal activities are ongoing against them and not disclosing details regarding either victim relatives who can report suspected killers that could make arrest warranted charges brought against Tommy's shooters as he intended stop looking something someone needed to change in Tommy's shooting of Tommy was made public resulting in some kind of change by arresting someone else that someone knew about Tommy was shooting of Tommy being given custody however his exact whereabouts won't be revealed due to federal regulations requirements being revealed at all times during this case Lawson is being held as per federal regulations regarding his exact place of residence being kept confidentially Brooks Hall was arrested and charged with the murder of Crystal Rogers on September 27, 2023. Bail has been set at $10 million cash, and he's not allowed to communicate with Rogers' family. A statement issued by the FBI office stated their agent's dedication in finding those accountable in the case of Crystal Rogers. Today is an important step toward fulfilling that commitment. Hall was in court on October 5th and will likely face trial later that month. Another suspect could also be detained as well. Cher Ballard wrote this when the arrest was made, to say that today was overwhelming is overstatement. She said, I've endured eight long agonizing years to get here. To witness Brooks Hall put in handcuffs was an experience that was completely surreal to me. I've always believed that he was guilty, but now everyone knows that. I'm not sure of the feelings I experienced today. I'm sure that's all you can imagine. I would like to say thank for the FBI. God sent me an angel when they showed up at my house. I am personally familiar with the effort that a particular agent put into this case as well as the long and exhausting hours he worked to make this happen. He never once forgot how I had been a mom as well as a wife, experiencing the most difficult time spouses and mothers can endure. I can't even imagine the impact it caused on him. This event would never have been possible without his help. Thank you for his team for all the help they provided in his office. His co-workers worked extremely difficult. I would like be grateful to them for watching out for myself and our family. Thanks also for my family and friends at the Nelson County Sheriff's Office for helping in ensuring that this event took place. Thanks to both the attorney for prosecution and office. Twelve-year-old Jennifer Renee Odom was a seventh grader at Thomas E. Waitman Middle School in Wesley Chapel, Florida, in 1993. She played the clarinet in the school band and was also a barefoot water skier who often placed high in tournaments. She was the skier who climbed to the top of the human pyramid, gliding atop the water. Jennifer was born on August 25, 1980. She was the eldest daughter of Renee Converse and stepdad Clark Converse. She had a nine-year-old sister, Jessica Ann Odom, and was the granddaughter of Jim and Margie Denny. They lived in St. Joseph, a small community near Dade City, Florida. Jennifer and Jessica had a rabbit called Beanie. Jennifer also absolutely loved her Springer Spaniel, Gypsy. The two sisters built forts, rode four-wheelers, and spent summer days swimming in the creek behind their house on the family's 15-acre property. It was a crisp morning on Friday, February 19, 1993, 
when Jennifer Odom put on her white jeans and a white turtleneck to get ready for school. She put on a red cashmere sweater, a gift from her grandmother, over her shoulder-length chestnut-colored hair. She was slim and tan due to spending a lot of time outdoors. On that same morning, after lacing up her pair of black boots, she got into the car with her mother. The two drove 200 yards up the winding Lime Rock driveway to wait for the school bus near their mailbox. Jennifer climbed onto the bus and took her usual spot on the back seat so she and her mother could see each other until Renee, following behind, turned left to head to work. After school, at around 3 p.m., Jennifer stepped off her school bus, waved goodbye to her friends and started walking the short 200 yards to her home. At about 4 p.m., Jennifer's sister arrived at their home from school to find it locked and unable to enter. She then called their mother to tell her that her big sister was not home yet. Renee Converse then realized Jennifer must not have made it home, so she called Jennifer's best friend, Michelle, who stated that she saw Jennifer exit the bus and begin walking home. Jennifer's mother knew something was very wrong and called the police. Within hours, deputies launched a wide-scale search, and a search party of about 400 volunteers was formed to help scour about 60 square miles of countryside. Family friends, neighbors, and other volunteers searched for Jennifer, and law enforcement was equipped with police dogs to comb the rolling groves, pastures, and woods surrounding the tiny Pasco County town of Dade City. Every law enforcement agency in the Bay Area was looking for a blue truck that was seen in the area by some of her classmates, children riding the school bus with Jennifer. They remembered seeing an older light blue, unknown model pickup truck, slowly following Jennifer down the road in the direction in which she was walking. The children described it as having a silver-painted rear bumper, not chrome, and a trailer hitch with wires hanging and pipes, or a ladder in the back. The driver was described by the children as a white male in his 40s with shoulder-length brown hair. The blue truck became the focus of the search parties, as investigators believed that the driver may have been involved in Jennifer's disappearance. As a last resort to find the truck, the FBI, as well as Hernando and Pasco County Sheriff's personnel, worked from a dock in a boathouse as divers searched Lake Rovita for the vehicle. Six days after Jennifer vanished, on Thursday, February 25, 1993, a man and a woman searching an abandoned orange grove about 10 miles north of Jennifer's school bus stop found her badly decomposed nude body. Her body was found near a horse trail off Powell Road, south of Brooksville, amid a cluster of pine trees in the orange grove. She was found viciously assaulted and had suffered blunt force trauma to her head. Detectives said she likely lost her life there in the woods not long after her disappearance. Hernando County Sheriff Al Ninhe stated, We are not exactly sure how long her abductor kept her captive or when exactly the slaying took place, but we are relatively confident it took place in that field. Jennifer's clothing was never found, neither the blue truck nor its driver. While Jennifer's family was still busy with her funeral arrangements, Country music star Vince Gill was scheduled to sing at the local Strawberry Festival on Monday, March 1, 1993. Jennifer's stepfather, Clark Converse, said the girls had looked forward to Gill's performance for weeks, hoping they could get him to autograph photos before the concert. Clark Converse and Jessica went to the festival to fulfill Jennifer's wish that Gill autograph a photo in which Jennifer and her sister had posed with the singer at a previous concert on January 10th. Between shows, Festival Vice President Joe Newsom took the three snapshots to Gill, who was eating dinner. Jennifer's stepdad had asked that Gill autograph one for Jessica, one for Jennifer, and one for both girls. Newsom said afterward, I told Gill this young lady had been slayed, and her dad was outside. Gill replied that he remembered hearing about the incident. He, who also had a young daughter, Autograph the photos, writing on one to Jennifer. May God be with you. As both Gill and Newsom wept, Gill then went to the night's second show. Before singing the last song, he told the audience about Jennifer. I'm going to try to get through this the best I can, he said, his voice cracking. Gill sang his Grammy-winning hit, I Still Believe in You, and dedicated it to Jennifer, who was tragically robbed of her life. Midway through the song, with tears running down his face, Gill asked the crowd to help him finish. Nearly 15,000 voices joined in. 
radio personality. Jeff Moore stood backstage and looked out at thousands of tear-stained faces. He said, it was heart-ripping, he said afterward. Unfortunately, with no one in the community providing investigators with useful information, her case went unsolved for 13 months. Before Jennifer was abducted, on January 16, 1992, a 17-year-old girl was kidnapped as she got off a school bus in north-central Pasco County. She was found in a pool of blood behind an abandoned house, brutally attacked, assaulted, and beaten. Sheriff Ninhai said she suffered injuries to her head and skull that were very significant. She survived, but her life was forever changed, as she was paralyzed on her left side. Ninhai said she was a former honor roll student and a track and field participant and was a true victim. She was not engaged in a high-risk lifestyle. Law enforcement was able to collect DNA from the crime scene at the time, and since there were similarities between what happened to Jennifer and the unnamed girl, detectives believed the cases may be related. Both victims were adolescent girls who were abducted after getting off the school bus in Pasco County, taken to a remote field, assaulted, and abandoned with the belief they would succumb to their injuries. The other victim was found just a few miles from where Jennifer's body was found. After a series of blind alleys, the police called upon psychic Nancy Meyer, 16 months after the incident, to assist in finding the person responsible for what happened. Nancy Meyer is a psychic from Pennsylvania who has been working with police around the country for decades. According to Nancy, she had consulted in more than 300 criminal investigations and had offered critical clues more than 80% of the time. Nancy believed that two men were involved in taking Jennifer's life. She described them as white, muscular mechanics, and she said one may be a smoker with a heavy cough. The crime scene photographs were classified, therefore Nancy Meyer was not allowed to see it. Despite this, she was able to visualize two men in detail. She was taken to the site where Jennifer's body was found, and Nancy pointed out that there were belongings in a nearby area that had not yet been discovered. She was able to describe several of Jennifer's items that were still missing, including her cousin's clarinet case with the letters L.O. on them. She continued to give information about the perpetrators in the hope of solving the case. Detective Carlos Douglas of the Hernando County Sheriff's Office said, Nancy Meyer was extremely accurate on some things that led us to look in other areas that we had not thought of, so we obtained a lot of information from what she had to offer. On December 2, 1994, Jennifer's Unsolved Case was aired on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on national TV. After the show aired, more than 50 phone tips and even more investigative leads from around the country arrived by mail at the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. A spokesman of the Sheriff's Office said, The show did for us what we wanted it to do. It got us some more exposure. Despite the new exposure, former Hernando County Sheriff's Major Gary Zorn Smith who oversaw the investigation in its early years, said the investigators were stumped. He said there was a strong possibility the crime would go unsolved, and what's even worse is that if we solve it, it may take another crime to do it, he said at the time. Approximately two years after Jennifer's body was found, on Thursday, January 5, 1995, a couple hunting for scrap metal in a rural area of Hernando County discovered Jennifer's missing book bag and clarinet case. It was found several miles from the location of her body. Police were able to lift fingerprints from her backpack and clarinet case from what is believed to be the person responsible. Unfortunately, there was never a hit in the database for a suspect matching these fingerprints. Over the years, the case garnered national attention and haunted the Tampa Bay region. Thousands of dollars in reward money offered for tips went unclaimed. Detectives logged tens of thousands of hours chasing leads and Jennifer's family waited for news as the years turned to decades. Jennifer's mother, Renee Converse, wondered if it was somebody Jennifer knew. Clark Converse, Jennifer's stepfather, added, There is a real chance that the person who did it is somebody we have contact with. If they catch someone, we're going to be thrown into the spotlight. Learning how to deal with a trial and confronting this person is going to throw us to square one in learning to deal with this. Renee said she cries a bit more each year. The reality is that Jennifer is gone and will never be in our lives again.
nothing is going to change that. She also said that the family is thankful for what they do know. We are blessed that we have this much closure. We are not looking for her. We know where she is. It is going to be a bittersweet finale. She could still picture her 12-year-old daughter, slim and sun-kissed, waving goodbye at the back window of the Pasco County school bus. It was the last time she would see her brown-eyed first-born girl. In 2015, Detective George Lundgren was contacted by Pasco County Sheriff Chris Nako, who stated that new technology had led to a solid lead in the 1992 case in which the teenage girl was found alive. It was the case investigators believed was linked to Jennifer's. The odds of finding another match, Nako said, was 1 in 7.7 .7 non-alien, a number with 30 zeros. Lundgren commented, I think DNA is going to be a big part of Jennifer's case, as it is with any of the old cases, because items were collected. It is just now that the technology has advanced. The biological evidence found in the investigation of the 1992 case was tested before February 2015, and detectives got a full DNA profile. Investigators used a DNA procedure known as familial searching, which allows law enforcement to find a suspect by comparing male DNA left at the scene with that of family members. The shortfall of a standard DNA search is that a suspect's genetic fingerprint must be on file in the offender database for law enforcement to make a match. Sheriff Ninhai said, until 2015, there were no leads on that particular piece of DNA. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement compared the DNA to local DNA to see if there were any close matches, which would be a family member. The sheriff said they found the DNA match, that of Jeffrey Crum, who was in jail at the time. Investigators then obtained DNA samples from Crum's brother, father, and grandfather. A direct comparison between the DNA found in the victim and that of Crum's father found a match, leading to the indictment of Jeffrey Crum. Crum was already serving two life sentences for the assault and kidnapping case out of Pasco County that was prosecuted around 2015. In February 2015, the arrest and sentence of Crum gave Detective Lloyd Grant a new resolve, and Jennifer's family knew hope that the person responsible would be caught. Detectives then began an intensive investigation and interviewed everyone they could find for the next several years who may have been associated with Crum around the time Jennifer was kidnapped. This information was turned over to the state attorney, and the facts and circumstances were turned over to a grand jury. On July 27, 2023, a month shy of what would have been Jennifer's 43rd birthday, officials announced that they had finally made an arrest in the case, and prosecutors would seek capital punishment against the accused. State Attorney Bill Glass made the announcement during a press conference, just after the Hernando County Sheriff's Office announced that it had charged the 61-year-old Jeffrey Norman Crum with the kidnapping, assault, and slaying of Jennifer 30 years before. Glass also said, I have confidence that we have the right person and we have the right aggravators in this particular case to treat it as a capital punishment case. This is every parent's nightmare. This is the thing that keeps parents up at night, worried about their children. Detective George Lundgren, who had spent years investigating Jennifer's case, said, Shock is probably the best word to describe the reaction of Jennifer's family when he told them about the arrest. He said he did it quickly because I did not want to get emotional. It is a lot for them to take in and absorb, and I can imagine it is going to take some time before it really sinks in. According to Sheriff Ninhais, every viable lead for the past 30 years, including those that came from the Pasco County Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or private citizens, was thoroughly investigated. He added that the investigation never stopped. Hundreds of items were tested and retested, every time new technology came out in the hope of finding the smoking gun to solve this case. The sheriff added that countless detectives, sworn law enforcement personnel, civilian tipsters, and countless others have had a hand in this investigation. The minute Crum was identified as a suspect in the case, Detective Lundgren went to work, putting a mosaic together like a puzzle. I can tell you that other than the conviction in a previous case, there was no other significant piece of the puzzle.
Every other piece of the puzzle that brought us to this point consisted of tiny fragments that gave the state attorney and the grand jury enough confidence to indict Crum. He also said that they are searching for additional victims, as authorities fear Crum may be responsible for other crimes. A picture of him from 1993 was released, asking that anyone who recognizes him from the 1980s and 1990s contact Sheriff Ninheis. We urge anyone who had interactions with this individual has information on other crimes he may have committed or may have themselves been a victim of Jeffrey Crum to reach out to the Hernando County Sheriff's Office and speak to our cold case unit. Despite keeping a lot of information close to the vest, authorities did say that in 1992, Crum worked in construction as a drywall installer and lived on Somerset Lane in Spring Hill, the Pasco County area where Jennifer was abducted from. His residence was about 21 miles from the place where Jennifer was last seen and 12 miles from where her body was found. Officials also say that at that time, he drove a blue truck. During Thursday's press conference on July 27, 2023, Sheriff Ninheis kept reiterating that Crum was not on the investigator's radar until the past few years. Records showed that Crum has a significant history of convictions for violent crimes. The sheriff said Crum had been arrested in the early 1980s for armed robbery in Hillsborough County. In 1985, he was charged with kidnapping, assault, and false imprisonment in Hillsborough County. He was arrested by Tampa police in 1987 for carrying a concealed weapon. In 1988, he was caught again carrying a concealed weapon and was charged with aggravated assault. In 1998, he was arrested for domestic violence in Hernando County three times. In 2001, he was arrested for a violation of probation in Hillsborough County. He was arrested a few years later for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon in Hernando County. In 2015, he was arrested in Pasco County for aggravated assault on a child under the age of 12. Sheriff Ninheis stated, he is a bad individual who enjoyed violence. Crum is already serving two life sentences for the assault and kidnapping case out of Pasco County that was prosecuted around 2015. He is currently in the Hernando County Jail, and Judge Kurt E. Hitzman ordered him to be held without bond and appointed a public defender to represent him. Communities in Pasco and Hernando counties were on edge after Jennifer Odom's kidnapping and slaying back then. They shared their thoughts and feelings after the news of the arrest was announced. Jeannie Cameron, the general manager at Papa Joe's Italian restaurant in Brooksville, said she and others in the community remember hearing about her disappearance all too well. So, we all remember hearing about her disappearance, Jennifer's, and about the blue truck, and everybody was on alert, looking. I think the bottom line was finding out who did it and getting him off the streets so that another family doesn't have to be tormented. Because I really feel like the whole community was tormented until they found out the answer. Joseph Gioratan, the owner of Papa Joe's Italian restaurant, said, Back then, 30 years ago, as a parent, I was very angry that someone could do something like that to a child and then leave her there in the middle of nowhere. Jessica Ellis said she went to Waitman Middle School with Jennifer and played in the same clarinet section in band class. I would say we saw each other a lot. We weren't like close friends but we knew a lot of the same people. We rode the school bus every day, and I just remember her always being nice with me and everyone else that rode her school bus that knew her. You know, a lot of us are parents ourselves now, and the fact that anyone would do this to a child makes me hold my five-year-old a lot tighter now. Grief and fear followed in the days, months, and years after Jennifer lost her life. The arrest of Crum is closure for many in the community. On July 26, 1974, in Provincetown, Massachusetts's Point Dunes area, a 12-year-old girl was observed following a barking dog and coming across the body of an animal that had recently passed. Remains of a body were discovered near a riverbank, with numerous insects present nearby. Two sets of footprints led directly to it while tire tracks could be seen up to 50 yards away. Police believe the victim knew her attacker or was asleep when assaulted so no fight ensued between the two parties. At the scene, neither beach blankets or sand were disturbed, 
suggesting that her body may have been transported there by someone. A blue bandana and pair of Wrangler jeans could be seen on her head. The blonde had long red or auburn hair which she pulled back in a ponytail using an elastic band with gold flecks. Her toenails had been painted pink. Police estimated she stood 5-6 inches, weighed 145 pounds and had a muscular physique. This woman underwent extensive dental procedures, with crowns costing up to $10,000 being placed and several teeth extracted, both hands and one forearm being missing and she being close to dying from strangulation. One part of her scalp was injured by what is suspected to have been a military entrenching tool. During an autopsy conducted two weeks before being discovered, it was found she had passed away. It is difficult to ascertain her exact age. It could possibly be less than 20, or possibly older than 40. At the time, some investigators believed that the lack of teeth, hands, and forearms showed the perpetrator was trying to conceal both their identity and that of their victim. Police conducted a comprehensive search through thousands of missing person cases, as well as a list of certified vehicles traveling throughout the region. However, no conclusive results or other tangible evidence was discovered beyond a bandana, jeans, ponytail holder, and blanket, even after conducting extensive searches in the region. Dune's investigators could not locate anyone responsible. She became known as the Lady of the Dunes after she was buried in 1974, after an investigation that was unfortunately concluded without further leads being revealed. Face reconstruction was first attempted using clay in 1979. Her remains were discovered for further examination in 1980, but no leads could be identified. In March 2000, her body was examined again so as to perform DNA tests. A CT scan of her skull was conducted in May 2010, providing images that would later be utilized by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to create a new reconstruction in 2014. One of the investigators working on the case contributed funds towards purchasing a brand new casket as its metal predecessor had become rusted and damaged over time. In 1987, there were several potential leads but none could be exploited when a Canadian woman told her friend that she saw her son's father strangle a Massachusetts individual in 1972. Police made multiple attempts to locate this individual, but were unsuccessful. Another woman claimed that the reconstruction of the victim resembled her sister who went missing in Boston in 1974. Yet this wasn't accurate. Investigators were also investigating Rory Jean Cassinger, then 25 years old when she committed her act of violence in 1973 after breaking out from prison. Authorities found a striking resemblance between Rory Jean and the victim. However, her DNA sample from her mother did not match up. Two other missing women, Frances Ewalt of Montana and Vicki Lighton of Massachusetts, had already been dismissed over time. Theories and suspects abounded in relation to this crime. Investigators realized in 1981 that an identical appearing woman was photographed together with mobster Whitey Bulger. At the time of her alleged killing, Bulger was notorious for extracting her teeth. No proof could ever be established between Bulger and her death in prison in 2018. Tony Costa of Truro, Massachusetts, was initially suspected in this crime, but eventually cleared. Costa died on 12 May 1974 and his body was discovered three months later in July 1974. Hayden Clark confessed to investigators he was responsible for killing his partner from the Dunes' life. However, the authorities soon learned he suffered from schizophrenia with paranoia, which can cause someone to lie about their confessions of crimes committed. In 2004, Clark wrote to one of his close friends informing them that he had murdered the body of a woman on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and included two drawings one depicting an image of her lying prone and another detailing where the body had been discovered in April 2000. Clark led police to an area he claimed he had murdered two individuals. Twenty years before his declaration that he had killed several more individuals between 197 and 1990 in several states, investigators were unable to definitively link him with the murder of Dune's woman. In August 2015, it was speculated 
that this lady may have been an extra in the film of the same name, filmed at Martha's Vineyard between May and October 1974, in Mana Village, approximately 100 miles south of Provincetown. Joe Hill, son of horror writer Stephen King, brought this incident to police attention after reading The Skeleton Crew. While viewing its 4th of July beach scene a few weeks ago, Hill noticed a woman dressed similar to those found on Stephen King's body, wearing blue jeans and bandanas similar to those found on Hill's own body. Hill contemplated what would happen if an unidentified child victim from a film, like one of Hollywood's cult summer classics, were seen by millions without realizing they were looking at her. An investigator leading this case has expressed interest, yet others dismiss it as mere speculation and unsubstantiated claims. In 2022, remains of a skeleton were brought to AAM for examination. After studying these remains, a DNA-based profile was created that allowed researchers to locate distant relatives as well as identify who died. In October 2022, the FB Bi Field Office in Boston officially named Ruth Marie Terry as their victim and provided no details or indication that any potential suspects might not have been present at the time of her murder. The FBI announced that Ruth's identity had been established through their investigative genealogy method used to track down unidentified victims and over 150 criminals. Ruth Marie Terry was born September 8, 1936, in Whitewell, Tennessee, to Johnny and Eva Terry. However, Eva died at 23 after becoming pregnant after an unplanned marriage and giving birth in 1957. Ruth relocated from Whitewell to Leonia. Michigan for work with Fisher Bodie Automotive, but due to financial issues was unable to support Richard properly. Ruth agreed to permit Richard Hannett Sr., the head of her workplace, to adopt her son as part of their agreement to cover Ruth's expenses once that process had concluded. Once completed, Ruth left Leonia and relocated to California. Ruth attempted to contact the son she gave birth to in 1972, but due to an overdose of drugs, he wasn't ready. On February 16, 1974, Ruth married Rockwell Maven, who was an antique stealer, from Reno, Nevada. Just months prior to her passing away, Ruth and Maven visited family in Whitewell. Brittany Novengonsky observed that Ruth did not act herself when in Maven's company and displayed possessive tendencies. After traveling to Chattanooga to visit Ruth Maven and Maven's half brother Kenneth, as well as Carol, who had moved there after Ruth died, they remembered hearing Ruth Maven tell Kenneth and Carol that they planned on visiting America to search for antiques. Kenneth noted that Maven discussed moving Ruth back to Tennessee after reporting her disappearance from California. Kenneth mentioned they discussed making plans to go there when on their journey together during summer 1974. Maven traveled back from Tennessee to inform Ruth's family of Ruth's whereabouts. Jan Terry, Ruth James's sister-in-law, claims he stayed only briefly and told the family they weren't sure of Ruth's whereabouts. To locate Ruth James himself, her brother went to California and hired an investigator from a private firm. Ruth's family were advised by Ruth's private investigator that she had left the country of her own free will, following involvement with religious cults over two decades prior to being investigated. All her belongings would be sold off. Ruth had been listed in family members' obituaries as deceased leading some to suspect she may have entered witness protection and be unable to communicate with them. On November 2, 2022, some family members suspected Ruth may be part of such an arrangement. Massachusetts State Police released information regarding Rockwell Maven, Ruth's husband-to-be who was born October 27, 1923, and died March 14, 2002. Maven was adopted by Abram Albert Zadorsky, Maven, and Sylvia Lily Silverblatt. Malavan had an older brother named Michael J. Maven. By 1942, he resided in New York City and attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Unfortunately, due to an infection in his mastoid, active military service for World War II could not be granted due to this. Mavan was married to Joe Ellen May Loop on May 11, 1946, while teaching in Bellew, Pennsylvania. The couple resided together between New York, California, and Seattle, Washington, where Mavon worked as a disc jockey before parting ways on July 16, 1956, six years after marrying.
On September 30, 1958, in Cout, Idaho, Mavan married Manzanita Eileen Manzi Ryan. At this point, Manzanita already had an infant daughter from her previous relationship, and Mars, who at 18 was her lover. They vanished together on April Fool's Day, 1960, from Seattle. Mavin has since been identified as their primary suspect. Malavin managed to escape Seattle, but was arrested by the FBI upon trying to take an illegal flight route in order to avoid testifying about her husband's death. Malavin was never charged with killing either woman, but received 15 months for illegal flight, refusing to testify after their disappearance on July 29 and 19, 1960. Soon afterwards, he married Evelyn Marie Emerson of King County, Washington, before having another wedding ceremony on 10 August 1963 in Los Angeles with Evelyn Marie Emerson's family for another $10,000 debt they incurred when her disappearance occurred in 1961. Malavin then faced larceny charges related to this fraud committed while Evelyn Marie Emerson was missing from Los Angeles. He was found guilty on all three charges and given a 15-year sentence, but in March 1962, his punishment was suspended with the condition that Maven pay back all money collected illegally. Anne Rule's 2007 novel True Crime features an extended examination of Maven's second spouse and daughter and attempts by police to link Malavan with crime. Malavan was named as a key suspect in both the murder of Henry Lawrence Redbeard, a 28-year-old bread truck driver, and in the disappearance of Barbara Jo Kelly, 17, in June 1950. Barbara was killed at Humboldt County, California, on June 17, 1950, when she went out for a romantic rendezvous with her bear-loving partner's bear. Her body was discovered lying face up on the beach near Table BL the following morning. He had been shot through his back of his head, and other than socks and shoes, he was fully naked. Barbara's clothing was discovered folded neatly and neatly placed beneath, all other clothes with only her stockings and shoes being the exceptions. No sign of Barbaro could be located. Malavan relocated to Chur, California, an isolated community near Silanese around 1985, according to his article, and has not been heard from or seen since then. Maven had decided to step down as executive vice president of Rodeo Store, located on Avenue in Beverly Hills. According to an article, he was employed by radio station Kazoo in Pacific Grove, as a volunteer host of a three-hour weekly call-in show about growing old, changing priorities, and adapting. Additionally, he worked at a shop selling tobacco in Carmel. According to his death notice, he passed away peacefully at home in Salinas following a long illness. Born in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and described as an artist, painter, poet, actor, his spouse, Phyllis Malavan, survived him, along with Joan, who owned Towers of Salinas. On August 28, 2023, Capon Island's District Attorney Robert Galbois released a statement explaining that following their investigation, it has been concluded that Maven was responsible for an incident which took place with M. Terry in 1974. With this conclusion in place, the case has officially closed with investigators now considering any evidence suggesting Maven might be linked with other crimes.